Hey everyone, uh, welcome to day two of the JetBrains.net Days Online 2021. Um, I'm Martin, developer advocate at JetBrains, and uh, we also have Matthias on the stream here, also developer advocate at JetBrains. Hey, Matthias. Good morning, Martin. How did you sleep after the um, first day? Sh short, short. It's long days, these events. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But also full of greatness, right? Absolutely. Uh, I truly enjoyed yesterday. Um, we're only hosting some of the sessions, but uh, there were really good sessions. So I stuck around and just watched the stream after uh, after I finished the, the hosting bits that we were supposed to do. You, you know what? If we uh, if we will hire more people for the, uh, developer advocacy, we could make it 24-7, <laughs> everyone working in shifts and <laughs> have a full week or something. I, I think uh, that right. sounds awesome, but I also think a lot of people on our event team would not like doing that. Um, and I think someone who is also here in the, the backstage of the stream is probably cursing right now and just nodding their head. No, 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 don't do this. That's that's true. That's true. Uh, let's bring on my screen. And you, you see that, right? It's, it's actually my screen and blends in nicely into the background here. Really um, cool. We, we, we did invest a couple of minutes to get there, actually. <laughs> you, you, you would be surprised, by the way, everyone on the stream, how hard it is uh, to figure out how to put the browser window in full screen mode like this. But particularly on Mac, yeah. Which brings, did it. Which brings did it. The, the nice discussions about which uh, operating system is superior. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But welcome everyone to our second day for our JetBrains.net days online, 20, 000, uh, 2021. It's the third already, as Martin already uh, said yesterday also. And uh, let's scroll through this a bit. Uh, what we would like to do here at first is thank our um, speakers from yesterday. That was really cool. Uh, I think I managed to uh, watch all the sessions uh, even after my shift, and we would just like to say uh, thank you to all of them. And go, go out, follow them on Twitter. That would be nice too. Uh, tell them that, that they did great. And yeah, I also hope that you, you enjoyed it, of course. Um, besides that, let's see what our agenda for today looks like. So welcome. That's what we are actually doing right now. Right afterwards, we have uh, Chris with the top 10 best new features in C-sharp version 6.2.9. Um, then we have Urs with why every day as a developer would be easier with F-sharp. That's like a showdown I again. I think you can already get the team. Uh, we did that yesterday with gRPC and GraphQL. So today it's a little bit of a showdown between C-sharp and uh, F-sharp, the first sessions. Marin, I gotta ask, was that intentional? Uh, maybe. I, you, you know what? I've seen that a couple of times, but not so often. Uh, it's uh, it's presentations where actually two people uh, do the uh, do the talk, and they also switch in between. Like uh, I think, what was it? The the one I've seen was between Java and C sharp. And that was really cool. Yeah. I, I think I did one with uh, one of our colleagues uh, with C sharp and Kotlin at some point as well. We should we should schedule a webinar okay. doing that. True, true, I remember. Okay, uh, after us, we have Martin Bibi. That's actually uh, something we had to change, yeah, because our other speaker uh, had to cancel. But Martin, well, welcome to him also. Uh, he will talk about containerized.net apps and deploy to Kubernetes. And I'm always worried if I spell, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, yeah, it, it's really right? hard to, to spell it out as Kates or K8S or whatever the, the abbreviation is nowadays. Yeah, initially I thought like Kates, what? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I also for 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 a long time I didn't know that this uh, internationalization, this I18N, I, I didn't know what it means. But yeah, that's me. We, we should totally stop doing those uh, abbreviations. Yeah, me having no idea. Uh, okay, after. Martin, uh, Martin, uh, we have Lorraine with legacy refactoring, followed by uh, Stefan with null and void, everything about nothing in .NET. 
that makes a cool title. One see. hour, one hour about nothing. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope everyone takes something away from it. Um, and then we have best practices for using async and await by Damia. Always good to have a session about async await. And last session that would be interesting too is debugging tips and tricks with JetBrains Rider by Joe G. Looks good, uh, right? Yep, yeah, perfect. I'm I'm really looking forward to all of them. Um, Let's maybe mention that as well. So uh, it's myself and Matthias hosting the first couple of sessions. I will also have the other JetBrains.net developer advocates here, uh, Matt, Rachel, and Khalid. So we'll be switching shifts, but looking at this agenda, I'll probably be around the entire day, hang out in the chat, and uh, yeah, watch all of the sessions because they all look great. Yeah. Uh, also, let's go a little bit further. Uh, we would like to thank our community partners uh for teaming up with us spreading the word um and yeah also making this uh, a great event basically. absolutely uh do check out the website there as well uh, there's links to these uh community partners websites as well uh if you are local to one of those um feel free to join them because there's always local speakers local sessions and they are doing an awesome job at uh, building community around .net, so go check them out All right, all right. I think otherwise we should just mention for today uh, that again we will record everything. Um, so if at any point you need to, I don't know, have some lunch, everyone needs to eat, right? Then just hit the pause bat button and you can continue afterwards. Um, also, if you have questions, uh, we will gather them along the the presentation of the current speaker then and ask them. Uh, afterwards yeah it's it's really one of one of the best things about following this event live uh, it is that you can ask questions in the chat and we will be answering them in the chat but we'll also pick a couple of questions that we can ask the speaker and get answered uh, while we are on the stream yeah definitely and also i think as soon as we get there we will also put the recordings uh, uh cut it out there right yeah so that's every individual session will be available afterwards probably or most certainly uh through our um JetBrains tv youtube channel and that's a good moment also to remind if you like this format and we hope you like it then like and subscribe that also to get uh, info about the next year's event that we will hopefully have i'm pretty sure we will have right uh, I'm, I'm almost thinking that there's no way around it, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely have one, yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I think we don't have any other choice. I mean, we like it, most people like it, so why It's not? actually but funny because it started three years ago where we had the crazy idea of doing a call for papers for our regular webinars that we have every single month, and we still have them every single month. Uh, we had so many good submissions there that we decided to do one-day events like this. And then uh, I think last year we had even more good submissions. This year, the same thing. So we're now doing two days of JetBrains.net days online. So next year, we will probably again, when we have the call for papers, announce it as JetBrains.net day. But there's a good chance it will end up being .NET days again. Actually, during the process, and, and I can say that actually takes quite a lot of effort. Uh, from all various uh, parties and, and, and involved people uh, to organize that. But I was actually confused meanwhile because somewhere it said .NET Day and as, at some point it was days and I was like, hey. It's, it's, anyway. to, keep, it's to keep you sharp, uh, Matthias. Oh, yeah. Okay, good for that. Um, shall we bring in Chris now? Uh, is that a bridge because I said sharp? Let's bring in Chris with C sharp. Yeah, exactly. let's bring it in. Okay. Hello, Chris. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's good. Um, it, it's weird. I'm wearing a shirt uh, during COVID, which only happens when there's a conversation online uh, with not just my own company. So it, it's a good day. I'm so otherwise, you're wearing pajamas or? 
Um, you know me, right? So you, you know that I only wear loud shirts. So everybody thinks that I wear those all the time. And I did until COVID. And now I, I, I basically lurch around at home in shorts and a t-shirt every day. So whenever there's a call going on, it's like, oh, oh, oh wait, 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 what am I actually wearing? Uh, I, I even have t-shirts from previous companies I've worked at, which is not great to wear when you have a conversation with the client. I have figured out. <laughs> So yeah, well, PJs seems like a good way of, of uh, sitting at home working, to be perfectly honest. So uh, actually, here at JetBrains, we had a New Year's party where we all got shipped uh, some PJs, which is kind of nice. It's uh, very nice. good to have during the holiday period, at least. I actually asked my company if I could have a onesie with the company logo on, and I could wear that. Well, now it would work at home, but I actually want to wear it at conferences. I love the idea of just being able to go to a conference in a one seat and spend my entire day walking around <laughs> in a one seat. It's funny. I just had a, had a conversation around that over the weekend. <laughs> Things I'd never thought I'd hear anyone say. <laughs> right, like on, a, on a like, broadcast with, with 300 people watching. Yeah. Like a mix of boxer shorts and, and polo shirt or something. That would be cool. <laughs> nice. I, I think it's about time that we all get to meet in person again and, and yeah, <laughs> wear proper clothing. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the in-person events. Um, nothing wrong with the virtual ones, but it's just, it's weird sitting at home talking to a webcam. And also I'm, I'm terrified that my cat, or rather, sorry, my wife's cat is going to have a fit during my presentation because she starts running around and screaming. So if there's weird noises in the background, there's nobody killing anyone in my apartment. It's just a cat. I'm, I'm almost looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm not. It's I, I, already, I already said yesterday that that usually having pets there increases my intention by, yeah, by, by a large. OK, in that case, there is a cat. It might have a, a fit in the middle of my presentation. Now you have a, a, a reason to stay around. It, it, it sounds a bit like, where's Wardle, you know? Like, people have to be really careful and follow along and just look at your your tiny webcam there. Or yeah. is there another? Well, and, it's not going to come in along. here. It's not going to come in. I've closed the door. Uh, but the, the noise travels, trust me. <laughs> OK, cool. Should we start already? Um, I, I guess we can, uh, we can probably start, yeah. Um, so Chris, with top 10 best new features in C Sharp 6 to 9. Um, I guess this is probably almost one of the last times you'll be doing a talk with this title and change the 9 to 10 very soon. Uh, yeah, or or just disqualifying the talk completely and find something else to talk about. Uh, it's not what I normally talk about. It's just one of those. I looked at C Sharp and I was like, there's so much stuff that has come in and out in the last few years. Um, it, it might be a good idea to do like a best of kind of thing. So we'll see. Uh, maybe it gets updated. Maybe it gets uh, thrown in the trash and a new one of something else will come up. Cool. Yeah, definitely looking forward. Uh, let's bring in your screen and then uh, remove Matthias and myself from the stream. And then I would say good luck. And Thank thanks. You. Thanks. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, so we are going to have a little chat about the top 10 best new features of C Shop version 6 to 9. Um, so my name is Chris Klug. Um, I work at a company called Active Solution in Stockholm, where we do custom software development on the .NET platform. Uh, and I, I do a lot of um, speaking engagements on, at conferences as well. So I, I have a weird role where I talk about things uh, and explain things that I've learned along the way, uh, which is kind of cool. So I, I sat down. I was looking at doing conference talks during COVID, and I was like, um, I want to do a talk about the best sharp features because there's so much cool stuff that has come out lately. Uh, and I thought a talk about that would be not what I normally talk about, but it would be kind of cool. What are the best things? So I thought, hey, let's do a top three best features. And then I was like, no, it's more like a lightning talk. It's pretty short. It's hard to do three features for an hour. So I went like, ah, oh, let's do top five. Top five best C sharp features. Sounds about right. And then I pulled up the slides, or rather, sorry, I pulled up the, the interwebs and looked at what features had come out. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. No, there's so much stuff going on in the C-sharp world that uh, 10. I definitely need at least 10 to not to fill out my hour, but actually cram 10 into that hour, because I need to show off at least 10 new features, because there's so much cool stuff going on. So here it is. 
my version of the top 10 best new features in C-Sharp version 6 to 9. Um, before I get started on, on the actual C-Sharp features, I just want to mention a, a, a few little things, uh, or rather one thing in particular, and that's um, default language versions. So depending on what version of your framework and what framework, to be perfectly honest, if you're on .NET Framework or if you're on .NET Standard or if you're on .NET Core or if you're on .NET 5, uh, there are different default language versions. So if you're on .NET Framework, you end up with 7.3, C Sharp 7.3 as the default version for that language, for, for that platform. Uh, and for .NET Standard, same thing for 1 and 2 because they're compatible with .NET Framework. So that's 7.3 as well. Uh, 2.1, it's C Sharp 8. .NET Core 2 is 7.3. .NET 3, 8.0. And then on .NET 5, you obviously get the latest and the greatest, and you get all the new features, so you get C Sharp 9. Um, but if you're on these platforms, it might be interesting to switch anyway. So you can actually go into, if you're on .NET Framework, you can actually go in and change version of the language by setting up uh, an override in your CS project file. One thing to note, if you go into an older project and you change it up to the latest version and say, hey, I'm going to use C Sharp 9 features, woo -hoo! Um, some of the features will work without a problem. Some of them won't. So some of the features in C Sharp are just syntactical sugar that works um, even if you're on an older platform. Uh, but there are features in C Sharp later versions that actually require runtime changes, which means that you cannot run them on previous versions. So if you're going on .NET Framework, for example, and you go in and you change the, the C Sharp version, uh, make sure you know what, what stuff that you can use. I do believe that the compiler will tell you that this is not going to work, but some features will, some, some won't. Just good to know. So OK, let's just move on from this and, um, and have a look at Top 10 best new features in C Sharp version 6 to 9. Um, and in no particular order, number 10, string interpolation. So string interpolation is, is, is something that we do a lot, right? We, we write stuff like that. So we, we go and write uh, property plus uh, double quotes, space, double quotes, plus, blah, blah, blah. And, and it, it becomes a bit hard to read. There's a lot of plus signs, and there's a quotes, and you have to figure out what quotes to use. So it's, it's a bit of a pain, right? And also, this is actually performance-wise not that awesome, because it's actually going to create a bunch of middle stream strings and stuff like that. So it's ugly. That's the main thing. And then somebody comes and says, hey, let's do string.format instead, which is way nicer uh, in one way, because you get a, a template-based string instead. So you get your string, you put in your templates, uh, and it, it basically says 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you put in the values that should be shoved into those uh, positions, and, and you're good to go. Bit harder to read, bit harder to figure out, especially if you happen to work with some nutcase at your office that goes ahead and does that. If you start moving around the order of things, uh, it becomes really hard to read. So you, you kind of end up with this. Wait, uh, so one actually is first name, and two is last name, and then zero is name, and then the date at the end. OK. If you're going to use string.format, don't do that, please. It's really hard to read. But if you're on C Sharp 6 or higher, and on C Sharp 6, we're talking really old stuff. So C Sharp 6 works on everything that you're writing. You can just go ahead and use this string interpolation syntax like this, which is much nicer. Just prefix your string with a dollar sign. And then inside of your, your string, you just put your curly braces. And then inside of your curly braces, you can put C sharp. And whatever that string that C sharp outputs, uh, it gets interpolated into your, um, your string. This is it, it's, it's backwards compatible because honestly, it's just syntactical sugar. Uh, this gets turned into a string string.format in the end anyway, but it's just so much easier to read because it's literally you can look at it and go, okay, so it's a first name, last name, posted in, group name, on, and then the date. Very simple. So that's number 10. At number nine, we have default interface methods. So default inf interface methods are are interesting. Um, and and the, the idea behind them is this. You build this 
beautiful interface email client has one method called send email it takes a to and a, a from and a to and a subject and a body um and then it sends an email very nice very simple works perfectly no problems at all and then you get into that planning meeting and in that planning meeting somebody says hmm shouldn't we use templates for the emails because you know we're going to have them in different languages and we're going to have to do replacements and all of that wouldn't it be nicer if we had templates uh, and you sit there as a developer going, oh, OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, OK, well, we can do that. So you go back to your interface, and you, you write this new method. You add this method to the interface saying, send templated email instead. And it changes because it doesn't have a subject and a body. Instead, it has a, an email template, and it has a dictionary with, with replacements. So you can replace stuff inside of the template. Um, all of that, very nice. No problem at all. I'm happy with that interface. No problem at all. Control Shift B, build the solution, and you get that. You get an error. And the error is email client does not implement interface. And that's because there's already an impl implementation of your interface. There's already an email client that implements I email client. And now that you've changed the interface, you're forcing that email client to implement that method as well. And um, if you don't, well, in this case, it's probably going to be your internal client or your internal implementation. So that's not a problem. You just go and you can implement it there. But say that you add these things to things that you put on NuGet and you have to force people to implement new things, for example. Uh, bit, of a, bit of a hassle. So in C Sharp 8, uh, what they did is they said, well, let's, let's allow you to put a default implementation on your interface. So what we do here is you can see we have a we still have that i email client interface and we have the in, the new method the send templated email as we normally that sorry we had before that I just added but normally you'd end there and you wouldn't have an implementation but with this new de default implementation you can go and you can actually add an implementation to your email your interface and say okay so if you implement this interface and you don't implement this specific version or this specific method, sorry, we will give you a default implementation. There are some limitations to this, obviously. Uh, so the implementation that you're giving, the default implementation of that method, can only use things that it knows is available. So in this case, it can use the send email method from its own interface because it's no, it knows that I am a default implementation for this interface. So whatever class that implements this interface will have implemented the send email method as well. So I can use that. And then you can obviously use all the input parameters and so on. But you're limited to what you've got in the interface um, for quite obvious reasons, because that's all you have to work with. Um, and then when you build this, it, it means that the person implementing I email client only has to implement send email and then it can accept, uh, he or she can accept the default implementation of send templated emails until they he or she decides to implement their own version of it. So that's kind of cool. Gives us a bit of a sort of a fallback, uh, backwards compatibility situation where I need to add new stuff, uh, but I don't want to force everybody to have to change a bunch of things so I can do, add a default implementation, which is kind of cool. It actually means that we can change an interface uh, without it being a breaking change. Uh, so you don't need to do a, a major version upgrade. You can actually add an interface that doesn't break break anything. It just it, it will keep working. OK, um, default implementations. At number eight, uh, we have out variables. Out variables is a tiny little thing, uh, and it, it just fixes a thing that I really hate. So. This is the way that we got out, uh, out parameters in C Sharp before, right? You'd have to create your int value, so your little uh, member that, that would hold the value. And then you do like a try parse, and then you do out, and you'd pass in the value. And then if it succeeded, the value uh, field here would contain the value. Otherwise, who knows um, what, it, what, it, what it would contain. Um, and to me, I hate that thing. I, I, it, it, it messes with my, my OCD or CDO um, because I just, it's annoying. I don't want to have to declare that thing first. Uh, it's just ugly. So in C Sharp 7, they decided to actually fix that. So in C Sharp 7, they told us that, hey, 
how about we let you do this instead? So they allow us to go and say out int value. So we don't have to declare the variable first and then pass it in as an out parameter. We can actually declare the variable at the same place. And then after that if statement or after the try parse, the, uh, the var value will actually be assigned or sorry, the int value will be assigned. So just nice extra thing. And also I just let the cat out of the bag, but you can also switch the out int to an out var to have it automatically typed. Um, so this is nice. It, it removes those extra, we're still going to need the variable. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's still there. Uh, but it means that we don't have to have that little extra one liner above the try parse where we define the value. We can just do it as part of the try parse. Really nice little tiny addition, but it's, it's definitely worth having a, having a look at and using. Um, at number seven, expression bodied members. So expression-bodied members, they're a bit more complex. Um, as you can see here, um, it's high and low, right? My, my top 10 list is, is everything from really complex big features to, uh, hey, I can move the, the var assignment in, in an out parameter to, to the method call. There's going to be a big, big and small paces. Expression-bodied members is a, a medium-sized pace, and it's kind of interesting because it, it gets added to a bunch of other features as well, and, and it allows us to do other things with the feature than what I'm going to show you here, but this is the foundation. So imagine that you have this class here, right? The, the product class, and it has this get for the, uh, the properties, and we have to have a backend field for it, and we have to have a get accessor, which just returns name, which honestly, it's quite a lot of code for just a simple thing, like having a, a read-only property. And yes, uh, we, we've had this thing for a while where we can basically say we can remove the backing field and then we can have a private set uh, on the, the properties, which isn't actually really the same thing, um, it, but, but, but it works in the same way. And we remove the backing field uh, and we get read on the property. It's nicer, uh, still lots of curly braces and stuff. So in C-sharp 6, uh, they added this feature of expression bodied members. So it allows us to go and use these arrow functions where we can get, we still have the backing field, not getting rid of that right now, uh, but it allows us to do a very short one liner, say here's a property. And when you call that, you're going to get the, in this case, underscore name or underscore price. Uh, so our properties, our get only properties becomes these really nice, simple, tiny things that we can write on one line without a bunch of curly braces. However, as soon as you go from read only to read write, you are back to this syntax here again, because well, either that, or you can use that other syntax with get semicolon, set semicolon and remove the backing field, but you still end up with a bit more code. So in C sharp seven, um, they've taken this, this code here and turn that into expression bodied members as well. So not only for read only properties, we can actually in C sharp seven go and do it for both the get and the set as well. So once again, we get rid of some curly braces, um, not a huge gain to be perfectly honest, it's just kind of cool. Uh, and as I said, expression bodied members is a, is a medium sized function. There's a lot of stuff going into it or feature. Um, and what I'm showing you here are some simple examples, but it, it actually permeates the language uh, in a lot of places where you can do a lot of more things with this feature. For example, uh, you can also go and change functions, right? So if we have this two string function here, which is a, it becomes three lines. I know it's not a big deal, but it comes three lines, curly braces, parentheses, uh, return and blah, blah, blah. In C sharp six, we can change that into a nice one liner again, because all we want to do is do a bit of a string concatenation and return that. Why do we need curly braces and return and all of that? This just becomes a, a nice, simple terse syntax for doing that same thing. Um, and with C sharp seven, they've taken it one step further and actually allow us to do constructors and destructors um, or finalizers uh, with expression body members as well. So once again, we save a few little curly braces, but honestly, it's, it's for the constructor and finalizer or destructors. Um, I don't see it being a huge deal, uh, because it only works for pretty much for, uh, constructors with one argument. Uh, and often we have a few more and for the destructor, 
we often do a bit more than just log product was finalized, to be perfectly honest. So that was number six, seven, um, expression bodied members, uh, which is kind of cool. We, we're going fast, I know, but there's quite a lot to cover. Um, so at number six, uh, we're looking at discards. So discards are interesting because, <laughs> well, they are more of a intent thing in a lot of cases. Uh, it, it shows your intent with your code and not uh, actually that much of functionality. So if we go in and we have a look at uh, this code here. So we have do something that returns task and do something calls, do something else that also returns a task. And we have this await statement here, but as you can see, do something else actually returns a string. So the question is that that line there, did we, did, did the developer here sort of forget what was coming back? Uh, or, or was this intentionally leaving the, the return value out there? And also if there is a return value, why is it not being used? There has to be something weird going on in here. Um, and it, it can be a bit sort of, it, it's not a big problem. It's just, it, it looks weird. Because it's like there is a return value, but you're ignoring it. Was that intentionally? So in C sharp seven, they introduced uh, discards. So discards is the idea where you have an underscore only. So you declare a variable or you declare just underscore. Underscore equals await do something else. So underscore tells the compiler that I don't really care about the value. Uh, I don't assign it to anything, just throw it away. I don't need it. But it makes it very clear in this case here that, oh, OK, so you do know that there's something coming back, but you really don't care. So you're telling anybody coming after you and looking at your code that, OK, the developer who built this, wrote this, knows that there's information coming back, but it, it's not needed. We can ignore that stuff. Very simple. So it's more of an intent thing for this scenario. It's like, OK, so what was the intent? Well, I ignored it. But you've also got this thing here. This is another example. So in this case, we've got do something uh, which is void. It's, it's not an async method. Uh, and it calls do something else, which is an async method. Uh, but what I want to do in do something is I just want to call do something else, fire or forget. It could be like, a, hey, log this thing. I don't care if you succeed or not. I don't want to wait for you. Just go and do that in the background. Um, let me keep going on with my stuff. If that works out, fine. If it doesn't work out, I really don't care. Just it's not very important. If you write this code that I've got here, which is do something, calling, do something else, and just ignoring the fact that it's async, you're going to get a warning. And I'm not saying that warnings are necessarily something you have to care about. They're just warnings. Literally, they, they tell you that, hey, you might want to have a look here because there might be something wrong. Um, but it, they're kind of annoying. It's kind of nice to get rid of them so that you sort of go, OK, so I know that I've checked all of these things. So once again, with that warning here that says, because this call is not awaited, execution of the current method uh, continues before the call is completed, blah, blah, blah. So it tells us that you probably want to have an await here. But then I don't really want an await because I don't want to do a fire or forget. Go and do that thing. I don't care. Fail or whatever. Just go and do it. So here, by adding that discard that I was talking about, um, it means that I'm not really just telling the future developer, the future me, when I come back to my code that, hey, I know what I'm doing here, I, I don't care. By adding this discard here, I am saying that I know that there, there's a task coming back. I just don't care about the task. And now you've shown your intent to the compiler. So now the compiler removes the warning because, OK, you figured it out. You're getting the task back. You're not awaiting it. I really don't care. But you've at least shown me that you don't care about the task being returned, so it becomes fire forget without the warning. Sweet. Um, but it can also be used for another one. This is actually a, a, a real favorite of mine. I assume that loads of you listening or look, looking at this, this feed here uh, has written this, this code here. So it's a do stuff method. And it starts out with, uh, if it's null, throw argument null exception. If it's short, less than, uh, or sorry, if the, that's interesting. That should have been less than um, one. Uh, anyhow, 
uh, throw an argument exception. But anyhow, there's all of these um, checks that we do before we start our method to verify that the incoming values are correct. And right now, it's just one incoming parameter. It's just one string name. I have to check it for null, and I have to check it for length, which I apparently don't know how to do. Um, and it becomes, well, in this case, there is si there's six lines of code with a space, or seven lines of code just to verify those two things. And if, you, if I'd had more incoming parameters, I might have had to check more of them. And we end up with this massive block at the top going, throw argument null exception, throw this, throw that, because you're a moron calling the method with the wrong arguments. With discards, we can do this. This is lovely, in my opinion, because it basically means that, hey, I want to do an ex make an expression here. So I'm going to check to see if the, the name and then question mark, question mark means if it's not not if it's not null, rather, sorry, sorry, if it's null, then do whatever is on the right hand side. So if name is null, then throw a new argument exception. But that's, that syntax there, name, question mark, question mark, blah, is actually an assignment that allows us to assign name or something else, if it's null, to a variable. But the discard here allows us to basically say it becomes that the syntactical thing is I am assigning something, but it's actually not an assignment because the right-hand side is a throw. And also, whatever it could have assigned, I really don't care. So we end up with these much, much neater little one-liners for all of this. Is it null? Is it va valid? Is it this? Is it that? So all of our checks can become a lot more uh, dense, and we don't have to start our functions with, with 70 lines of, of curly braces and if statements and all of that. It just becomes one thing. And this also includes another C-sharp feature, which didn't get its own slot, but it got showed anyway. It's C-sharp 7's version of throw expressions. So it allows us to throw things as part of an expression, which wasn't allowed until C Sharp 7. So the combination of uh, discards and throw expressions allows us to do this nice, simple um, variable validation. Very sweet, very cool, makes our code much nicer. At number five, we've got actually, <laughs> okay, so I'm cheating a little bit. At number five, I've actually taken two features and, and pull them into one and call them number one because they both have to do with null, null stuff. So we've got null conditional operators and we've got null coalescing assignments. I thought they were close enough to call them one thing. So we're going to start off with null conditional operator, uh, which is quite nice. So look at this code here. Send order confirmation, right? So and send order confirmation, it, it takes in an order. And I have to verify that the order isn't null. Uh, and if the order isn't null, I need to verify that the order actually has a recipient, so it's not null. And then if it has a recipient, I need to verify that the recipient has an email address. And then once I know all of those things, I can then call send email to and, and use the, the, uh, the email address from the, the email address on the recipient on the order. That becomes... Um, an ugly mess, to be perfectly honest. It, it, you can see that cone-shaped things with ifs, inside ifs, with inside ifs, um, which is just annoying. And then, OK, sure, absolutely, this is worst case scenario. I could make it nicer. I could do it in one if statement, uh, which is a, list a little bit better, a little easier to read. It's not ugly with all the curly braces and the little cone of death going to the right. Uh, but there's still a lot of checks going on. I have to do three checks in here to verify that I can find whatever I need to be able to send send an, uh, an email. So in C-sharp 6, they introduced the null coalescing thing. Uh, and what that does, it, it looks like this. So it allows us to basically dot through our properties. But we use what's called the Elvis operator. So it's the, the question mark dot. So question mark dot says, if order is null, then it, the whole statement becomes null. If order is assigned and it's not null, then go and look at recipient. If recipient is null, then the whole thing becomes null. Otherwise, it goes and looks at the email address. And then if the email address is null, uh, it becomes null. Otherwise, it becomes not null. So we can do all of those multiple lines of, of, of this stuff here can get turned into a one-liner, which is very, very easy to read. All we do is we take whatever we need, and then we add a question mark for every step that we do that can be null. 
and then we check for a null at the end. So we can do sort of a, a null evaluation over a graph of objects. And I said wrong, it's not null coalescing, null conditional um, operator it's called. The, the last one is in this thing here is, is null coalescing assignment. So it, the previous was an operator where we could look at things. Uh, the co null coalescing assignment is, is once again, is null based, but it's, it's a different feature. Uh, but it, once again, it tries to make our code denser, nicer, easier to read. So for example, this code here, uh, it, you get uh, my options passed in in this case. And then the first thing we do, we check to see if, is op if options is null. And if it is, in this case, we're not throwing anything. Um, instead, we're saying, hey, if it's null, then I want you to use the defaults instead. So it's OK to pass in null. Uh, I'll just replace it with default values if it is null. And in C Sharp 8, we get this really cool null coalescing operator um, that allows us to say, if the previous, uh, sorry, if the value is null, then assign it to the, this. Otherwise, keep the value. So this thing here says that if options is null, then assign it to my options.default. Otherwise, keep options. So it's, it's literally exactly the same as this. But once again, it becomes this one liner, which is much easier to read. So it's a version of what I did before with the, um, the throw expression, where we do just uh, question mark, question mark. So what you normally have would be options equals options, question mark, question mark. Uh, my options default, but in this case we get to shorten that down even further into just question mark question mark equals, and then you can start adding questions about are we really at the point where C sharp needs three character operators, because we're at question mark question mark equals. I used to like C sharp in the beginning because it was fairly simple. There were not a ton of features, and I agree the features are good, but we're also increasing the bar for learning this language. Now, as I said, we're looking at three character operators. And for most people who are new to development, they would look at this and go, oh, I don't understand. My head hurts. I want to go home. On the other hand, the, the other side of that coin is that you don't have to use these features. They are there, but the old syntax works just as well. It's just for us people who have been around C Sharp for a long, long time, we can write this very nice, dense code that, that makes it easier to read our code as well. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, I use these quite a lot. Actually, I use the, the first one. The second one with assignment is not something I use a whole lot, but it's a co cool feature to have, and it makes our code a lot easier. Um, and this is where we now move into number four. Null reference types. So nullable reference types uh, is a is a bigger feature, uh, and it's 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 really cool and it's there to help us. Uh, and what it does is we come back to this, right? So we have this print length, and it the first thing we have to do is we need to check the value for nullability, um, and then throw an argument null exception if it's null, and then we can do our thing. So once again, we come back to these having to verify things, and especially run null. We really always have to validate, is this null? I've told you to pass in a string, but since it's string is a reference type, uh, it means that when we pass it in, it, it can always be null. So any reference type can always be null, which is annoying, because any reference type you, you get in, you should always do a null check. And I know that we as developers generally skip that step, which is fine in most cases because we know that our code won't have a null value there. But it's kind of annoying having to have this little gut feel about it's You feel a bit sort of like, oh, is this null? Do I need to have a null check here? Can this actually be null? Maybe it can, maybe it can't. Uh, I might as well throw in a check for it and all of that. So to solve that problem, C Sharp 8 introduces this new deal called null reference types. Uh, oh, sorry, nullable reference types. And nullable reference types means that we can do this instead. We can we can go ahead and we can remove the null, null check because it, nullable reference types means that reference types has to ex be explicitly set up as nullable. Uh, so any reference type with null, nullable reference types becomes a non-nullable object. So you cannot have a null value of a reference type. 
which means that if we, in our function, require you to pass in a string, the compiler will actually force you to pass in a verified string and not something that can be null. So it also means that to be able to pass in, use a, uh, a null value for a reference type, you actually need to set a question mark. So string question mark value equals null. So in, in null of a reference type, this is saying that, OK, so string is a reference type, but it's I'm using nullable reference types, which means that it can't be null. I have to explicitly make this nullable. So I do that. Um, I, I declare it as a nullable. I set it to null, and I pass it into my print length. Uh, and I compile it, and the compiler is happy-go-lucky. It doesn't say anything. And I run my code, and it goes object reference set, not set to an object. But Chris, well, you, you, but, but what? You said nullable reference types, and you're now showing us null reference exceptions. Yes, the code that I just showed you um, with the print length and nullable string and all of that is code that is running in a .NET Core application, uh, and it just works. Because nullable reference types is something that you have to turn on. It's not enabled by default because it's a, a massive breaking change. If you turn it on on an old project, you'll get like 10,000 errors in your code, and you're going to have to go walk through it and, and figure it out in every single place because it will break everything. So you actually have to go in and enable it. So you go into your CS proj file. Um, and for .NET Core, .NET Framework-based applications or the new project system, you go in and you, you just add this nullable enable. Uh, and you're good to go. And if you're on the older project format, uh, you go in and you add, uh, you have to upgrade the language version to version eight as a minimum, and you turn on nullable. Once you've made that change um, in your project uh, CS proj file, you're telling the compiler that I want to opt in to nullable reference types. Once you've done that little config change, there's no change whatsoever uh, in your print length method. And if I don't make any changes here at this point either, so I leave the value to be a, a nullable string uh, and set it to null, if I build this now, I get an, a warning. I get a possible null, null reference argument. So basically, the compiler is telling me, you're potentially pass, passing in a null value here. I have a warning for you. So that's kind of cool. So you can turn this on in an old project. Uh, and then you can see how many thousands of, of weird null issues you have. And then you can slowly walk through them and try to fix them. Because it is it means that we, we never have to be afraid that something that we expect to have a value, a reference type being passed in, it, it will never be null, which removes a lot of weird null reference type exceptions and, and things like that. So it's a, it's a cool safety measure. And if you, for some reason, do need to have a nullable thing passed in, so you want to have a string that can be a null value, you just add that question mark. So question mark means, hey, it's nullable. You can pass in null here. That's fine. I will handle that on my own. I will make sure that I validate it for null when you pass it in. And we can then obviously combine that with uh, this sweet null coalescing thing where we go and look at value if null is not null then take length and use that otherwise we do the question mark question mark empty string so basically we're safing up the nullable things but we have to do it manually but it's kind of cool because it means that we as developers have to take responsibility of whether or not it, it can be a nullable reference type and if you know that your value is not null but the compiler still says hey this is a possible null value because there are scenarios that you you can get variables that are, you know are not null, but the compiler can't figure it out. It does happen. Then you just add a, an exclamation mark to it. So you just go exclamation mark. Hey, I know this value is not null. I've already checked it. This is fine. I'm going to trust this. I'm going to take responsibility. And then you're, it's going to be happy-go-lucky and not complain about possible null reference. However, if we back up a few little things, I, I showed you this. So I turn on nullable reference type, and I get a warning. And that's the thing, nullability issues are just warnings. So they won't actually fail your build. So you can turn, as I said, you can turn it on in an old project. You'll give thousands of warnings, but they're only warnings. Your compile will still go through. 
But if you're going into a new project where you want to make sure that you use nullable reference types and you want to make sure that everybody sticks to it, you can actually go into your CS project file and you can set this thing that says warnings as errors, and then you sell nullable. Uh, so by just adding nullable in there, it means that every warning that is part of the nullable spectrum, so basically there are a bunch of different warnings you can get, they all become errors. And then your nullability issues are now errors and they will fail your build. So if you turn this on in the, at the beginning of your project, you can make sure that there's always chip proper null checks everywhere in your code, which is really neat. And if you're slowly converting a project, or maybe not slowly, quickly converting a project anyhow, and you want to have sort of, you want to turn it on, but you want to disable it in some areas, you can use this pragma thing here and say nullable, enable, or disable, and then nullable restore. And then between those two nullable um, statements, it will check or not check your code. So if you turn on nullable reference types, you can then tur turn it off for a small part of your code or the other way around. If you have it turned on, you can uh, turn it off. You can turn it on for a part of your code. So you can slowly migrate your code into a null nullable reference type scenario, uh, even though you have stuff that's not working with that at the moment. So that's nullable reference types. It's a, it's a much bigger thing. Um, at number three, we have named tuples. This is this is another favorite of mine. I actually like this a lot because um, I yeah I, I'll get back to why. Um, I believe a lot of us have written these classes, right? Stupid return value class. You have to create this stupid class that the only reason for you to have it is because you want to be able to return two values from a method. So in this case, I want to return a, a Boolean to say whether or not it was a success. And then I want to return a string for the response for, for whatever I did. And, and, and sure, I could use out parameters to, to do the same thing. And that was what you used to do in C-sharp early days. But you cannot use out parameters with async methods, for example. So out parameters is not really a good way forward. Um, so we end up writing these classes here, which are just annoying. And, and we try to reuse them as much as we can. And we make generic versions of them, but they're still there. So in C-sharp 4, they introduce C-sharp tuples. C-sharp 4 tuples or C-sharp tuples allows us to do this here, right? So we are allowed to do a function that returns, uh, in this case, a, a Boolean and a string. And then we return a Boolean and a string. And we can return as many different values as we want and we can return more than one value, and we don't have to have that stupid return class, which is cool. However, using that do something method, you end up with this. So you do do something response, and then response item one, response item two, with no explanation whatsoever what item one and item two is. So you end up, oh, wait, if you return, say, maybe three or four different things, maybe you shouldn't, but if you do, you have to go, oh, wait, wait, w w one was that thing and two was that. And especially if you return a couple of different strings. So it's like, which string is which? Which is am I supposed to use? Blah, blah, blah. It's, I, I, I used it a little bit. And I think every time I try to use tuples, I, I go, I'm going to use tuples. They're awesome. And then you end up with item one and item two. And I just it, it just fails. And I go back to the stupid return classes instead. So good try. Didn't work. C Sharp 7 introduces value tuples. Um, and you can use C# -sharp 7 value tuples uh, for not just modern stuff, but if you're on .NET Framework less than 4.7, then there's a NuGet package for you to add them as well. So you can add them into your legacy code. Um, C# -sharp tuple, C# -sharp, um, value tuples are much cooler because they look kind of the same, but instead of saying just I'm going to return bool string, you actually give them a name. So you go, it's going to be a bool is success, and it's going to be a string response. And then you return it like you did before. Uh, you just do a parenthesis with true and it works. And then when you call it, the compiler actually magically creates a response object for you, which has an is success and response property on it. So you get proper typing. You can go dot. It tells you what's being returned. It is awesome. C sharp. For version, the C sharp tuples are still around, uh, and there are some big differences between them. So in C-sharp tuples, they are immutable reference types with properties. So they, they are classes with properties that are read-only. They're immutable, uh, but they're called item one, two, three. Whereas value tuples are actually mutable. So they are value types, and they don't have properties. They have fields. 
So when you get something back as a value tuple, you can actually change it, which you couldn't do in C sharp tuples. But I don't care. They are awesome. Uh, they make a lot of code much, much simpler and smaller. And you can even go and do this, which is another cool feature in C sharp uh, tuples, or sorry, uh, value tuples, uh, destruction. So that, that thing there is called deconstruction. And deconstruction allows us to take something that comes back from do something and split it out. So instead of getting a response object back, I can split the properties from that into different objects, uh, or, or sorry, different variables. But then we end up with that blah, blah, bool, blah, that we had in the out variables before, or out parameters before, which is kind of annoying. So they also allow us to do this, uh, where we basically declare our properties um, in the return. Uh, and yes, they are positional. So that it figures out per position, position what, what is being put where. Um, and then you can use the individual var variables instead. And you can even go and say var in front of it. And then var is success and response. And you get them typed uh, automatically. And if you only care about one of the values, for example, is success, then you can just go and do a uh, uh, throw it away um, and say, hey, don't care about this thing here. Just not my problem. I just want to know if it's a success or not. So that's kind of cool. Uh, value tuples are awesome. Uh, they give a lot of flexibility to, to really small and nice code. And in C Sharp 7.3, they were changed a little bit. So you actually get a value equality comparison. So if you create two tuples like this and value tuples and then compare them, that's going to work fine. Just a little thing to note is that your comparison is ordinal. So if you go and do that, it's actually going to go ahead and say, wait. It doesn't care if it's count and x and y and product. It's going to be happy with the ordinal thing. So what it says is that int 32 at position 1 equals int 32 at position 1 of the other object, and string at position 2 equals string at position 2. So it's all positional, which makes it really, really dangerous in my world, because you can actually compare literally apples and bananas, uh, which is bad. So that's value tuples, um, really cool feature. Um, at number 2, we've got pattern matching and switch expressions. Another one of these, let's make our code smaller, simpler, easier to read. Not introducing anything new and spectacular, but it takes code like this and makes it simpler. So this code is, is almost valid. It's, it's a log method. It takes an object, and then depending on what you're passing in, it will log it for you. So it basically, it looks at the item. If it's null, it doesn't log anything. If it's a string, it converts the string to a string, uh, the item to a string, and then compares to string.empty and then writes out the string if it's not an empty string. And then if it's a, an i loggable, it casts the item to i loggable. And then based on the log level, it, it writes out errors. And then finally, at the end, uh, if, it's, if it's neither a string nor an i loggable, it, it just writes out unknown and item. So that's a fine. It, it works. Uh, but in C Sharp 7, they've made this a little bit better. So in C Sharp 7, they introduced this cool idea where you can do an if statement and you can get with is. So you do if item is string. And then you can add a variable at the end of the if statement and say, hey, basically, or, or rather, if item is string, then assign the value to the str, uh, str uh, variable. So I don't need to do a separate cast afterwards. Because normally, you would have to do a check, say, if it's a string, then cast it to a string and then start working with the string. This combines that into one thing. And you can see it with the string. And you can see it with the i loggable that it basically it does the, the uh, evaluation and the assignment in one line, which is, it makes it a little bit simpler. But we can also go ahead and do something like this. So with, sorry, not, not, we can go and do more interesting scenarios with this, because we can turn this whole thing into a switch, right? So we, instead of if, else if, we can turn it into a switch that looks like this. So once again, null or, or empty string, do nothing. If it's a string, we can do case string str. And that means that if the item is a string, assign it to the str variable as a, um, as a string. And then we can do i loggable. Once again, if it is i loggable, 
then turn it into a, a log, add it to the logable variable. And then we can combine that with when and say, so if what you're passing in is an I logable and the log, logable log level is error, then do this. If the log level is that, do that. And if it's just, if, if it's neither of those, go and do this thing over here. And then we can have a default at the end. So we can do this else if based on types and interfaces with, with uh, limitations or, or filters on it in just one go, which is really nice. And we can also do my favorite x is null. Instead of doing x equals equals null, x is null is readable. So that, that's awesome. I, it's a tiny thing, but it makes a difference. And also, it's not overridable. So if somebody goes in and overrides the equals equals uh, um, operator, uh, this is not affected, which is cool. C sharp 8 allows us to do even more. It allows us to actually do an expression here where we do a, a function that returns the result of a switch. Uh, and in this case, um, you see here it goes, it takes the item, it does item switch to say, I want to do a switch on this thing. And then if it's null, then return empty string. If it's empty string, return empty string. If it's a string, return the string. If it's I logable with my, my filters on it, then return these things. Otherwise, return the message, otherwise unknown. So that whole massive if, then, else, blah, 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 turns into this really small, small and small, but it turns it into to this, which is actually quite readable, even though it's doing a lot of stuff. And there are very few curly braces in there. Uh, we can also go and say I logable. So in this case, we know that it's being passed in as an I logable. And we can still switch on that. But when we do the switch, we can then use curly brace and say, hey, by the way, can you filter this based on the log level property? So instead of having to do like an if statement, if this, if that, whatever, we can go and actually switch based on properties inside of that thing in a very nice and, and nice way. And we can also combine that with actually taking in two parameters. So as you can see here, I'm taking in both item and area. And then I switch on the item. And then I use both the area and the item inside of my switch, which is kind of cool. Not to mention that you can make a really quick rock, paper, scissor by taking two input parameters, turning them into a tuple, and then you match based on, uh, based on both the values in the tuple. And then you can have a little uh, sort of fallback for everything else with this throw throwaway at the end. And in C sharp 9, they've taken it a bit further with things like this. So if we look at this piece of code here, the file name all, uh, if you're going to look at the expression here, it's basically it says, if x is, and then we can give and say, hey, it's going to be greater than or equal to a, or less than or equal to z, or, and then we can have another thing, and then we can have or, or. So we've got very readable. If x is blah, 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 easy to read. And for the file extension here, once again, we can do a really nice go length is greater than or equal to two and less than or equal to four, which is once again, very easy to read, which is nice. And they also introduced is not null, which is oh, so much better than if x not equals null. Is not null is awesome. And the final thing, number one with the bullet, the biggest change in C sharp in the few, last few years is record types. And when I mention record types, some developers go, wait, 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 we've got value types and reference types. Are we getting a new type of objects now? And uh, no, we're not. It's not a new type of object at all. Records are actually immutable reference types uh, with default implementations uh, without you having to do a bunch of things. So basically, they will give you, the, the C Sharp compiler will give you stuff for free. They will give you a very basic implementation. So imagine the order class here. It, it takes in an ID article name total and, and has properties for each one of those. Uh, so we need to do bo boilerplate code here, 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 here. Um, and then if you, after that boilerplate code, decide that, hey, let's do some equality checking as well, because we want to use order and compare them. So we need to add these methods in here as well with implementations. And, and all of a sudden, your very simple little class becomes this humongous thing, because all of a sudden, there are all these overrides and properties and blah, blah, blah. But it, you really just wanted a basic class. It just, you ended up having to do all of these things. So in C Sharp 9, they introduced records. So to do exactly that order class that I just showed you, all you have to do is this. 
public record order, int ID, string, article name, decimal total. That's it. And then the compiler will actually turn that into a class that has an ID property, an article name property, a decimal property. It will have a value comparison and all of that. So it means that we can do this. So we can just go ahead and we can create new orders, but the uh, equals equals works fine because the uh, um, equals overrides are already in place. So order one and two will not be equal, order two and three will not be equal, but one and three will be because they have the same ID, they, all the values are the same. So it basically compares all the values of, of your class. Um, but it's not reference equals, they are two different classes. Uh, and also two, two string is overridden as well. So if you do two string, it will actually tell you order and then the, param the values within curly braces. There's just so little code for so much functionality, which is really, really cool. But then they've taken it even further with this feature here. This is very similar in code. I know it's a hard, bit hard to read, but if we look at these things here, if we create one order, we can then say var order two should be order one with article name set to test two. That will basically clone order one, but change the article name to test two. Or you can do with curly brace, curly brace and, and, and basically assign a a copy of order one into order three. So the reference, the two different references between one and three, but they will contain the same value. So that with thing allows us to do immutable types in a very nice way. But they're just they're just regular types, right? So we can still go and do what I'm doing in here. You can see I'm I'm actually adding, I'm inheriting order, which is a, a record type. So I can inherit that. That's not a problem. I can own my own add my own constructor in here and just call base because in the end, my record is just a class, but it's generated by the constructor. I can add my own property to it because I'm now taking responsibility of this class myself. I can add my own functions to it because it's my own class. I'm just happening to inherit one of those auto-generated order classes that was created. So you get this really nice thing where you can do public record order and you get all of that functionality out of the box by, from the compiler, but then you can take it further, you can make changes to it, and you can basically grow it up into its own class if you want to as well. So that was actually pretty much all I had about C Sharp. I just want to mention one little thing. There is something I want to tell you, and that is these are my favorite features. My favorite features in no particular order, there are a lot of other features and they are all dependent on what kind of software development you're doing. If you're into other areas, you might like other features and think my features are stupid. I don't care. It's up to everyone. It's very subjective. And I've also heard the question, is C-sharp getting too complicated? I even highlighted that myself that we might be getting to a sort of a, is this too complicated scenario? We've got three character um, uh, operators and so on. And, Yes, we're getting a lot of complex and cool stuff in C-sharp that, that we can use, but it's it's always backwards compatible. So we can still use the old stuff. So new developers coming into to C-sharp is probably going to pick up some of the new features, but maybe use some of the old ones that are a bit easier to understand to begin with instead of question mark, question mark equals. Um, but I can also, and I can see us people have been involved in the business uh, longer. We might pick up some features as well and keep old features, but they're both always available. So is it getting too complicated? Not really, because the old features are still there. Nothing is being removed. We're not forced into this new three character operator kind of C sharp. So is it complicated? Yes. Too complicated? No, because the old stuff is already there. It's, it's still there. Other than that, I just want to I want to thank you for for listening to my me ranting about C sharp and the things I like about C sharp. Um, you can reach me on on, on Twitter at zero call. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out. I would actually expecting some some people to uh, to come in and, and help out with the questions. Um, there we are. Right there we are. There hey, we are. I, I'm I'm not alone. I'm feeling. Oof. They've, they've left me. I'm now going to run all of .NET or JetBrains.NET days on my own, but apparently not. The stream is still running. Cool. <laughs> also, I think both us and uh, people in the comments um, are raving about your session. So thank you for uh, for a lot of good content. Uh, and actually, that. when I when I saw the Ace Ventura animated GIF, I had to think <laughs> of something there. Um, the ternary operator, uh, I think from C sharp five or six, it was, I think, the, the question mark colon. 
is yeah. often referred to as the Elvis operator. And I think yep. that uh, null coalescing assignment operator could actually be the Ace Ventura operator. Ah, I like that idea. I think if we should introduce that. Yeah. I think, I, think we should, I think we should bring that in and make that a thing. <laughs> Let's do that from now on. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, you've got weight in in Rider. Can't you just get it into Rider somewhere? You should turn this into a. <laughs> should I, right. it sounds like a good April Fool. I think like giving all the different operators fancy names yeah. just for one day. I think you should have it permanently. Well, they they need cooler names. Who can remember null coalescing operator or null coalescing assignment operator? It Ace Ventura operator works fine for me. So are there any questions? Anybody anybody actually have some input? Or let's uh, let's go into those. Um, by the way, people, if you have questions, ask them in the chats. Uh, we already noted a couple during the session. So let's maybe rewind to the beginning, default methods and interfaces. Uh, we had a question or someone asking about what if you're inheriting from two interfaces with different default implementations? Uh, I That's actually a very good question. I haven't looked at that. I assume that if you have two different actually what happens in general if you have two different interfaces with with two with the same method names i think you're going to have to do an explicit uh, implementation and i think the default implementation is going to fall away i don't think you can actually have that that scenario i think the compiler is going to going to kill you i haven't actually i haven't looked that, that that's something uh, that actually many people complain about because they they think if you inherit the interface then you can just call the method but that's not true because you have to make a cast on this with the interface and then you can call the method so it it will always be explicit from the uh, caller side let's say okay and uh, well it, otherwise it would be an overload if it's an inheritance chain or something uh, but yeah. You, usually, you have to cast your your own reference, basically, and then call that method. That, well, that makes a lot of sense. There, there you go, blog post inspiration. <laughs> yep. There was actually also a question regarding uh, multiple, I'm not sure where is it on our list here, but I will just say it anyways, uh, with, with multiple default uh, interface default methods, so you can kind of lose track. And some people were also concerned uh, if if it's a good idea to put implementation in an interface, you know, from a from a maintenance perspective, but I, I, I think yeah, go ahead. I, I must say I I agree with that. I don't think I I see it as a last resort. Sort of I have to introduce this, and I might introduce a breaking change. So it's sort of a a fallback solution to in my opinion, or a potential way of doing um, extension methods kind of stuff. So instead of having an extension method on my interface with with different implementations, like my example with the send email, if I want to have like a, a pre format different pre formatted email versions that all piggyback on the same same implementation, then I think that would you can either do that as a default implementation of the interface or as extension methods. And I think the having it on the the interface keeps it in one place uh, instead of having it in in two places, uh, but that's one scenario I can see that it works. Other than that, to me, it would be a last resort kind of a thing. I, I actually have one more scenario that works pretty well, and that is, well, usually we don't have uh, multiple inheritance, right? Uh, so we can only yeah. have one base class. And one place where I use that is in my uh, pet project, let's say, uh, where you can put things together like, like you would, like, like different components. And you just add them and they inherit those methods and then you can use the original object and actually it's used uh, it's called through reflection so i don't have this cast etc this is actually a nice way and and also uh something that 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 was surprising me is you can actually mark those methods as sealed still so that would uh disallow the inheritor uh, from ah. overriding something so it sometimes Th those features are quite surprising also, but they they also ultimately fit nicely together. That's the same. Well, that's the thing. I think we're going to see lots of interesting patterns coming out of this uh, with, with these new features. I, I, actually, earlier today, I, I just recorded a podcast where I was questioning the solid principles and said that solid principles might not be as relevant today, partly because, first of all, they're misinterpreted, but mostly because we have 
other languages, other compilers, other features. And, and I can say that we can do things today we couldn't before. And I think it's going to be the same thing with some of these features where people are going to invent new patterns that, for example, the, uh, the null throw thing where you can check the null and throw at the same time is one of those patterns that I kept use. I, I use it all the time now instead of the if statements. And I don't think that was what uh, Mads Torgerson and his friends were thinking of when they came up with it, but it's one of those, hey, it makes a lot of sense to use it there. Yes, speaking of new patterns that are emerging with uh, using c -sharp and all, um, I just saw, just want to mention this, um, Matthias and I obviously also follow the sessions and I saw him just tweet while you were presenting about using <laughs> deconstruction switch expressions and uh, pattern matching and all of that in one tweet. So here goes. Um, I think that's, that's during working hours. <laughs> definitely a new pattern emerging there. Uh, that, that's so pretty cool. I, I can maybe explain it because I was during during your session, Chris. I was I was uh, I was quite often reminded about that because previously that code down there and it, it's not exactly easy to read right now because it's a bit small. But uh, that has been several if statements before you know where you declare something uh where you make the declaration first and then you assign it and then first i had i had it with ternary operators uh with what one ternary operator nested basically and that was a great moment because i didn't think of using switch expressions at that point uh but but then uh rider made made me know and and showed that little hint and i could just convert and and that all combined with the construction so I, I think after looking at this I thought it's really nice I mean compared to what it, it would have been with previous C sharp versions it's not not comparable and quite 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 nice I actually I like it that a lot it it takes a while to get used to because there's a lot of new stuff in that that piece of code there but to be perfectly honest it's very succinct and very very terse but also very easy to Okay, very easy to read might be an, an overstatement, but it, it's actually not that hard to read once you get used to it. I'm pretty sure if I showed this to a new C Sharp developer, they're going to go, whoa, what, what's, what kind of sorcery is this? But this makes sense. I, I like it. It just it took me a little while to look at it, but I think we're going we're gonna to get used to that. Uh, we are going to get used to these new things. It just takes a while for our brains to get hardwired into that. Just look at how we, we've, at least me, I've started using Link or start how we have changed in the way that we use link. I remember teaching people about using link and you'd use that from blah, 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 the uh, the link expression thingy. I never use that anymore now. I actually use the, the methods instead, but I can also read them in the same way that I would have that statement. So I think our brains sort of slowly wrap our heads around these new features and things that we find complicated today is just gonna be obvious in the future, maybe. Yeah, very true, very true actually. Actually, I also think uh, some formatting might help. So for example, in that tweet, having some additional formatting so your brain can parse it more easy is, is probably yeah. better. Um, a related question there, um, if you're speaking about expression bodied members um, and all that, do you prefer to use um, the arrow on the first line or of the declaration line or on the next line? And in a class, oh. do you mix regular bodies with expression bodies? Uh, I, I do mix. Uh, but because uh, I expression bodies are, are just when it's a very, very simple method. So anything that becomes more than just a more of a return or a concatenation or very, very simple stuff, I, I do regular expression, regular methods. Um, as for the arrow function, arrow, um, I put it on the first line, I put it on the, the same line. Uh, but if it's a more complex, long return, uh, it, that ends up on the second line. Uh, so I think it's a sort of a, this is my function, arrow, and then new line, uh, if I think that's the way I do it, or is, I'm, I don't know. This is a weird question, a hard question. I don't, I don't actually remember. Uh, normally they're just in one line because they, they are very simple. If they're more complex, I, I still prefer the curly brace stuff. Also, what's the arrow thing called? Cause I've, I've heard different names of that. Uh, I've called it fat arrow, but apparently you're not allowed to say that anymore because it's body shaming. And I didn't actually know C Sharp had a body, but it's now supposed to be called something else. Well, I'm, I mean, we have the Elvis operator and the uh, the new Ace Ventura operator. Yeah. So let's uh, let's introduce something else. 
I don't, I don't know what I would go for the arrow one, but yeah, it, this, the syntax is also the kind of depend on what team I'm on. Because if there's a strict policy of how they want to have it done, I, I'll do it in that way. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too hard on that. I can do whatever. Anything else? Let's have a. Quick I lost track of our questions a bit. <laughs> or that I, I do questions? have. I do have some something to mention, and it's a, it's a shameless plug for us. Uh, it's in, in our latest version of Rider and Resharper. Uh, we have a great feature about about name tuples. Um, and little question there: uh, do, do do you do you also use name tuples inside a single scope of the method? No, very no. rarely. You, you, same same for me. Usually, it's it's mostly that I use name tuples when it goes when it leaves the scope. Yeah. And it's called somewhere else, and otherwise, uh, yeah, just just either use deconstruction or or uh, something else. Yeah. Uh, but what I wanted to mention here is that name tuples uh, can now be renamed uh, in yeah. in Rider and Reshopper. So that that was pretty a pretty cool introduction, I think, because otherwise, um, if you try to rename one, then usually all the declarations where it uh, originates from. Uh, will, will remain the same because they are not um, semantically uh, coupled to each other. So you would end up having different names uh, from, let's say, the method you call it and uh, how you use it in your own uh, in your own method. And that's that's pretty cool. Um, one thing you can add to Writer is is uh, copy paste with formatting into Visual to into PowerPoint. Because I all of my slides are actually written, all the code is written in PowerPoint, and I've color coded everything to correspond to my theme in Visual Studio. <laughs> I, actually, I actually think there's a there's a plugin to do that. Oh, there is. Because uh, <laughs> it, it was it was kind of a pain, I can tell you. It's not as simple as it sounds. I can imagine. Yeah, there, I know there there's a plugin, and I, I even believe in some cases the that writer should do that manually, or at okay. least for you, so you don't have to do it manually. I might have to have a look at Rider. I'm, I must admit, I use VS Code mostly today, uh, but Rider might be an option. Cool. All right. Do we have any more questions coming in? Ah, maybe one more around default interface methods. It's probably more uh, theoretical or conceptual, um, but why would you not use an abstract class instead of uh, default interface methods? Uh, well, once again, it comes back to kind of a fallback scenario in my case. Uh, if I have decided to do, I, it's, it generally comes out that you already have an interface and you add something new to it in, in a lot of cases. And then you've already made the choice of having your, your an interface instead of an abstract base class. Other than that, an abstract base class would do exactly the same thing for you. Uh, it, it, there's no difference whatsoever. It's just that people tend to lean towards interfaces more than abstract base classes in C Sharp nowadays um for different reasons uh so it, it can as i said it kind of depends if, if it's because you already have an interface then it makes sense to do it instead of changing that into an abstract base class if you start or start out from the beginning um then an abstract base class would probably do it for you as well uh but you do lose as matthias mentioned the idea of actually having almost like multiple inheritance by having features come in from different interfaces as well I have one more question. Crystal, do you know what your last name means in German? Smart. Oh, yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> I actually speak a bit of German. Uh, oh, that's I, 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 took, I took German in school, and the, the name is German uh, originally. Uh, traveled through Denmark, so my dad is Danish. Uh, and I've also had relatives live in Germany. So I, I know a little bit. Uh, but it probably, I should have been named something else. Uh, if, if you're. <laughs> In the old days, you would be named after a, a, a trait of yours or what you worked with or whatever. And if in that those days, I would not have been called that. Do Do you know the the scene? And I, for some reason, I always have to. It always reminds me of that the scene with Homer Simpson where he uh, dances in front of the fire and says he's smart. I haven't seen it. That, that that's that's because they in, in in that moment they also say I am so crook. Uh, but with, with a K at the end. So your way actually is the right way of, of writing it, uh, like like your last name. Uh, but yeah, always reminds me of that. 
<clears throat> and then I combine it because my Twitter nick, Zero Call, is sort of a combination of English and Swedish and means no clue. <laughs> so I, I sort of zero it out with last name smart, Twitter nick, no clue. Put me, puts me sort of in the middle, just average. That, that's pretty, that's mind blowing, actually. <laughs> It, it's very smart, yeah. <laughs> Except that nobody understands. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's maybe end with with one last question, and I think that's a very nice bridge to uh, to bring our next speaker on. Um, it, it's kind of a question slash uh, opinion, I guess. Um, but uh, the question was: Do you agree that basically most important features in C sharp six to nine um, have already existed in F sharp before? Um, and uh, uh, do you prefer C sharp or F sharp? And when do you actually think the two languages will just be exactly the same? Um, it's a good question, uh, and it's it's interesting because uh, yeah, it seems like it was more of an opinion than a question. Uh, I, I assume the person is an F sharp person. Uh, I've never written anything in F sharp. Uh, I I would counter it and say, haven't we seen all of the features in Lisp? Um, so I I think F sharp is just copying Lisp anyway. Um, We've seen most of this, but perfect honest, it feels like both F sharp and C sharp are just taking the best features of previous languages and, and kind of merging them together. Um, F sharp, I don't have a, a strong opinion. I I, it, it, I know it has some benefits. I'm just not a functional developer. Uh, C sharp has, has been what I've always done. Uh, and. I don't know, we have a hard time. We have some F-sharp developers at our office. We have a hard time to find clients that actually want to have F-sharp because as a consultancy, we normally write code and then drop it off or help other developers build it. And there are so few F-sharp projects in Sweden, to be perfectly honest, that we see. So um, haven't had time to look at it. Uh, but yeah, in the end, yes, C-sharp is becoming way more F-sharp-ish over time because we're taking a bunch of those features and making C-sharp way more functional. And F-sharp is picking up C-sharp features and making it more object-oriented. So I think in the end, yeah, we're probably going to end up with a merged version of it that supports both things. We'll need a new name for the language at that point. Probably, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris, for an amazing talk. Great questions thank and you. conversation. And let's maybe yeah, bring in our next speaker and ask them the same question as well. So uh, Chris, <laughs> see good. you next time. Thanks see again. You. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right, and let's bring in our next speaker, uh, Urs, uh, who is going to talk about F Sharp. So, um, as promised, we'll ask the question, but first, hi, Urs. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. So, I, I look not so nice today, but uh, it will go away. So, I'm fine. Thanks. It, it will work, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let, let's ask the same question to you since your talk will be about <laughs> F Sharp and F Sharp for C Sharp developers as well. So uh, do you think at some point both languages will be very, very close together or even the same? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> it's a simpler reason because there are statements in C Sharp. They are known in F Sharp and that's the main problem. So they will never be exactly the same. So cool. short answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a very short. I, I guess the rest of uh, of the question yeah, will be answered in your session. Yeah, exactly. But there are a lot of features that they steal from each other or from under, other programming languages. So it's good to steal the good things. Uh, I think the problem from my side is C sharp has quite a long history now, so twenty years, and uh, yeah, it, there is some legacy in it, in this uh, in the language. So. Probably that is a little bit of a problem with C Sharp nowadays, with all these new features. As Chris said, it adds a lot of complexity. And I don't like complexity in my programming language. But we will see that in my talk. All right, perfect. Then let's uh, let's get your screen on as well, remove ourselves from the stream, and give you the stage. Uh, really Thanks looking forward. Much. Good luck. Thanks. So. Uh, welcome to my talk about F Sharp and our experiences we made when adding F Sharp to our toolbox. So, a little bit about me and my team and my company. We're a very small company, 16 people, and we are a team of four developers. We build an attendance time tracking tool, and well, nowadays, 
Some will call us a DevOps team because we build the thing, we run it, we maintain it, uh, we, we get the bug reports, we have to fix it. So we do all of this with four developers and uh, the other 12, 12 employees of my company surround us and help us with uh, users and customers and stuff. So, but because we are only four developers, something is really, really important for us to have as simple as as simple code as possible, because simplicity means code is easy to read and understand, and with that comes that it's easy to refactor and to adapt. And I'm a C sharp developer for twenty years now, so I started with C sharp one, and when I come to C sharp from C plus plus, I felt ah oh, that's much simpler, and in the last two years, I became I had the same feeling about F sharp. Could F sharp help us to make our C sharp code even simpler? And of course, the talk today is only here because I think the answer is yes. So in 2020, I talked my team into doing an experiment and to rewrite a part of our system from C sharp to F sharp. It was our calendar module. And the idea was rewrite it in F sharp and then let's compare the code. It does exactly the same. One is written in C sharp, one is written in F sharp. And after I did that, it took me about a month to do it. It wasn't fully complete, but it was good enough to compare the two code bases and the whole team agreed yes, we should go with F-sharp from now on. And in 2021, we decided that all the new modules are written in F-sharp. We just write C-sharp when we add features, small features to the existing code that we already have in C-sharp. So, and the rest of the talk is the why. But I don't want to bash C-sharp because I have been programming in C-sharp for 20 years and it was mostly fun. And there are some topics where C sharp really shines. And well, I don't, I want to go through them very quickly. First, uh, C sharp tooling and the IDE support is just awesome. I don't know any other language that has such a good uh, tooling. Um, compile speed is really fast. So C sharp compiler is really fast. I would say the F sharp compiler is just fast. So it's not slow, but if you compare them directly, C sharp compiler speed is surely much speedier. But the F sharp compiler does a lot more for you, as you will see later on. Then debugging, debugging in F sharp is not as good as in C sharp, but if you do a lot of debugging, maybe you should start doing TDD, test driven development. When you do some low-level programming, yes, go with C sharp. If you have really high uh, performance needs, so you do a lot of async things with tasks and the weight, um, and you have really, really high performance needs, you should go with C sharp because the C sharp compiler optimizes these task state machines. Um, but I would say in a normal business applications, as the one that we build, the F sharp code is fast enough. When you do some WinForms or WPF programming, yes, go with C sharp. If you really like uh, OO heavy libraries, like for example, Entity Framework, you can use them from F sharp, but let's be honest, it's a pain. Or when you really, really like inheritance, um, probably C sharp is a better choice. You can do almost everything in F sharp, but yeah, it's not built around inheritance. So let's come back to F sharp. Uh, as I already said in the introduction, one big difference between C sharp and F sharp is that in F sharp, everything is an expression. There are no statements. Whereas in C sharp, most code is written with statements. So let's look at the statement here. A very simple example. 
and statements have some problems. This code had to, has the problem that first I need an initial value for the result, and it's actually never used, so it's just clutter. But I have to assign something, otherwise the code won't compile. Then we have this result equals 42. The problem here is I can't extract that from this uh, statement here. I can't extract the assignment. I can extract the 42 because that's an expression, but I can't extract this, uh, the whole statement and that hinders composability a lot. And finally, the 17 here, um, what happens if I forgot to forget to assign the 17? I probably have a bug because I return zero. We can rewrite that uh, in C-sharp into a, an expression with the ternary operator. And it's first, it's much smaller, but um, being small is not the most important thing. It's much more important that I don't have an initial value. This clut the clutter is away. I can extract the whole thing in one branch. I can extract the 42 because it's an expression and if I forget the 17, it won't compile, so it won't happen. Looking at the same code in F sharp, looks like this. It's quite the same. Um, so if then are not statements, it's an if then expression. And as you can see, I don't have to annotate the type of B because the compiler knows B must be a Boolean because it's used in the if condition. So. And you may wonder, what if I don't have any values? So in C sharp with statements, you just don't pass anything. Uh, if you have expressions, you always have to pass something to a function and the function always returns a value. So in F sharp, there is this unit value that symbolizes nothing. So this is uh, the compute tick function takes nothing and returns nothing. And as you have seen in the talk by Chris, you can discard a return value and you can do that with ignore. So the compiler in F-sharp uh, won't compile if you discard values without using the ignore, step, uh, the ignore expression here. So the benefit is that if you can't simply ignore return values, um, it helps reducing bugs. In our case, when we switched to async await, so there was a time where we didn't have async await, and when, when we introduced it, there, we had a lot of bugs because we didn't await the tasks. And if you are not in an async method, the compiler won't complain. And we had quite some defects because we didn't handle these return values. The other thing is that if everything is an expression, refactoring becomes simpler because I can just change the return type of a function and the compiler will check that everything is still okay. Then we heard it for Chris, there are records in C Sharp 9 now, but I don't like them. We use them in our code, but actually I don't like them. And the reason for this is that you can de define them in different ways. So these are two ways to define immutable records in C Sharp 9. Um, one looks like a constructor, the other like using properties. And the problem is when you want a value, you have to know in which way you defined the record so that um, you get the correct value and <laughs> I find that just confusing, um, unnecessarily confusing, I must say. In F sharp, you define a record like this. There are two ways how you can write them, but it's still the same thing. It's just, do you want, it to do you want to write it on a single line or not? If you write it on a single line, you have to add a semicolon between the fields. But there is only one way how to get a value. As you can see, for the small a, I don't have to say that it's a big A. If the compiler finds a record that with matching fields, it just takes the that type. OK, the next thing is equality. Uh, we, all, we heard from Chris that records support equality. 
that is true, more or less. Let's look at this example here. You have a data record with a name and an array of values, and you have a compute method. Uh, we get twice the same value, so A and B contain the same values, and we compare them. Unfortunately, this returns in false because the array is compared by reference and not by sequence equality out of the box. You can change that. You can overwrite the equals of this data record, but out of the box, it's not the same. Same code in F sharp. If a data record, you have the compute function, and A will be equal to B. So it, as long as you stay in the F sharp type system, you have full deep equality. That's really nice and helps to reduce defects because equality checks can be very hidden in your code. For example, if you like to use link queue, in link queue you have contains, group by, union, distincts, then you have dictionary lookups, you have contains key on a dictionary, for example, all these things use equality behind the scenes. So if you use a record with arrays in it, they probably will fail. And I think that's a, a big, big trap with records in C Sharp because you get used to, oh, they implement equality. Then you add a reference field, a field with a reference type, and it will fail. I don't like such surprises. Then we have this or that types. So something is something or something else, but not a third option. For example, we have a temperature. So a temperature is either Celsius or it's Fahrenheit. So I decided to use double for Celsius and int for Fahrenheit just um, to have two different types. So both records implement an interface. Yeah, that's probably the way I would go in C-sharp nowadays. In F-sharp, I would go a different route. I would use a so-called discriminated union that says the temperature is either Celsius or it's Fahrenheit. Now, I can use pattern matching. I can use the switch expression that Chris has already shown us in the last uh, slot. And it can say, well, I'm a person that really likes warm weather. So for me, warm means it's above 25 degrees Celsius or above 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Otherwise, it's not warm. The same in F-sharp. I use uh, pattern matching as well. It's In F-sharp, it's called match. It's just the same code. It's equally good or bad. So just the same code. But if you do something like this, give me the measure of the temperature. So we'd say, if you have Celsius, return Celsius. If you have Fahrenheit, return Fahrenheit. And then I have to add, otherwise, yeah, I don't know. Maybe let's throw an exception or return empty string. I don't know. But I have to handle this third case in C Sharp because when I use interfaces, it's an open type hierarchy, so I can add additional temperatures. So that can be a benefit or it can be a disadvantage. In F sharp, because the compiler knows temperature is either Celsius or Fahrenheit, there is no third option. Uh, I don't have to add this third case. And when in the future I will add a third option, the compiler would warn me that this match expression here is not complete. So it won't compile when I say, say treat warnings errors. On the C-sharp side, yeah, the compiler will be happy because there is this otherwise case. Uh, so I have to use some shift F12, find all usages to find all the switch Mat, uh, pattern matching switches to correct my code. So there are a lot of potential bugs. But maybe you say, yeah, but using switch expressions on types isn't OO, and you are absolutely right. 
in an OO style, this should be modeled that I temperature, the interface, provides a method get measure. And then every implementation should implement this uh, method. That's correct. That would be better OO design. But let's face the fact, nowadays, most developers, most C-sharp developers, and I count me in on that, uh, like using switch expressions because it's easier than real OO. Doing real good OO design is extremely hard. And one disadvantage is that OO means I hide state. And so every method that wants to operate on this state has to go on an interface. And these interfaces grow and grow and grow when the functionality in my system grows and grows. So I think OO nowadays doesn't really scale with a lot of features. So maybe that is the reason why a lot of C-sharp developers like to go with switch expressions. And then you have the problem um, that you have to find all the switch switches when you add new cases. It's just unneeded complexity in my opinion. And if you really like the pattern matching stuff that Chris talked about, um, you can do even more in F-sharp. There are so-called active patterns where you can define a so-called pattern um, when, it is, when it's warm, when it's cold. So what are the conditions that it's warm or it's cold? It's the upper path. And on the lower part, you can see how I can use this is warm or is cold in pattern matching. And this can help to reduce complexity in business logic a lot. There is a saying amongst the F-sharp folks that make illegal states unrepresentable. That means I use these discriminated unions that I can model my domain in a way that it's impossible to have an illegal state. And if illegal state is impossible, I don't have to handle it. So if I can't have a null, I don't have to handle null. If I don't have a third option for a temperature, I don't have to handle this third option. And that makes it much harder for defects to sneak in. The next thing is uh, I like to read text left to right, top to bottom, like, you, like I read text in a book, for example. And let's, again, let's look at a small code sample here. I have a customer with a name. I have a method get customer, and I just cheat here. For every ID you give me, I just return Charles. I can. I have a method to get the name of the customer. So it's just a very simple example here. And then I want to combine that together. So give me the name of a customer with an ID. <clears throat> One way to write that in C-sharp is to nest the method call. So give me the name of the customer with the ID. But that's hard to read. So what I do mostly in C-sharp is I introduce some local variable, customer. So let's first get the customer and then get the name of the customer. But the word customer appears here a lot. And I think it introduces a lot of clutter here. So it's not as short, short as I would like the code to be. Let's look at F sharp. So I have a customer record. I have a function to load the customer. And the function to get the name of the customer is just the same as on the C-sharp side. And in F-sharp, I have the so-called pipe operator. You probably know that from the command line. It's just put the result of the first as the argument of the second. So let's start with the ID. Give that ID to the load customer function. Give then the loaded customer to the get name of customer function. So it combines much easier than the C-sharp code. I can add pipe and pipe and pipe as many as I want. It doesn't get visually much bigger. 
And if I use this combination of these two functions many, many times, I can even build a new function that consists of the combination of these two functions um, with the help of the function composition operator. But in our code, we use that maybe two times, so it's not that important. Pipes are very important. So with these pipes and this composition operator, it makes code really easily to be combined in F sharp. And the code just stays easier to read and easier to understand because there is less noise than in the C sharp code. So before I come to the bigger example, we need to cover some basics. Basics like asynchronous computing. So in C-sharp, you probably know there is the async keyword. You have, have a task. So you say, I return asynchronously, and the value I return is an integer. So of course, here the compiler would complain because there isn't a weight in this async method, but it's just for the example here. If I call this method, I should await it, and I probably should add the configure await false to prevent deadlocks. If I'm not sure in which context this code will be executed. Um, and the important is that the await looks like I extract the, the R is extracted from the return value. The asynchronous method returns a task of int, and only the int is assigned to R. So I can continue and do some compute on this R value. Uh, you probably say that's obvious, but we'll see why I said it uh, the way I did. In F sharp, I have an asynchronous uh, function, and I use the async keyword to say, hey, this is async. And this is called a computation expression. So there isn't only the async computation expressions. There are a lot of them, and you can even write your own. And that means that the, the signature of this function is it takes an int, and it returns an async of int. It's like on the C-sharp side, it takes an int and returns a task of int. Here, it returns an async of int. Async of int. So if I want to call that, I again use the async computation expression. And instead of awaiting, I use let bang. Let bang r is equal to asynchronous id. That means it's the same. You can think of it as the await. The let bang means that r is of type int, and it's the value of the async result. So I can use it to compute something additionally, like adding 17. Actually, behind the scenes, it's not like the await. But for you, if you come from C-sharp, think of it, let bang is like an await. So it's so-called computation expression magic happening here. And if you're in F-sharp and you really want to work with task and not async workflows, you can use the task computation expression from the library ply, for example. So just replace the async keyword with the task keyword, and these expressions will return tasks. Um, again, the compiler can't optimize these tasks as the C sharp compiler does, so they run a little bit slower. And the async computations have the expression uh, have the benefit that they are called. When in C sharp you start a task, it starts immediately. When you have in F sharp an async workflow, you say it when it should start. And that helps with composability. Then you have things like optional values. We have seen in the talk before there are a nullable reference type, or here I have a nullable value type. It says it either has a value or it hasn't. A simple example here. If the ID is even, return the value, otherwise return null. I could do the same in F sharp, and in F sharp, I would use the option type. So instead of having null, I would have none. So the option says either it's some value or it's none. It 
it's a discriminated union, as we have seen before. And the nice thing is, it's much easier to work with options than it is with nulls. We have seen all these null coalescing operators and null handling, and it's just simpler to work with options because um, you can, for example, use the option computation expression. You say call optional with the ID, and if we have a value, then let's continue. So this return R plus 17 is only executed if we have a value. If optional ID returns none, the option computation expression will stop and just return the none directly. It's kind of an early return. And sometimes we have a result that means we, we, have an, we execute an operation and it can succeed and it returns something or it ends in an error. Again, a very simplistic example here. If ID is even, we return the ID and we have no, no error, so we return null for the string, or we fail because it's an odd number and we don't have a real value. So that looks very complicated and that's the reason why we never do that in C sharp, but it's really easy in F sharp. So, so get result function, if id is even, then return OK with the value, otherwise return error. So result is always either OK or error. And again, I can use a computation expression to continue calculating stuff when, as long as we are on the OK path. When we enter into an error, we will early return. also can call the method and match on the return value. So yeah, okay, if it's okay, then it's value. If it's an error, then you have the string error here in this example. Uh, all this uh, computation expression I've shown you are from the library FS Toolkit error handling. So now we are ready for the big example about happy path coding. Uh, a small exercise for us is we have a customer with an optional name and the data with an amount. And as input, we get a customer ID and a data ID. The first step is to load the customer by its ID. And maybe we find the customer, maybe we find the customer, maybe it isn't there. Then we load the data. Again, it can be there or not. Then we get the name of the customer, if it has any get the amount of the data that is always there when there is a data. And at the end, we want to return a tuple containing the name and the amount. If anything goes wrong, we want to know that something went wrong. So on the left side, again, the C-sharp code, on the right side, the F-sharp code. So first, it defines some records. And I think that's probably the only slide where the C-sharp code is smaller than the F-sharp code. But again, that's not the main thing here. OK, then we load the customer. Uh, again, it's example code. We only find the customer if it's ID 42, then we return Charles. Otherwise, we return default. That means null. That means we didn't find the customer because it's a task of nullable customer. I do the same in F-sharp as I, I want to load the customer. And here I use the async result computation expression. That means this expression returns something that is both async and it's a result. It's the combination. And here I say, is the customer ID 42? If not, if that is false, then you have an error. We didn't find the customer. Otherwise, we can continue. So this do bang here means execute it. If you end in an, uh, in an error, we stop. Otherwise, we continue. So if it's 42, we can go to the return, return expression and return Charles, our customer. 
And if we have 42, we would directly end with the customer not found error. And to show you this, if I call it, I can match on the result. And here it's a li little bit tricky because uh, below there is only an ASIC computation expression. That means it's async. So the let bang will unwrap the result so that the custom result can be used in the match to see if it's OK or error. Please don't get confused by that. Then we load the data, and here, for the example, I just return the data. It's always there. Then I have a, a method or function to get the name of the customer. And it's an option value, so I just return that. Um, again, here, if I want to do some additional computing, I could use the option computation expression to get the name. And if there is a name, I can continue. You see, it's always the same pattern here. So now let's put all these things together in the get customer name and amount method. First, C-sharp, I load the customer. And if it returns null, I return null. So as you can see, the task is a task of a nullable tuple with name and amount. So null means it didn't, it ended in an error. Then I load the data again, I check for null. Otherwise, I continue, I get the name. If it's null, it's an error again. And if we get to the bottom of this method, then I know everything went well. I can return the name and the data amount as a tuple. So now the same in F sharp. I still have an async result, so it's something asynchronous that can be OK or not OK. I load the customer. And because I use the let bang, the customer will only be assigned if that is successful. If it's an error, the whole function will uh, immediately return. Yeah. So it's like a kind of an early return that's happening here in the error case. Then I load the data. I load, uh, I compute the name. So say, uh, get the name of the customer. And if it's none, we have the error customer has no name. If it has a value, I get the value into the variable. Actually, it's a value name. And then I can return the data. So and that's the most important slide in this presentation, because with this comparison of this code, I could convince my team that we should go with F sharp. Because in our code base, we have a lot of codes that looks exactly like this. Load some data. If it's successful, continue. And it just reads much, much easier on the right. Um, actually, we didn't write the code in C-sharp as the code on the left, because it's just too noisy. You can't read that anymore. So what happens? You go with exceptions. You say, oh, I just tried to load the customer. And if you can't find it, you just throw an exception. But that's the easy way out. It makes the code easier. But you never know, um, did it really work? Uh, do we really work with exceptions on the inside? So it's much, much harder to get the code correct. And using exceptions for cases that aren't exceptional actually is bad design. But it's the thing we did to keep our code readable in C-sharp. But again, in F sharp, there's a really nice solution. It's really clean, it's concise, it reads well, it also writes well. And at the end, to make the, uh, the example complete, is when you call this method or function, we can return, uh, we can re react on the result. Either it's a customer and an amount, or we ended up in an error. And as you can see, F sharp has now also string interpolation. And if you want, you can have typed string interpolation, something C sharp can't have, just as a side note. So to sum this segment up, computation expressions help us a lot to hide plumbing stuff, things like handling async, errors, and 
stuff like um, we can focus on the business logic. And I already said that, but you can write your own computation expressions if you have to. In our code, we just use the things that are there in F Sharp core libraries and in some additional libraries that I've shown on the slides. Yeah, it just simplifies reading, understanding, and writing code a lot. And I would say that's my main feature of Chef Shop that helps to write easy to maintain business applications. So we started with F Sharp in May last year. And in the next segment, I want to summarize the experience we had with F Sharp. Um, something that is important for me is uh, a common coding style, a coding convention in my team. Because when everybody writes the code more or less in the same way, it just gets easier to read code from other people. So a common code style helps, uh, <coughs> excuse me, makes reading code faster. And in C Sharp, we either use tools like StyleCop or the ReSharper, um, ReSharper to show us violations, but. <coughs> Normally, there is a lot of manual work involved. So a lot of hitting Alt-Enter to fix these things, or just say, hey, writer, please fix all this stuff for me. But uh, it doesn't feel that great, actually, for me. Uh, in f -Sharp, we have also tools called Phantomas. It's just fully automatic, and it layouts your code so that it matches all the coding styles you want. So it's not as mighty as the style cop thing, but it's much easier to use. Then something that is uh, discussed a lot with people talking about F Sharp or coming to F Sharp is that uh, in F Sharp, all the things have to be put in order. So in C Sharp, when you write classes and you have files and namespaces, you can order them as you want. Normally, they are just shown alphabetically in the Solution Explorer, but there is no order you have to follow. And one disadvantage of this is it's really, really easy to introduce cycles in C Sharp code. So namespaces or classes that reference each other in a cycle. And the bad thing about that is that cycles makes it really hard to refactor code. Because if you have a cycle, there is no beginning, there is no end. So where should I start? It, all Everything has to change at once. And therefore, in bigger systems, we always used some additional tooling to show us these cycles so we could split them. In F Sharp, you have strict ordering. So the files are strictly ordered. The content in a file is strictly ordered. <coughs> can only use the things that are defined above. So there's an implicit strict order. The order is explicit, actually. That means you can't have cycles in your code, so you don't need additional tooling. You can't have this negative effect. There is one exception if you have, for example, a recursive, uh, like a tree, a recursive structure like a tree, you can define uh, cycles in one file if the types are closely together. But normally, you just have no cycles. And that makes also code easier to understand, because if I read a function, I know all the things that this function can use are above. So at least I know the direction where I have to go and look for some stuff uh, that I need to understand to understand this function. Then you have type inference. Um, that means I don't have to write something there. It, the compiler just can know it uh, by parsing the rest of the code. And that means it's just less code I have to write. It's less code I have to read. And there is quite some type inference in C-sharp. Like when you use the var keyword, 
Uh, in C-Sharp 9, you have this new uh, variant where you don't have to write the type if the compiler can infer it. Then in link queue, there's a lot of type inference. And for example, also with the default keyword, it just look, it, gives, it returns the default value for your type. So if it's a reference type, it's null. If it's, for example, an int, you get zero. So, but the type is inferred. And if you like these things, you sh definitely should give F sharp a try because F sharp extends that to values function and to generics. So in the first generics for you, you don't have to write all this very, very long um, list of topple of something. So it, the compiler in first step for you, most of the times. Um, that also makes refactoring much easier because I can just change a type and yeah, the compiler will just propagate it through all the system and see if it still can compile. But there is a but to it. Sometimes type inference in F-sharp makes code really tricky to write because if the compiler infers something wrong, you get really strange error messages. So from time to time, I have to annotate some types to help the compiler to show me a better error message. To sum up, our experience of our last 12 months. So yeah, I'm no F-sharp expert. I'm developing F-sharp for 12 months. But the things we found out is that it's much easier for us to model our domain with the F-sharp type system than the C-sharp type system, mainly because there are discriminated units. So there is no third option. So we don't have to handle this third temperature as in the C-sharp case. And we found that it's much easier to focus on the intent of our code and not so much on the wiring with this computation expression. Like I called it the happy path coding. Just code the happy path, the uh, rest is handled behind the scenes. So to come to an end, it's these three points that uh, let me say uh, I prefer F-sharp to C-sharp is our business logic code is much easier to understand because of this computation expression, this happy path coding, the union types. Code is simpler to refactor because of type inference, the strict ordering, and again, the union types. And defects have a harder time to hide in our code because everything is an expression, there are no statements, and the really good type system of F sharp. So I'm at the end. If uh, you liked what I said, maybe you can go to my blog, Planet Geek. I blog about our journey from switching from C sharp to F sharp. So there is a lot of interrupt stuff in there because. 90% of our code base is still C sharp. So, and I write roughly half C sharp, half F sharp at the moment. So, I'll talk about the problems we find and our solutions. And if you won't like to play with the code samples in these presentations, they are, you can find them in a GitHub repository. So, that's it for now about F sharp. You're both muted. We are indeed. <laughs> That's, it's a difficult thing. We keep doing that. <laughs> but anyway, really great talk. Uh, I truly enjoyed Thank seeing both, both languages in comparison. Um, I think the, the chat has been on fire. Uh, I think some have seen their preference for their own language confirmed, uh, which is good, I guess. Uh, for me, I truly enjoyed seeing both and expanding my .NET language worldview, so to speak. <laughs> um, to your experience, if I would want to start with, uh, with F Sharp, do you have any tips on where to start learning, where, where I should go and, uh, and dive into this? Um, I have a blog post about that on my blog, how to start learning. There are some great books 
there are some great courses. Um, yeah, there's stuff there to start. Uh, and I probably would look for a mentor that you can show some code and the mentor can reflect on that code and give you some tips because at the beginning, it's hard to uh, let C sharp style a little bit go. So you have to find a, a different way to design your code. So we can design like in C sharp in F sharp, it works, the code will run, but uh, it probably gets a bit easier, simpler when you start to add more of the F sharp way. But at the beginning, that's hard and we I'm still learning. So, but yeah. Yeah, to, uh, to that effect, um, I mean, yes, we can go to your blog, of course. Um, so if, if I were to dive in, should I expect that everything that I'm used to will just work? Like um, imagine I'm using CSV helper, for example, in C-sharp to import CSVs in my application. Will I be able to use those libraries as well? Or um, is your experience that that's a bit harder or? The interop from F sharp to e -sharp, F sharp uh, from F sharp to C sharp is really great. Uh, the other way, it's not as good, but you can use most C sharp libraries. So actually, the most libraries we use are C sharp libraries. And um, there are some exceptions, like for example, Entity Framework, because Entity Framework uses a lot of inheritance, and then it you can do it, but it doesn't feel great. So, but F sharp understands C sharp very, very well. Um, yeah, I think the, C, uh, the team tries to make sure that F sharp understands uh, all the things C sharp knows. There are some exceptions like default interface implementations, I think, but normally you can just use the C sharp library. Um, we often introduce some wrapper functions to make the usage a little bit F sharp friendlier so that you can use pipes, but they are normally really, really simple. And, and things like records, does that all work out of the box or should you be more careful when using C sharp libraries that might have mutable states and, and things like that? Um, so, no, yeah, if you use uh, libraries that use OO patterns with stateful objects, yep. then you get, of course, stateful objects in F sharp. So, and you have mutability in F sharp as well. You try not to use it, but when it's there, you can use it. So, but yeah, if it's a library that's really in the OO sense, you have to be a little bit uh, careful, but you can use it. It's no problem. Cool. But sometimes you fool yourself, or you, you confuse yourself because why is this happening? Oh, it's because there is some mutable state in there. But yeah, F sharp knows about, about mutability now, no problem. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, an, another question that we saw go by on the chat, but I think you almost answered that uh, when I asked about NuGet and other libraries, um, was about mixing F sharp with C sharp. Is that easy? Is that hard? But I guess you um, covered most of that. Yeah, we our solution is a mix of about 30 uh, C sharp projects and five F sharp projects. Um, it's just you have to, an assembly is either C sharp or F sharp. You can't mix it in a single project, but you can. It's just .NET, so it's for an assembly. I just in, uh, have it depend onto another .NET assembly, so we can import it. It's the same, I think, with VB.NET. You can just import the VB.NET assembly in C sharp or F sharp. But of course, there are there are also some libraries that help with interop between C sharp and F sharp out there. And uh, yeah, we do that. It's uh, it works. It's it's not perfect sometimes because you have different designs, but it works really really well. Also, things like debugging, etc. If you no come problem, from, you yeah. debug through F sharp, C sharp code, ping pong. It's absolutely no problem. Cool. That's really really nice. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, one thing I think makes it easier to start with F sharp because you can just add it uh, to your existing code base as we did. You don't have to start from the green field to start with F sharp. I have one more question, or actually, it was more like a like a statement, and it would be interesting if you if 
you would say that that's that that we can agree on that, and that is uh, Ian Russell. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, might mean a few more lines of code, but that safety means that the number of tests required is reduced significantly. So, in other words, with with F Sharp, do you also think uh, test code becomes, let's say, reduced? Um, yes, no. So I would say you don't have to uh, have tests for things like nullability checks. Um, yeah, something the compi like that, yeah. the compiler gives you a lot of confidence, but we still write a lot of tests to test if it's the correct behavior. So you have no test for this little compatibility things, but for the behavior, you should still have tests. So uh, I, I, actually I actually remember I saw one uh, talk which was about behavior driven develop development. So mm -hmm. that, that's like a no, what was it? No property based testing. That also yeah, you can do that in C sharp and right? F sharp. So you can do this in both languages. But the, the most famous library is written in F sharp, FS yeah. check. Yeah. So, uh, but you can use that from C sharp. So there are a lot of F sharp libraries that you can use from C sharp as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say a little less tests, yes, but. Um, you still need tests. Cool. Yeah, I, I think a lot of questions are really about C sharp to F sharp comparison. So um, I, I guess we can keep going on on, uh, on that topic for a while. <laughs> yeah. I, I watched the talk from Chris and I kept track of all the ten cool features and I just ticked them off. That uh, okay, F sharp has nine of them since like forever, but so uh, it would be an unfair fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, think so, um, a, I would say just use the tool that works better. So we have some code that we would never rewrite in F sharp because it's really uh, close to a device, so it's easier to write it in C sharp. But I think especially for business logic and modeling uh, a business domain, F sharp has really its strengths. So there, there's one thing we can agree on: it's both are sharp, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you mentioned you ticked off nine of, out of ten uh, top items from Chris's previous talk. So, uh, what would be the tens, or are there any things from C sharp that you might be missing in F sharp? Um, yeah, it's the default interface implementations, but that goes against the, as I understand it, the F sharp way uh, to have that. But. Uh, Actually, that's not a feature I'm missing in F sharp because we don't have this hierarchies, inheritance hierarchies as much as we have them in C sharp, mainly because we have these discriminated unions for most of these cases. Um, I don't know, things I miss. Um, yeah, the tooling is not as good. So there are some open issues in the JetBrains uh, issue tracker about better tooling, support for F sharp. Um, but the tooling is getting better in C sharp. It's getting better in F sharp. Um, I think F sharp is uh, doesn't need as much tooling as the OO language needs. So the, you have less concepts. There is more reuse of the same concepts. Um, with, like with this async, uh, with this computation expression, it's always the same concept used in different contexts. Is it for asynchronous or for optional values? But the concept is always the same. So uh, I think in C sharp for every con for every new feature there is a no concept like this null coalescing operators. And so it, it's I would say it's the simpler language. So I had one slide in the presentation that I hit uh, showed number of keywords in both languages. So I tried to count them in C sharp. I I ended by one hundred and ten, and I'm sure that they were. That uh, that's not the whole number, and it was uh, I think ninety seven in F sharp. So, <laughs> so just as a, a random metric. Did, did, yeah, did you also that, count the the hidden keywords? Like there are a couple which are not really pr promoted. Uh, I don't know. It's just uh, official Microsoft documentation. Okay, I just yeah, counted yeah. the keywords there. So. But it's like Chris said, it uh, C sharp gets co more complex and more complex and more complex with every version. 
And if that's something that doesn't happen as much to F sharp, I think. All right. Um, let's maybe switch from pure language to maybe ecosystem. It's all .NET, of course, but um, I guess F sharp also has a little bit of its own ecosystem around certain libraries and so on. So, uh, what do you use in Time Rocket for UI, database access, and, and all of those things? Um, so, F sharp is, we just use it for backend. There are, you can build a web clients with um, F sharp, with uh, the safe stack, for example. The, but I don't know that, so I can't say anything about this. I just know it's possible. We just use it on the back end. And uh, yeah, there are some typical F sharp libraries, but actually don't use that many. So uh, I once tried to list them. It was about seven or eight real F sharp libraries that we use mainly for testing, um, like this FS check or uh, uh, un just a unit test extension library. Um, but uh, it's mostly C-sharp libraries that we use. So we run on AS ASP.NET, so we use all the NUCA package from there. Um, we use Poly. Um, it's just actually just the most things are just the same in C-sharp and F-sharp. So that's nice when you start to learn F sharp, you actually know the ecosystem. You just can't just use what you always have used. And maybe you find uh, a library that's just a little bit F sharp friendlier, but uh, just stay with what is working. So we also use Dapper, the same Dapper we use from C sharp. So that's, uh, you don't have to learn a whole ecosystem when you go from C sharp to F sharp. Yeah, that's pretty nice because um, I, I know I've been doing a lot of Kotlin in the in the past two years next to doing C sharp, um, but there it's learning learning a new language, but also learning a new ecosystem because yeah. then you go from .NET to JVM and you need Gradle and you need all of the supporting libraries there. So as as I hear, switching to F sharp or starting <laughs> to work with F sharp is much easier in terms of uh, jumping over. Yeah, I would say that learning the ecosystem is much harder than learning a language. That, that's true. Uh, do you do you have any experience with other uh, functional programming languages? Um, not really. I learned ML. Uh, it's meta language, not machine learning, uh, yeah. at university. But no. So uh, I've seen some Haskell examples, but. I can't write Haskell, no way. So now uh, F sharp is the only, I would say it's the only functional, yeah. functional like language. So I'm, I'm not sure that F sharp is a, F sharp is not a truly functional language. It's a hybrid language like C sharp. So it's just, uh, they call it uh, functional first. So it, it's easier to do it in a functional way than in an OO way. Also, what's interesting, uh, have, have you, uh, one of you have heard about the seven programming languages in seven weeks book? I, yeah. I do remember I read like to the, to the second language and started with Erlang and it's pretty interesting actually because they point out the different uh, strengths of each language. Mm -hmm. uh, which also leads me to the fact that it was interesting. I met uh, Matt Stolzen once, and th those language designers they have the regular meetings, and they they are pretty friendly to each other. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's just a just a fun thing yeah. that, that mm -hmm. they have their uh, meetings together. And and yeah, at the end, it's just a tool. So use right. the correct tool for the uh, right problem. Yeah. So there's there should be no. Uh, uh, how it's called? We should just we should just be friends so, and use whatever uh, is best for our job to do. So yeah, we're exactly. still writing a lot of C sharp code, so yeah. no problem there. All right, let's have a look at the chats. Um, lots of opinions still going on there. Um, not a lot of questions coming in. Maybe one of the the latest questions that just came in. Uh, was about um, units of measure, uh, whether that has been useful to access to to have access to in F sharp. 
It's just an, uh, an additional tool that you have in F sharp to use measures. You can say it's uh, something is kilometer and you can uh, say something is Newton and then you have the type system that makes it easy for you to convert these uh, measures into one another. But uh, we don't, we don't, uh, we actually use one and it's a, it's a currency, but uh, yeah, it's there, but we don't use it yeah. really. But do you actually see a lot of people using it in, in different mm, projects and? No, but I don't see so many F sharp projects either. <laughs> so, uh, in my past, as it was all C sharp, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that, probably should ask that an F sharp consultant. Yeah. That's maybe a good, a good question. Uh, I think Chris also mentioned that um, that there were fewer uh, F sharp projects in Sweden. Uh, I guess you could also turn that around and uh, make it a business question. Like if you jump to F sharp and you start using F sharp. Uh, is it, is it hard to find and attract F sharp developers or do you hire C sharp developers and, and reskill them to, to using F sharp as well? I would say it's quite easy to um, get a C sharp developer to learn F sharp. That's maybe a month to, to get going, not to be perfect, but to get yeah. going, that's enough because the ecosystem is the same. Um, I would say if you, have a F sharp job opening, you really get the people that are interested in doing it. So it's like a filter, but uh, it's the same here in Switzerland. Not many companies use F sharp, but um, let's be honest, uh, in what is in three years? What is the programming language in three years? Even if it's F sharp, you have to learn uh, the, diff the delta from now to then. So it's all about learning. So we ha should have a, a a company that helps the developers to learn new stuff. If it's uh, from C sharp to F sharp or the latest Azure services or whatever. So things change quickly in our profession. So we should have uh, an environment that allows us to learn quickly. And then say the programming language is really not the problem. I have one more question. <clears throat> well, what, what build system are you are you using? Because that's interesting, right? Fake kind of kind of started. Um, bringing... we, are really, <laughs> we are really boring. Uh, it's just MS build. <laughs> just MS build. Okay, that's a that's choice two. Back to XML. <laughs> yeah, there's not much in there, so we just compile and we as a .NET test to test around the tests. That's it's a really simple system from that point. So we don't have a lot of tasks to do. Of course, you have a, a little bit more complexity in the pipeline of the CI system. But uh, actually, I always think that's a lot of over complexity with these build tools. So I just have to build, I have to run the tests, and it's fine. We don't have additional uh, tasks oh, yeah. in here. Yeah, I, I I didn't want to mis mislead the discussion. I was actually expecting you might say fake, yeah, yeah. Uh, be, because I think at that moment also uh, they did a pretty good job because it was uh, probably the uh, first more modern uh, automation system in in .NET space, and I think a lot of people also got interested into uh, F Sharp because of that, and I think that was that was mm -hmm. something really great. Yes, the nice thing about F Sharp is you can use it as a scripting language, and uh, it's really easy to go. It's just the same, but um, we never used Fake. So we even in the C Sharp times, we used all this uh, C Sharp build uh, tools, and at the end we came back to MS Build because if there is a new version of .NET, MS Build supports it, so you don't have to wait for the library and um, we simply don't do as much fancy stuff. So I think it's a little bit different for library builders. The library where you have multiple versions, you have to build it for all the target systems and all this stuff. Um, that's a little bit uh, more complicated, but with the .NET Core stuff that came with the multiple targets and so, it's, I think even there, 
uh, I don't see the, the the big benefit of introducing a new technology uh, when you can just add a build task. So yeah, so we really like it simple. So if we don't really need technology, we try to keep it away. So not to overwhelm our four brains in our team. I think that's a, that's a good approach of doing it. Um, <clears throat> one more question came in actually about mm -hmm. uh, type providers. Um, I think you mentioned that you're using Dapper to do database access, but I also know that there's, correct me if I'm wrong, this, uh, this concept of having type providers where you kind of can extend the uh, code completion and things like that with, uh, for example, a model coming from JSON or XML. Um, have you been using that in the backend? And uh, has that actually been useful uh, to start using? Um, I, In our production code, we don't use type providers. Um, one thing is that with the switch to .NET Core, type providers weren't really supported as far as I know. I might be, might be wrong here. And uh, we already use Dapper in our C Sharp code. So it was Depper is easy to use. It's really fast. So we just kept Depper. So some stability there. And, uh, and one thing with type providers is so you always have to compile them against uh, the database. And the way we handle database changes and migrations just doesn't go really well with type providers. But I use type providers for things like uh, C. Uh, CSV files or getting data from an API, say, okay, this is a sample set of data. The type provider creates all the types and all the properties on the records for you. And you have a fully IntelliSense a navigatable data construct uh, to you. So that's really, really nice. So for playing around with some data, writing from co some code for it, that's that's really great, yeah. I think so, in C Sharp, a lot of people start now writing source generators to do the same. So, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've seen many people starting to do that for JSON, for CSV, for, I even saw a source generator that was using Excel files to generate some types and so on. So that's uh, yeah, in it, the way to go. Uh, we are still waiting for our next speaker, so we can handle more questions if there's more questions. Yeah, I'm very sorry, because but it's F-sharp, so the session was shorter than the C-sharp session. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we can, we can probably also bring in our next host. Um, I guess we can continue the conversation a little bit, because uh, I know Matt's our host, and let's bring him in. Um, hey, Matt. Hi, everyone. Good session there. Thank you. Enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Don't squash my head. Or don't, don't squash no. my hair. You know, it's, it's... No, no, I, I wanted to say high five. Oh, high five. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, no, that was... <laughs> no, I can't do this. I don't have the spatial awareness. I'm sorry. It's just not going to work. Uh, too old and feeble, sadly. <laughs> You've got to rehearse those kinds of things. You can't just spring that on me you know, in the middle of a stream. It's, it's you know. It's it's how we roll. It's how we roll. <laughs> <Last Badly. laughs> but anyway, yeah, that was that was um, a really interesting session. Um, you know, F sharp is a very interesting language, and it does a whole bunch of things in a in a different way and makes you think in a different way, which is uh, always a good thing. Um, you know, even if you're not using it in in production, just to um, exercise uh, you doing these other things, there it gives you a, a different way of thinking of things and looking at things, which I think is uh, is very much worthwhile. Totally agree. Well, um, I guess we can probably wrap up and uh, and bring in the next speaker again. Urs, thank you very much for a really cool session. Uh, I learned Thanks. a lot, and I hope a lot of it was other my people. Pleasure. I hope a lot of people also did, and uh, and we'll look at other ecosystems and other languages and so on. Thanks again. Um, I'll kick you out of the session here, and mm -hmm. um, Matthias, I'll also uh, have to remove you. You will be back, I think, after the next session. Um, Kick me out. Yeah, perfect. See you in a bit. Um, I guess it's time for your lunch break and all of that. Enjoy. <laughs> Here we go, doing it in shifts again. It's um, got to keep the presenters fresh.
Yeah, exactly, exactly. But also we have to keep ourselves fresh and refreshed and uh, and all that. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's see if Martin is ready and let's bring him in, uh, our next speaker. And there we go. All right. Hey, man. Hello. Hi, How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm awesome. Thank you very much. It's a lovely sunny day for once in, in the United Kingdom today. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I had I had Sunday yesterday, uh, also in the United Kingdom. Uh, had Sunday yesterday. Fortunately, not in the middle of doing questions and answers. That would have been a, a, a bit messy. Um, but <laughs> yeah. still, yes. I was just going to say um, thank you very much for for stepping in as well. This was a, a change to uh, what we had originally planned, and you've uh, you, you joined us uh, very graciously uh, it, with very little notice. So uh, very much yeah. appreciate you coming along. Yeah, exactly. No so for people um, who are just new on the stream and didn't uh, didn't catch the announcement when we start the day today, uh, Martin is replacing one of our speakers who unfortunately had to cancel. On um, yeah, needed that. I think we contacted you yesterday evening about this. So thank you for jumping in. Yeah, I was also, in the, speak I was in the supermarket at the time when you uh, sent me the message. <laughs> and, uh, Drop everything. I was get like, back okay. Here. Jet brains need me at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. I better write a talk. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, because I, I, I'm really grateful for you jumping in, uh, but also we had to mangle or Americanize your uh, session title. So sorry for that, speaking about the UK and stuff. It's okay. That's no problem. But it's <laughs> it's how it goes. <laughs> so uh, what, what will you bring today? So I'm going to be talking about... Um, Kubernetes? Um, well, really, I'm talking about containers. So we're, we're talking about how we containerize .NET applications, the different options that are available to us. And then I'll show you how you would take that container or a, a container and deploy it to one of the many different container orchestrators out there in the world, um, which is one of those called Kubernetes. And I'll show you a little bit about how you would do that um, and, and how you would go about deploying that container so that you can start running web applications and APIs in the cloud. That sounds super cool. Um, here at yeah. JetBrains, we usually deploy to customers' machines because we ship them tooling that they can install and start working with. So seeing things on the internet, in the cloud, and things like that is definitely uh, yeah. worth to watch, I think. I mean, I, I think the cloud might catch on. So, yeah. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard talk about it occasionally. It's, well, um, you know, we're still... It's, we're still, it's still, you know, early days, but I think the cloud... A, a couple of small bit players. Good. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to get their toe into the, um, into the market. Um, I, well, I hear I, you work for one of the smaller ones, isn't that right? Yeah, one of, yeah, we are a smaller one of those uh, small ones. <laughs> uh, AWS, I work for, um, which is uh, a, a challenger in the cloud market. So yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be talking a little bit about um, the examples that I'll be showing will be uh, all AWS. But one of the reasons I chose Kubernetes rather than one of the other ways that you can run containers is because whatever your cloud platform it's going to be similar to how I show you in AWS. So if you want to do this in Azure, if you want to do this in GCP, if you want to do this in Oracle cloud infrastructure, if you want to do this in whatever IBM call their thing, I mean, anything which a hosted Kubernetes cluster, you'll be able to do the things I'm going to be showing you. So there's nothing really necessarily proprietary or AWS specific um, in most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Yeah, that sounds great. It's nice to get a sort of a, a good overview of, of how all these things can work. And it's the wonders of standards, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a, it, it's a, an open source, like uh, standards and open source, because it's, um, it's, it's not quite the same as, you know, the web standards and things like that, but it's, 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 then mm -hmm. it's getting a de facto standard. Yeah. De facto mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. So, yeah. It, and it's really good. And, uh, what I enjoy about it is the fact that if you learn a little bit about containers and, and you don't need to learn very much, all of a sudden it opens up a whole new way of deploying applications. And um, I learned uh, how to containerize an application about four years ago, and it's completely changed the way that I develop uh, and produce applications. So um, hopefully there will be people in the audience who aren't that familiar with containers or aren't that familiar with Kubernetes, and this session will give them a little bit of an insight into that and hopefully potentially speed up their development workflow, make their sites more reliable and fundamentally make it easier to manage so that you spend less time having to manage your sites or APIs. Sounds good. Let's, uh, let's maybe bring your screen on and, uh, and give you the stage. Okay, let's see if we can do this then. Um, I'm going to share a screen. 
Um, okay, select a screen. Um, let's try this one. <laughs> <laughs> Too Hopefully. many screens. Can you see this one? <laughs> it's, uh, is, is it the Amiga? Yeah, and that's what I'm going to yeah. be uh, presenting from my Amiga 500. So, all right, yeah. perfect. Is that Which Kickstart is... Kickstart 1.0 or 1.1? One, one? Uh, this, <laughs> I'm 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 not that up on my workbench uh, uh, version numbers to be honest with you. But, uh, it's whatever, it's whatever I'm I'm having it. flashbacks to my youth right now. This is a uh, this is good. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Then uh, let's let's give the stage to Martin and uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Um, I'm Martin Beebe, and uh, I um, I work as a developer advocate uh, at AWS. And today I'm going to be talking about um, containerizing .NET apps and deploying them to Kubernetes. I'm Martin Beebe. I'm at the Beebs on Twitter. If you're interested in following me there, um, I work at AWS as a developer advocate for .NET. So I show AWS to .NET developers. Um, when in normal times I'd be traveling around the world showing, you know different uh, meetups and uh, events, how to do stuff on AWS. Um, I've been a .NET developer for, um, gosh, too long, maybe, um, 20, about 20 odd years. And um, I, well, since the beginning, basically, of .NET. And um, I've been a professional developer since I was 16 years old. So um, that makes me, what, early 20s. Yeah, I'll do the maths on that one. Um, so. We're going to be talking about how you would take a .NET application and, and sort of deploy that to Kubernetes. But really, we're talking about creating containers so that we can deploy our applications to whatever container orchestrator they want. we want. And fundamentally, they all have different nuances and different ways of working. But there are different orchestrators. One's Kubernetes. There's, in AWS, we have another, another one called Elastic Container um, uh, ECS, Elastic Container Service. Um, but they work, they, they're different, obviously, they have different licensing, they have different costs, they have different, all those sorts of things. But fundamentally, it's dealing with containers and working with containers. And so lots of the things I talked to you today about containers will be relevant, not just for Kubernetes, but for any kind of container orchestrator, whether that be Kubernetes or ECS or whatever, whatever one uh, you want to use. Um, so I'm going to start today by telling you a little story about a gentleman called Guybrush. Um, Guybrush is a, a cloud consultant, and um, he's just arrived on uh, this island here to meet his new customer. And his new customer is uh, Grog Computing. Now, Grog Computing are a big, a big computing outfit. Uh, they've been, you know, have got a huge heritage in uh, developing software in Melee Island, which is where uh, Guybrush is. And uh, he goes to meet the, uh, the CEO, CTO, and VP engineering of Grog Computing. Now, they are the official technology provider for the Pirate Festival. Now, the Pirate Festival is a large-scale event that happens every year um, on Melly Island, uh, where all of the pirates get together, and they drink grog, they eat great food. And fundamentally, they, they vote on all the best pirate things. And uh, on Melly Island uh, uh, this year, um, Grog Computing have been given the responsibility of running that voting system. Um, and that voting system is a, an application that's written in .NET. Um, so the CTO explains that we provide a voting system for the Pirate Awards. But as many systems do, and, and you might have this yourself, is that you, you have systems which crash. You know, if you have a .NET system of any uh, any particular age, um, you might find, you know, it might not be the most reliable or there might be problems with it. We used to have uh, an application in the company I worked for previously that it kind of every Thursday, we would just switch the servers off and on again, uh, like in circulation, we'd have it load balanced, but we'd switch some of the servers on and off again because we were reaching like a memory limit. Limit. Now we could have gone in and fixed that memory limit, absolutely, but we found it easier or the, the, the IT team for whatever reason in operations decided it was just easier for them just to switch the computers off every Thursday. And you would be, wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't be surprised um, how common that is, how common it is that, um, Customers that I speak to, they'll have something which has been built like 20 years ago. They don't quite know exactly how it works or, you know, what it, what it's, what really is behind that black box, inside that black box. Um, and they will 
uh, you know, just recycle that machine every Thursday because perhaps it's got a memory buildup. There's a there's a memory leak in the application. It gradually builds up. If you leave it for two weeks, it will eventually crash on its own. So it's better to do it in a responsible way. Every Thursday, we'll re recycle it. So this is the kind of application these guys have got. They've got an application which is a little bit legacy. Um, people don't fully understand how it works, maybe in the development team. Um, they just know this thing where every so often it will crash for, for no particular reason. They don't really want to have to go and rewrite it because it kind of works. And they're using it infrequently in this instance because they're only ever using it really for the pirate festival. And so they don't want to have to rewrite it every year. And but the problem is, you know, the CEO is saying, well, if this voting system is unreliable under scale and every year the pirate festival gets bigger and bigger, we're going to eventually get to a point where we lose our, con our contract for, for future pirate festivals. So from a business point of view, we need this application to be running and, 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 and reliable, but we don't really want to put a ton of engineering effort into making it necessarily more reliable. So the VP engineering says, look, we need to make it the system easier to scale and just more reliable. Now that could result in, in a, in a, um, in a rewrite, but but our cloud consultants having a think about, you know, how's this application set up? So he asks, look, where is the data center and what, what are you running this application on? How's it running? And so the uh, the the board say, well, the data center is just through that door. So Guybrush goes through the door and sees that this is the data center which is running the infrastructure for the Pirate Festival. It's a single server um, running in uh, a data center, not the greatest data center uh, on-prem, and uh, it's being, uh, it's very much loved by the engineer, which is, which is, uh, you know, stroking that keyboard there. He's very happy with this system and, and, and he keeps it running and he keeps it ticking over. But to be honest with you, it's not the best, uh, best infrastructure in the world. And so Guybrush has a think and says, look, I've got three things that I think we could do with your application just to make it a little bit more reliable and, uh, and easier to manage. So firstly, we're going to containerize your application. We're going to take your application as it is without very many code changes. We're going to put it into a container. Second, we're going to move your containers to the cloud, um, get it out of this uh, the data center and put it somewhere where they, there is an opportunity to expand and scale across multiple uh, machines, instances, um, and take some of the benefits of, of that cloud. And then hopefully we're going to then enjoy the reliability that that provides. Without making any changes to the application, we're just going to change the way we operate it and therefore improve it. Now, this is a story and the reality is, you know, often you will have to re-engineer applications to when you containerize them. But the idea is that you could containerize anything, whether that be a .NET framework application from many, many moons ago, which only runs on Windows. You can use Windows Docker containers and containerize a Windows-based .NET web forms application. Um, all the way up to sort of modern times when you can take a .NET uh, 5 application or a .NET Core 3.1 application, you can containerize that as well. In reality, it's much easier to containerize a more modern system than it is an older one. But there are ways and means to containerize any kind of application. And on AWS, you can run those containers, whether they be containers running Windows, uh, Docker for Windows containers, or when, whether that be Linux-based containers uh, running .NET Core or .NET 5. So there are lots of ways that you can containerize your applications. And Guybrush here has got a three-step three step strategy that he's selling to this customer to say that this is how we're going to do, do it. So they say, oh, great, this sounds good. Why don't you go and meet the dev team and we'll figure out how we start on step one of containerizing our app. So Guy goes and meets the dev team. This is the dev team behind the Pirate Festival voting system. Um, and... Uh, you know, asks them a little bit about the system. What kind of system have we got? Where's the databases? How are things stored? How things do things work? And the lead dev, uh, she says, we have an ASP.NET app that's older than me. What can we do? How can we how can we modernize this? How can we take it to the next uh, level and make it more reliable? And so inside of um, uh, inside their application, their applications basically, it's actually has been quite modernized. It's running um, a .NET Core application just for simplicity in this example. But um, they're going to take this application, and the first step is really just to make it a Docker application. Like, how do we take a regular .NET application and containerize it? So we go over to Rider, look at the project, and we right-click the project and we click Add, and then there's this option saying Docker support. Now that's going to say, what do we want to target the operating system? What we're going to run this on? We're going to choose Linux and we're going to click OK. 
It's going to add two files, a Docker ignore file and Docker file to uh, GitHub. And it's going to add this Docker file and Docker ignore file to our project. Now, this is a Docker file. It's a multi-stage Docker file, which Rider has added to our project automatically. Um, now, if you're not familiar with Docker, don't worry. It's, it's actually really straightforward what Docker does. And we don't really need to get into the, the, the nitty gritty of how it works and why it works and, and things. What you should know is this is basically a, a file which can sit in the root of your project and Docker can take that file and then it understands how to take the files inside of your application and containerize them. And what it's going to be doing, if you see these statements where it says from, so on line one from mcr.microsoft.com forward slash .net asp.net 5, that is a base image. So it's going to take that base image, um, the ASP.NET 5 um, uh, SDK uh, base image, and it's going to use that SDK, uh, that base image, to um, start to um, produce builds. So in a Docker file, you'll see every place where it has a from statement, that's a new container. So it takes what it it takes the container, it does some work with it. And then it gets a new container, it generates a new base container, it does some work with it, then it generates a new base container. Now, a base container is basically just like a, a lip. I, I think of it in my head, I, I can, can, see, can think of it as a, like a little virtual machine. And that, that kind of virtual machine is the operating system and all the files in it. Now, these images, so anything which is in this from statement, this is an image, uh, a container image. Um, we call it a base image, a base container image. We're basically taking that base image and then we're adding stuff to that base image. In some, uh, a few years ago, a Docker file would have just been one, it would have had one base image and then there would have been lots of commands. We've now got the ability in Docker to have this thing called a multi-stage build, which is having multiple base images throughout the Docker file. And so um, you'll see that um, in different places, it's taking you know, on line one there, we're taking from the ASP.NET 5 uh, base image. And then on line six, we're taking from the uh, SDK image. Now, the reason why we're using an SDK image here is because we're going to do a build. So we actually do a build when we create our, um, when we're creating our container image and it does a .NET restore. It copies the files into a working directory and then it runs .NET build on the project and it releases it to an output folder called app build. And then we work with built that application. We can go and do uh, do more with it. So we've got here, um, the final image is basically instead of using, um, instead of using the SDK base image, we're going to take it from the base image, which is this one, and it will be the, just the runtime inside of a container. Now, the reason we're doing that, and the reason why we have different container bases is because when we're doing at the build stage of our container, we need all of the SDK tools. We need to be able to compile an application and build it. But when we actually want to publish our container, we want our container to be as small as possible. So we don't really want it to contain all the SDK uh, bits and gubbins. So um, we, we do the build, we get out the output, the DLLs effectively, we throw away the base container, and then we bring back in uh, an ASP.NET uh, 5 um, image as our base container. And that's just like just the runtime. So with a multi-stage build, we, we build, take the image, which has all the SDK stuff in it. Then once we've done our build, we throw all that away, really. We keep all of our build assets, and then we put it into a new container, which has a base image of um, the lowest common denominator. In this instance, it's, it's an, a base image of ASP.NET 5. But it could be, um, you could go as far back, instead of doing that, you could pull just an Nginx container and and uh, and run it inside of that. So basically, this 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 file describes how we build our container, um, all the different layers in our container. And we end up with this container image, which contains our built application, which we can then take that image and we can deploy it to services. So I could take this application, I could go and deploy it to um, Kubernetes or ECS or, or something. Now, there is one uh, other way. Now, I've done this inside of Rider where it's generated me a, a Docker file. And then I'd be running some Docker commands to go and actually build, um, build that Docker image. We also have at AWS, we recognize that some applications um, you might not have the source code. You might not have the. Um, you might not have everything that you need. You just have the application, 
maybe running on IIS or something like that. So we've developed this tool called app to container, which takes that app running in IIS or running somewhere, and it can take that and convert that into a container. So wherever your application is at the moment, whether it's if you've got the source code and it's running .NET um, core, or if it's an older web forms application running IIS, you can basically point something like AWS app to container at the IIS um, um, uh, application and then generate a container from that. So there's multiple ways to create a container. I've shown you the developer sort of workflow of generating a Docker file, and then you do some command line tools to generate the image, basically run a thing called Docker build. Um, or you can use a tool like AWS app to container, take your existing application, put it into a container. And then once you have it in a container, then you need to do, go and put it somewhere. So there are many places where you can store containers. One is called Docker Hub, you probably hear about that. It's the sort of standard default place that you put um, container images. Um, we also have a thing called the Amazon Elastic Container Registry. Uh, there are two flavors of um, ECR, which is how it's uh, called, often called, ECR, Amazon Elastic Container Registry. We have the private version, which is called just Amazon ECR. And then we have the public uh, version, which is called Amazon ECR Public. Now, the difference being is the ECR, Amazon ECR is private, and that would be great for container images that you don't want to be shared on the public internet. You don't ever want to share with them outside anyone outside your organization. You want them to be private uh, and only be available to your organization, to people which you expressly give permission to access those containers. Um, ECR public is for when you want that container and you want to publish it you know, to the to the greater world. And, and lots of customers and companies want to do this. At AWS, for example, we, be, we build container images um, for things like um, um, base images for builds. Um, we have public uh, container images for uh, Lambda um, execution environments inside of a Docker container. Um, Microsoft, you've seen there before, um, they uh, are basically storing publicly the base images for ASP.NET and, and all the various other things. So there's lots of reasons why you might want to make a container image public. Um, so you get to choose, well, where do you want to put this container image? Do we want to put it into ECR, Docker Hub, or ECR Public, or, or wherever? But ultimately, you'll have to choose where you want to go and um, put that. Now, the sort of terminology is when you've got a when you've got a, a Docker image and you want to put it somewhere in, inside of a registry, it's basically pushing it to a registry. So we push it to a registry. It then stores it in the registry. And then what we can do is our um, our container orchestrators or our, the services running our containers will pull the containers down from these registries and then run them uh, for you uh, as applications. So um, ECR, um, we, we're obviously at the JetBrains day today. So um, we have a tool inside of Rider called AWS Explorer. It's a, like an add-on, a plugin. Sorry, um, we can add that plugin to um, to uh, Rider. It gives us a lot of functionality. One of the things it allows us to do is is explore ECR. So you'll see in the AWS Explorer, you'll see this little uh, thing here. It says ECR. I've got a container registry already created called Grog and Dash, which is um, uh, where we I'm going to store. Uh, it's my repository where I'm going to store my container images. This is built inside of ECR, uh, Amazon ECR. So it's not public. This is a container just for my organization. Um, it's not going to be used publicly by anyone. Um, so I need to take my local image, the, the local project that I've got, and somehow get it into ECR. Um, this is what I just showed you what the what ECR looks like from inside Rider. And you can create those ECR repositories from inside Rider. Um, but there's also a console. So the website, the AWS website, if we go to Amazon Container Services, there's a section called Amazon ECR. You can create repositories. You can add images. You can um, create permissions, do all the things that you might want to do. So this is my repository uh, in ECR called Grog and Dash. And if I wanted to push a container image to this repository, um, I would, there's a little button here saying view push commands. If I click on that, it explains to me how I take a local image and how I push it to ECR. Now, um, I've taken those, those basically those, those lines of code and I've just put them into a slide, make it a little bit bigger and a little bit more green so you can read it. 
Now, the first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to log in to your repository. So um, you'll need, uh, now this will vary depending on what you're using. If you're using Docker Hub, then you can just, you'll be able to do a Docker push to your Docker Hub account. But any private repository is going to have some way that you need to log in so that you can store and maybe even retrieve your um, your, your container images. So this is how you do it in AWS. It's going to be different for different providers. Um, I use the AWS command CLI, the AWS command line interface or CLI. And it, we have a command called AWS and then ECR. And it says get login password. And it goes and gets uh, the password for our ECR, um, our ECR repository. The commands to do this are listed on that website. So this is just me repeating it here, but this would basically um, then retrieve the password and you can see there's a pipe uh, over here. There's a little pipe um, uh, and then it adds another command, which is Docker login. And it takes the username and password it got from um, the first command and it pipes it into that command. So then it does a Docker login and that Docker login will log me into my repository. So now anytime I do a Docker push, I'm interacting with my private repository for my containers and not the public one, not Docker Hub. So then inside of my um, project where the Docker file resides, so in my instance, it's just the root of the root folder. There's this Docker file, which Rider added to my project. I can then just run Docker build tag or dash T grog and dash. And then you've got to put a dot, which basically means it's uh, in this project, in this folder. Right? So run it inside of this folder, basically take the files from this folder. So Docker build and build the image and tag it grog and dash in this folder. Um, it will then go and um, build using Docker. You'll obviously need the Docker, uh, Docker installed on the machine that you're running this in. Now I'm gonna be doing this, um, I'm doing this at the moment like on my local machine, but in reality, you'd probably have like a CI CD pipeline which did this. So it would do a, it would take the, the source control when it's checked in, it would do a Docker build, it would push the container images over to um, your, your container registry. And in a lot of companies that I go to, they have that completely automated. So someone will check the code in to, um, to let's say GitHub, and then that will fire off a build, um, a GitHub action, that GitHub action will go and build the container image, and then it will push it to AWS ECR. Um, or, or Kubernetes or wherever it needs to go push it. So basically all the developers will need to do is maintain their standard way of building their, uh, of, of checking in source control. And then the CI CD pipeline will actually do the Docker build, will publish it to ECR or publish it to Docker hub and then deploy it ultimately to the Kubernetes service or whatever container orchestrator you're using. So run Docker build tag, uh, uh, grog and dash uh, dot, and it will run inside of that project and will create a container image and tag it grog and dash. We can then say, well, I'm going to take that image. And I'm going to tag it again. So I'm going to call it something else. Now, this is important because this is how we kind of, um, this is how we uh, line up our local images with the things in the, in our, in our repository in the cloud. So I'm going to tag it tag the grog and dash latest version, which is what I just built on that line before. I'm going to tag it with this quite long number, which is my account number dot DKR dot ECR EU one North Amazon dot com forward slash uh, grog and dash latest. So I'm basically retagging the same container image just with a new name. And then when I run this ne next command, Docker push and that container, it knows what repository to put that container into in my account. So Docker push, ordinary Docker push would push to Docker Hub, but because I've logged in to my ECR account, it's going to push it over to ECR, and then that container now resides inside of ECR. So what we've done, we have um, taken a .NET application, we've used um, Rider to generate a Docker file. We then built that Docker file using Docker build, and we've tagged it with the correct name for our repository and then we've pushed it to ECR. So now my application has been containerized in a kind of very simple way. Like I've not split anything out into microservices. I've not created multiple containers. We absolutely could do that. 
not done any of that. All I've done for the moment is just take my monolithic application and published it inside of a single container and published it to ECR. Also, if you're creating, just because this is the JetBrains day and uh, we've, we're talking about Rider a lot, um, if you're creating an ASP.NET Core application, there is a, uh, when you're doing a file new solution or file new project, um, there is a thing which says Docker support and you can add Docker support port and basically it will generate the Docker files for you um, when we start up. Now, the cool thing about Rider is it recognizes that you have Docker files inside of your application. And so if you want to then go and um, do th fancy thing, if you want to basically run that Docker image, there's a whole you know, an array of Docker support inside of Rider as well. So Rider understands Docker images. It can run Docker images. Um, it even has some quite cool tooling to, to do live debugging of um, containers inside of AWS as well. I know that you can do live debugging of um, the Elastic Container uh, service um, from within Rider as well. So it's quite cool what Rider can do with Docker images. But just to, to point out there, when you do a file, new, a file uh, sort of a, a new solution, you have that option to add Docker support in that um, new solution uh, window as well. Why? So why does this like why do why would a customer want to do this? Why would they even want to go and um, think about containerizing their application? Well, I'll try and explain it a little bit um, here. So we've got um, this is the application kind of before. I know I had that example of just one single computer, but the reality is most companies would probably have some form of load balancer for any kind of um, external website, which would load balance over a number of virtual machines. So this is quite a common uh, sort of architecture in an application, um, which I'll see in a customer where you have, you know, a, a load balancer, which load balances across three, so let's say three virtual machines. And uh, each virtual machine has a copy of the web application on it. And they have some kind of load balance balancing strategy, which round robins to the different virtual machines. And maybe the load balancer will monitor health of the virtual machines as well. And if one of the virtual machines becomes unhealthy, it will load balance to the other two virtual machines. This is um, a standard way of setting up an ASP.NET application. Um, one of the problems with this kind of setup though, is well, virtual machines are quite heavy, big things. So let's say we have a, an older application, which has some kind of memory leak or problem. And as um, users um, come online and they start using our application, you know, we're getting much more load going through to the virtual machines. And let's say one of the particular applications, it starts becoming problematic and we start using up our memory, gradually using up our memory and may get to a point where we have some kind of critical failure in the application because of memory pressure. So that uh, virtual machine here, that becomes broken. Now, in AWS or in lots of different cloud services, you can create systems which can auto scale virtual machines. So we might have a system where we automatically go and either replace that particular virtual machine uh, based upon a, a virtual machine image. Um, uh, we maybe restart the virtual machine. There might be some kind of automation. Hopefully there's some kind of automation which does restart of that virtual machine. The problem with a virtual machine though is let's say we're being really kind, virtual machine might take sort of five minutes to restart and get back into a position where it's able to accept, um, you know, accept uh, traffic again. So, if we've got this system where we've got three three virtual machines load balance, and one of our machines goes out of, of sync, that means it's going to be down for like five minutes, which means that the pressure is going to increase on these other two virtual machines. And what you could have then is a cascading failure. So, potentially the the issue which caused this issue might be present in these other virtual machines, and gradually the memory pressure becomes too much and all of the virtual machines are problematic. We've still got lots of load coming into our application and we're having trouble restarting the applications because it's every time it's coming in, it's, it's, it's overpowering the system. And this is like creating a, like reliability problems because we're not delivering at full capacity. And it's very common that these sorts of issues might occur. Now, let's have a look. Well, what happens in a, in a containerized application? Now, let's just say we've taken our application, we've containerized it, we've put it into a container. We've not done anything particularly fancy with it. It's just now sitting inside of a container for us. So we now have this thing called a cluster. Now, it doesn't matter if you're using Kubernetes or using ECS or whatever container orchestrator, they all have this concept of a cluster. 
Now, a cluster is made up of machines. It's made up of virtual machines um, uh, or instances, as we call them in AWS. And you might have just three. Uh, we might have three machines sitting in the background there, which actually make up this cluster. But when, um, when you say, okay, I want one container to be deployed. Okay, I want two containers to be deployed, let's say. Um, then the load balancer will um, balance the load between these containers, uh, which sit inside of this cluster. Now, the difference being is, uh, let's say uh, we get a particular strike, a like big um, spike in traffic. And maybe my autoscaler for my container orchestrator says, if I get more than, I don't know, 80 concurrent requests, add a new container. And so we gradually add more and more containers to our cluster to deal with the load. Now, let's just say we haven't made any modifications to our application at all, and it still has this problem where, for whatever reason, when enough people use it, it has some kind of memory leak and the, and, and the application crashes, crashes. Okay, so these containers start crashing because they're starting maybe taking, getting too much load. Well, the difference between with containers and with virtual machines is that I can add them we can add them because the orchestrator will see that these two have failed because maybe we've got health, a health monitoring, basically it monitors a URL or looks at port 80 and says that this is no longer responding. And so it will take those out of circulation and it will add two new fresh containers. Now you might be saying, well, it's the same as what happens in a virtual machine, but the difference being is these containers will start up in, we're talking like milliseconds, not minutes. So we can get back to the same level of, you know, of, of how many, however many containers we have in our cluster or add more at will to deal with our application. It doesn't matter that the containers keep crashing maybe after every five minutes, well, it does, but let's just, it matters, but it matters less for liability because the, the container orchestrator just keeps replacing the containers. It removes the unhealthy one and adds them. Now I'm not saying that's a, an ideal solution, but what I'm saying is the customer experience is different. We no longer have a system which um, is is failing or has cascading failures. We have a system which which is failing, but it's still managing to stay online and it's still managing to service our customers' needs. And fundamentally, it is more reliable. That's the key here: is that we're taking the same application, making no code changes, but we're able to make it a little bit more reliable um, in our applications. So that's cool. So we've got our container application containerized in, in its in ECR. Now we have to think about, well, how are we going to um, actually run this container? And to run that container, we're going to go, um, uh, I'm really sorry, someone just told me to uh, up my volume. I, I only just saw that and I know it was a while ago that they asked me, I'm gonna put it up anyway. I'm sorry that, um, if my, my, my microphone's a little bit low. Um, so this particular uh, user, sorry, the Guybrush is now thinking, well, how do I run this container? How do I make that container run? Uh, so Guybrush goes to his local AWS uh, uh, advocate. This is an example of an advocate and um, asks, well, how do I run this container in production? What should I do? And AWS have lots of ways that you can run a container in production. Um, I need to scale my Docker containers and there are fact, there's many ways that you can do that on AWS, but let's just use Kubernetes because it's an example of a, a good way of doing it. And whether or not you use AWS or not, you could take this knowledge and, and, and use it with different providers as well. So just to sort of highlight the, the two different ways that you could do things, there's, there's, a, there's a service called, and I've mentioned it before, Amazon ECS, and there's a service called Amazon EKS. Now, I mean, the difference being ECS was developed before EKS and it's, uh, you know, the way that we've been running containers in Amazon for a long time. We've got huge customers using ECS at massive scale. Um, customers which are, you know, doing all sorts of, um, building all sorts of um, interesting sort of things. Customers like like Netflix and, and, and various others who are doing interesting things with, with that. Um, but it is proprietary. It is ours, um, but it's very scalable. It's battle-hardened. It's extraordinarily reliable. Um, we also have Amazon EKS. EKS comes from, is basically a, a managed Kubernetes service. Kubernetes is open source, originally developed at Google. It, it works slightly different. Um, it works slightly different, um, but it's fundamentally the same sort of concept. 
And at Amazon, both these services can kind of run any kind of container. So you can run .NET Core on Linux containers. Um, we can run .NET Core on Windows, or we can run .NET Framework on Windows containers um, on both of these platforms. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that um, what I built, it looks like I've got, hold on one second. I've just got a child who's come to see me. Darling, I'm, uh, I'm, present I'm presenting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the kids have just finished school in the UK. So they just came to my office. They didn't realize I was presenting. Um, so e where was I? Yeah, so you've got Linux containers, uh, containers on Windows, and we've got um, uh, .NET Framework on Windows. Now, the re on AWS, we support Windows and Linux containers. We've built Linux containers up to this point, but you can build them for, for Windows as well. And what that means is basically, the infrastructure, the cluster that it runs on, on will be can be made up of either Linux servers or Windows servers. And um, for both ECS and EKS, we support both those as nodes. So you can have either Windows um, or Linux servers or a mixture of both. And so it means that you can run any kind of container. Now, that's not true for every provider. Um, we were the first to add Windows support for ECS, and we were the first to add Windows support for EKS. So if you want to run a .NET Web Forms application, and it, that has to be built for Docker for Windows because it only runs on Windows, then you can use either of these services and, and, and run those things. And we were the first provider to support uh, Windows on both of these container platforms. Um, so Kubernetes um, is that ability to take those containers and to we call them container orchestrators because they kind of like orchestrate our containers in production. We define how we want our application to run in production. And then it's Kubernetes job to make sure that what we've described in our definitions is how the application runs. Now it's open source. Um, lots of different providers, cloud providers use and support Kubernetes. It was originally uh, built by Google um, and we call it uh, a container orchestrator. So no, a node, um, you'll often hear me referencing a node in Kubernetes. A node is the smallest unit of computing in Kubernetes. So I think of it as like an EC2 uh, instance on AWS. Um, EC2 instance is a virtual machine effectively. So a cluster is made up of virtual machines. So we might say, I want a cluster of three virtual machines in my uh, Kubernetes cluster. And what Kubernetes does is it installs on, um, on uh, those, those machines. And it then basically creates a cluster from those machines. And when you say, I want to put a container on my cluster, it's actually going to be placing that on one of the machines, um, the virtual machines. To you as a developer, you just see it as this big cluster, but under, under the hood, it's made up of machines. Now, if one of those machines fails, Kubernetes will recycle that machine, replace that machine, um, you know, rebuild things that are on it, it will move nodes from failed machines to, to working machines. Um, but that's not going to be impacted by your application. See, if your application has a memory leak or some kind of critical failure, that's not going to bring down the virtual machine. That's because it's in a container, it's sandboxed. Um, the, the reasons why virtual machines might fail in, in a cluster and Kubernetes would be potentially like a hard disk failure, you know, phys things physically going wrong, network card failure and the actual physical machines which run it. Um, in those instances, Kubernetes will know how to then restart the machine or rebuild the machine or create a brand new machine and add it to the cluster. So if you say, I want three nodes inside of my cluster, Kubernetes is responsible for making sure that you always have three nodes. Um, in AWS, I won't go into the details of it, but we have a thing called availability zones inside of a region. Um, often is the case that when you build a, a, um, a Kubernetes cluster, we say that a node should be placed in each availability zone. And these availability zones are separate sort of pieces of infrastructure. And that means that your cluster, it's, it's very unlikely that you'll have multiple um, availability zones failing at the same time. That we've, we've made sure that they've got separate power, um, separate um, cooling. Um, they are far enough away. From, these, are, are, uh, these availability zones are far enough away from each other geographically so that like a, a bolt of lightning wouldn't take out both um, AZs. Um, so we, we can create these clusters of, um, of nodes across availability zones, which means that um, it's really unlikely that we're going to have um, 
or, or we're, we're, we've got, we're building resiliency into our application by creating these clusters which span multiple availability zones. Um, a pod is a, a set of containers that make up a single microservice or a single application. So you might say, you know, we've got three uh, or six or nine containers in a pod which make up this particular portion of my application. Um, and a cluster, I've already discussed it in, in Kubernetes, is that 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 those that pool of nodes together, which form uh, and create this this cluster, which we can deploy our containers onto. Now there are you can build a uh, you know a Kubernetes cluster um, from you know virtual machines or even bare metal machines if you wanted to, and you can deploy it yourself. And there's instructions on how to do that. It's building a cluster the hard way. It's very infrastructure. -y. There's a lot of networking you have to get right. But for the vast majority of people, specifically if you're a developer more like myself, then you will probably want to go to a, a managed service. And so uh, the easiest way to create a cluster is to use a cloud provider like AWS. Um, our service, the Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, or actually it's changed that. Yeah, Elastic, that is, no, Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes or Amazon EKS is a fully managed uh, Kubernetes control plane. And it's as easy as going to this console in the cloud and going, I want to create one of these things. Obviously, you can do it all from APIs as well. You can do it from command line interfaces. We ha even have specific tooling to help you build these clusters. But the simplest way, go to the website, say, I want to create an EKS cluster, cluster give it a name. In this instance, we're going to call it Grog and Dash. Um, you pay for the control plane, and you also pay for the individual nodes that make up your cluster. So if you say I want to have three uh, nodes in my cluster, uh, three EC2 instances in my cluster, which make up my cluster, then you're going to be charged for each of those individual machines um, as, as part of your bill. So here we can say, well, I'm going to give my name, my cluster a name. I'm going to choose a Kubernetes version. That's quite an old version, but never mind. Um, I'm going to give it a name, uh, a role name. Um, in AWS, this is one of the ways that we manage security. I'm not going to go into that, but it's just basically the security, the, the role that we give those, those machines so they can talk to other AWS services. I'm going to create this inside of a VPC. Um, in AWS, VPC is a, a virtual private cloud. It's like um, most people build their infrastructure inside these VPCs. It's like a, a little area, a little private network that you can create. Um, we can either choose an existing VPC or we can create a brand new VPC. And it allows you to configure things like subnets and, and various other different things. So you can position it inside of a next to other AWS resources or access other AWS resources. You can put it in a private area, which isn't accessible from the internet or various other things that you might want to do from a networking point of view. But I'm just going to you know, accept the defaults. It's going to create me a brand new um, uh, VPC. Um, I, I mentioned um, what subnet I want to put it in. These subnets is, is the way that we can place different nodes in different availability zones. I've got three subnets inside of this VPC. Each one of those subnets exists in a different availability zone. So I know that if I put a node in one of those subnets, it's going to, um, it's going to um, span multiple availability zones. Um, and then the final thing is a security group. A security group in AWS is a little bit like a... a, 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 a a configurable firewall. Um, so a security group would say things like, I'm going to allow port 80 or allow port 443 um, or whatever ports that you might want to open on those machines. You basically configure it once in a security group, then you apply it to the nodes. And this is the same with EC2 instances as well. You, you apply a security group and then instead of going to the individual machine and opening up ports, that security group will, if it's applied to one or 10 machines, it will open up the ports based upon that security group. So it's a bit like a customizable firewall. That's the way I think about it anyway. So once we've done that, we, we created our Grog and Dash cluster. Um, we end up with a um, uh, an endpoint that we can communicate with and start working with. So the way that we would work with a cluster is we would use our tooling. And, and there is some open source tooling, uh, kubectl, which is a way of interacting with your Kubernetes cluster. Um, the only thing which is different, I guess, if you're deploying it to AWS, is that you're going to have to log in to your cluster. So there's a little bit of work that you need to do just to log into your cluster. But once you've logged into your cluster, and there's a couple of lines that you need to run to log into your cluster, once you've done that, um, then 
you will be able to just use kubectl just like you're dealing with any other kubernetes cluster whether it be on uh, google's cloud or, or or azure or any other cloud provider um so this is kind of the the command that you run um to get the get the credentials for that cluster so i use aws eks i say i'm getting, i'm in the region eu west one i'm going to update my cube config which is a file on your machine which basically is the connection to um to kubernetes i'm going to call the cluster grog and dash and then it's going to look for that cluster in my uh, account grog and dash cluster and then it's going to basically take the the connection string effectively and it's going to save it to my local cube config file so now whenever you use kubectl it's going to be actually executing against this cluster so that's the only difference that's the only line of code that we're going to have to run to connect these things up and then we can start um, interacting with our cluster so i can start running commands for a kubectl commands like kubectl get services and here i've got a service running and it shows the service and the cluster ip and the ports that are open and, and how long it's been running and various other things um, now, I mentioned um, a node in AWS is uh, an EC2 virtual machine. It's like an instance, a virtual machine. Um, so we create these nodes and we add them to our cluster. If you want to run Linux containers, then you need to have Linux nodes. If you want to run Windows containers, then you need to have Windows nodes as part of your cluster. We pay for each individual EC2 instance. And in this example, we're going to have three uh, nodes in our cluster. So let's i added them as part of the creation and so now i've got three um three nodes added to my cluster they've been added uh, they're only a minute old and they each they're individually addressable ec2 instances you can go into your account and you can actually see these machines they've got ip addresses um you could access them individually if you wanted to um you can have fun like you can restart them and you can watch kubernetes go and recreate them if you deleted one or something like that it would just be recreated by by, um, by Kubernetes. Um, so you, these instances are being managed by Kubernetes and um, they're forming this cluster. Now, if we want to apply an application or get our containers to, an to, to this Kubernetes cluster, what we have to do is we have to send our Kubernetes a description, our Kubernetes cluster, a description of the application we want to run. And basically the description file is either JSON or YAML and it describes what containers we want to run, what pods we want to, want to run, how many containers we want, where we get the container images from. And um, I'm using it here as a file, but it can even be a URL. You can, you can basically, you can point um, kubectl to a URL um, in GitHub, it's a GitHub file, and it would deploy that application directly to your cluster. So there's lots of examples on, um, on the, the Kubernetes a project of sample applications you can just basically apply to your cluster and it will go and build um, that application inside of your cluster for you um this is roughly what a kubernetes file looks like in yaml um so uh i here have you know that grog and dash um that particular grog and dash um that container that i created earlier you can see um i have uh i have it over here and it's pointing to an image it's actually pointing i've just realized to my docker version of this rather than my ecr version of this but it's saying this container image comes from the beebs slash grog and dash latest i know it's docker hub because it doesn't say anything about the container registry it just says the name and that only happens with docker hub so my, my docker my docker hub username is the beebs so it's saying the beebs grog and dash latest go and pull that image from my docker hub um you might if i was using ecr you would see a, a url to my ecr yeah, my image here and it's saying always pull the image directly from the container registry and it's saying how big do i want my container registry container to be a cpu 100 and memory 100 mi um i'm saying that i want port 80 to be open on that particular container and i want six of these container images as part of my front end of my application um i think i give it a name i label it grog and dash front end this particular um this particular set of, of containers um what i want is a load balancer which is what i'm going to put my domain name at which then load balances across those different containers that i've created um now this is a, an example of uh the actual application and my application doesn't just consist of 
my ASP.NET application. It actually uses Redis as well. So as part of that, I've created a, a Redis um, cluster in my application as well. So you'll see, if you look through this YAML file, which is over on my GitHub, um, you'll see that there's a Redis file, there's a Redis, um, it will create the Redis containers, the Redis, um, um, the, the master and, and the, the slave uh, containers. It will then create a thing called a load balancer. So you can see on line 91 there, it's creating a brand new load balancer. Now that's going to um, listen on port 80 and it's going to select any anything which is labeled grog and dash in the tier front end. So it's basically going to be um, a load balancer which load balances across any of the pods or the pod called um, grog and dash front end. And um, then I've got a deployment uh, in front end with three replicas. You can see that on line uh, 103. Um, so here I've got this, I've got a, a, cop, a little a cut out of that particular um, uh, piece of YAML and I've got three replicas. So what it's going to do, it's going to create, uh, it's going to basically create this uh, infrastructure for me. Um, sorry, six, I had six replicas originally. Did I? Yeah, six replicas you can see at the top there. And then, so I would have had um, six um, containers. And then if I go into my YAML file and I were to change that six to three, what would happen is that the container would, um, it would scale down the containers. Instead of having six containers running, I would have three of those containers running that, um, that front end application. So the way that we like describe the application, how many containers, what containers, where the containers should be running, what other containers are working, how things communicate and network, that's all described in this YAML file. Um, so a developer would construct the architecture for that application in one of these YAML files. And if you ever want to change it, you want to add more containers, we just go and edit the file and apply it to our Kubernetes cluster. We can do this manually, like I'm doing here, or we could have it working a little bit smarter, automated. So let's say we have a system where we've got, we're monitoring the number of requests that are coming in. We could scale the number of replicas that we have of that particular container to handle a bit more load. Um, there's lots of ways that you can adjust that and basically if you um adjust this file apply it to our cluster it will alter the uh, uh the application architecture for us okay so we've built the site uh, we've contain containerized our dotnet application we've rebuilt the site on kubernetes we're now in the cloud um we're set up a a, a ci cd pipeline so that we just check our code into github and then we have a continuous integration uh, platform which We'll take our uh, Docker build, build it, push our containers to ECR, and then fundamentally our build system will deploy to Kubernetes by just running, taking our service all.yaml file and running it against our Kubernetes cluster. And it will then apply uh, that to our to our um, to our running service. So we've we've basically taken this application, we've not really changed any of the code, but what we should have done, what we hope we have done, is made the site more reliable. And even though it has this problem where memory keeps on crashing the application, we can still build a more stable system using a container orchestrator like Kubernetes. So if nodes fail, um, then they'll be recreated. If pods die, the system will re-add them. If we, it will just re kinds of, it will require very little human intervention. You know, if, if, if servers are failing, Kubernetes is going to replace them. If containers are crashing and they're becoming unhealthy, Kubernetes is going to replace them. There will be times, of course, when we have to go in and manually fix things and, 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 and have a look at why the system's failing. And that requires us to add things like monitoring and logging, which is a whole different talk. But fundamentally, what we should have is a system which looks after itself. It makes sure it has the, same, the right number of nodes. It makes sure that the containers are as we've described them in our YAML file. And it's constantly trying to um, bring us up to that level. So if containers are dying, we're going to be adding new ones. Kubernetes is going to be adding them. We don't have to manually intervent, add, intervene there to do that. Now, one of the uh, one of the pirates, though, uh, uh, Grog Computing says, "I'm sorry to interrupt. This is someone else. Sounds great, but like it's a little bit confusing. Why do I need a cluster?" And it's a fair point. And we thought about this AWS and we said, well, why do you need a cluster? Why do you have to describe the infrastructure underneath it? Why do you have to say, I want three machines? Isn't there a way which we can improve this? Now, we have a service in AWS called Fargate, which actually, we have this um, service called Fargate, which allows us to run containers in our infrastructure. So we basically manage a cluster 
a really big cluster. And you can give us your container images and we can run them in our cluster rather than in your cluster. That means that you don't have to manage the machines that underpin the cluster. You just have to give us your, um, your containers and we'll run them in, 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 in Fargate. Now, Fargate was added to our other container service, ECS, quite a while ago. And it was very, very popular because it meant that people no longer had to worry about creating these clusters. They would just basically describe the applications they want and say, I want these containers to run on Fargate rather than my own cluster. And it would just they would just run over in Fargate. We thought it would be quite cool if we could bring this to Kubernetes. So um, about a year ago, we added support for this concept. I think we're still the only cloud provider which do this. And it means that instead of having to create a brand new Kubernetes cluster and, and, and say, I want this number of, um, I want three machines, you could just build a cluster, build a control plane. And then when you're describing your application, you can say, I want these particular containers to run on Fargate rather than running on my own individual cluster, which means that the benefit of that is that let's say I'm, I've got one container running my application and then I've got this really busy day when the pirate festival happens and I want to scale up to 20 containers. Well, uh, with a regular kind of uh, system, I'm going to have to have a cluster of a certain size all the time and we'll scale the number of containers up there, but it's always going to be that same thing. So with Fargate, what we can say is, well, you just ask for more containers and we'll scale it and we'll charge you how, based upon how many the number of containers and the amount of compute that you're using inside of Fargate. So if you're only running one container, you're only paying for one container. If you're running 20 containers, you're paying for 20 containers. So it makes it more serverless. We call it serverless because you're no longer managing the servers or the cluster underneath it. So that's a newer feature inside of uh, EKS, which allows you to avoid the requirement of having a cluster and just run it on our cluster uh, for us. So, I mean, fundamentally, uh, the way that Fargate is working is that usually we have this virtual private cloud or the VPC over here, and you would have your cluster, which is made up of your virtual machines. There'll be virtual machines which actually make up this cluster. There might be three virtual machines which make up this cluster. And that cluster would be able to communicate to the databases or to, to Redis. These might be outside of the cluster, maybe running in um, one of our other services because it's inside the same virtual private cloud, the same network. What Fargate does is it creates a network, um, an ENI or a network connection between the, our cluster and your uh, VPC. And then basically you don't have to have a cluster anymore. You just say you want to deploy um, you have, there'll be a control plane, a Kubernetes control plane, and you, you say, I want to apply my file to that control plane, and then basically it will place the containers in our system. And the cool thing is, obviously, we manage all of this. You don't manage any of that anymore, and you only pay for the things you're using and not for the containers, which you are not for the entire cluster, which you might not be using all of the time. But because we make this connection across from Fargate to your VPC, it feels like it's on the local network, so you're still able to contact local resources like databases, Redis, and those sorts of things. So we've now got a system which is running. The Pirate Festival, people are able to vote. It's working, and it's all it's all running correctly. All great. So if, if you're there, you can have a little quick show, show of, of how this system works. So if I go, if you just scan this QR code with your, your phone, it will take you to a website in your browser, which just says, probably just says something like, please wait, like that. And then I'm going to ask if we can use it. So if you go to that pirates pirate sorry dot the dot net or just scan that qr code you'll see this please wait sign and once you see that please wait then we'll say either coffee or grog what do we want to vote on i i'm going for coffee personally rather than grog so we've got people out there in the audience voting on this this is a containerized application Oh, it seems like grog is much more popular let's have a look at oh very much more popular so 15 16 let's go into Sword fighting or pillaging, which do we prefer? Sword fighting or pillaging, which is the favorite? Pillaging, oh, I'm gonna go for pillage. No, actually I'll go for sword fighting. I'll actually refresh the browser so I can vote again because I've not really built much into this system. But we can see our application's running. It's being able to scale. Our containers are able to scale. It's running inside of in Kubernetes. And for us and for our customers, um, 
Kubernetes has worked and it's scaled. And uh, we've been able to take new life into this um, old .NET application. And fundamentally, the whole reason we do this is because it's reliable and it costs us less because you end up not paying for all the infrastructure you're, you're using or you have to use to scale the application at its peak, but you can start paying for the application only when you need it and only pay for the compute resources when you need it. Now that's all from me. This has been containerizing .NET apps and deploying them to Kubernetes. I'm Martin Beebe. I'm at the Beebs on Twitter. If you've got any questions or if you want any information which I've talked about, then please do contact me on Twitter or, or ask a question now and um, I'll try and answer you as I, as if I can. Thank you very much for listening and um, hope to see you again. Awesome, thank you, Martin. It's a pleasure. All right, and we're unmuted. Yes, probably the first time after a session that that uh, worked out of the box in first time. Perfect. <laughs> cool. And, and <laughs> voting as well, which is always good. Yeah. S sword fighting forever, that's it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's, I uh, voted pillaging, actually. Of course you did. Of course, it, it, it speaks volumes about you, Martin. It really does. When I said when I said pillaging initially, I, I kind of realized that I said pillaging. And I was like, no, what will people think about me? <laughs> like, <I'm> definitely both <laughs> sword fighting. But yeah, it's, uh, it's all it's good. All, it's only a demo, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but we, we we love your slides. Um, it, it's a fantastic sort of um, uh, monkey island thing going on there. And we did ah. have a comment as well, actually saying that somebody was only watching because of the uh, monkey island slides, which um, I think well, is a, I think is a compliment. But we'll, we'll I go think with so. It. Yeah, yeah. Not me. Not the content. <laughs> just the slides. Yeah. yeah just the, the slides. Just the reminiscing about monkey island. For those that don't know, by the way, if you're confused as to all those graphics in there, they do belong to a game called Monkey Islands that used to run on the Amiga. Not everyone will know what that game is, but if you're of my vintage, then you will. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, people watching the stream, if you have any questions, do keep them coming. Uh, we actually already have a couple. Um, yeah, let's maybe start. It's probably more an opinion than, uh, than something else. It's actually one of us uh, who came up with this. OK. Um, Looking at the diagram and the fact that everything can just crash and restart and so on is, is kind of like the antithesis of what we do at JetBrains with profiling and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, but definitely it's much better than uh, than yeah just having to jump in and hair on fire situations where you have to jump into a VM and start troubleshooting. You can leave it running for a night and uh, have your containers reboot and restart and just take the time to investigate whenever you are uh, you're willing to. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not advocating this as an architecture strategy, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that that's what you should do. What I'm saying is that it's actually a really common reason why people move to containers is is just to kind of get a get a hold on their application a little bit because you can start then once you've got it into a system where you can start scaling at much and it becomes easier to scale it as well. You can you can move up and down and add more containers and re reduce containers, it gets you to the point where you can maybe have more reliability and then frees you up to then start thinking about, okay, how do we start really figuring out how to improve this application? How do we start profiling it? How do we get to the bottom of that memory problem that we had? Um, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a gets you away from uh, the problem a little bit so that you have some time to think about it. Um, so it, it's just another... I mean, and this was just one customer example. There's lots of reasons why people move to containers other than that. Um, but that well, is, I, I, is a quite a common reason. I, I think we've all been in the situation where you have to reboot a server because there's a memory leak. It, that that just happens. It, it does. Yeah. As as best as you can to, to write good code, um, you are going to hit that situation at some point. And yeah, reboot, restart, then fix. I mean, you know, so you, you need the, to keep I, the service running. I'm in the point where sometimes, and I'm, I'm sad to admit it, I've written applications where I've had to reboot the browser just to uh, to, to rerun the application <laughs> every so every so often. You know, it happens, and and um, sometimes we can't always get to the bottom as, as quickly. But when you have services which are able to scale at will elastically, then you can recover from these kinds of problems much more quickly. Cover them up from the user because failure happens. You know, in the best written systems, failure happens. So if you're able to somehow um, add more nodes and recover a little bit from uh, from a complete system failure rather than having to take 20, 30 minutes to reboot your machines and rebuild the cluster and s take traffic from the load balancer to just make recover the machines and then apply it gradually. At least it, it makes all of those sorts of things easier to deal with um, and operate. 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, I had a question off the back of that actually, because during your, your session, you were saying you know, like a, a VM could take like five minutes, say, to to uh, reboot, but a, a container can be up in in milliseconds. Yeah. Why is there such a difference in speed there? You know, sort of. Well, what, what's the magic going on? Well, uh, basically, it's you're sharing a kernel, so that you're not you're not having to restart the hypervisor or the the thing at all. You're not having to restart the entire machine. Effectively, you're sharing a container shares the the kernel. Um, and so it's only restarting the 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 little piece of uh, compute which is actually running the application effectively. It's running that mm -hmm. container up and down. Containers, not all containers, start really quickly, especially when you're looking at window for, Windows for Docker containers. If you're containerizing an older .NET Web Forms application, then you might find that it does start does take a little bit longer to to start the container. Um, I've seen customers as well which have like done things like. You know, they're adding sort of databases to containers, or you know, that um, adding sort of permanent storage to containers, and that will add to the the speed in which a container can start. But fundamentally, it's you're not waiting for the whole operating system to come mm -hmm. back up. You're just waiting for your portion of the application to come back up, and that's why containers are much quicker to stop and start because you're sharing a kernel. You're not mm -hmm. you're not having to rebuild the whole machine. And, and I guess uh, leading on from that. Uh, I kind of get then from from that you know how a Linux kernel uh, sorry container works because you, as you say you're sharing the kernel and it, it's it's the user mode kind of stuff that you're having to restart so then that's that's going to be quicker. Um, that's all built into Linux and it has been forever. D does Windows work the same way? You know because again I I, I don't know enough about how uh, w Windows containers especially work. D does yeah. is is that the same? Are you sharing the Windows kernel or or Windows so containers implemented differently? Yeah, so containers has been in round in the Windows ecosystem since Server 2016. But I think it is it Server 2019. I think that they they, I mean, you can look at the the details of how Microsoft have done this. That they've added support for the kind of containerization that Linux has to the newest versions of uh, the Windows Server Windows Server. So it's built into the server operating system. Prior to it being done by Windows, there were, you know, they, they were using clever virtualization layers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. completely beyond my, me technically i don't really know how any of that works i i'm i am a developer and i care i'm a way above that level i don't de delve too de deeply into yeah that i know the feeling no. but, but windows <laughs> windows deep. containers i mean it's possible on windows containers um we're obviously uh docker and um uh, uh there are other ways of containerizing applications you don't have to use docker but docker is mm -hmm. the the kind of the standard of the de, the de facto standard and, and docker worked with microsoft really heavily to make sure that we could run they could run windows uh, docker on windows um but there's a lot I, i've not worked for i've worked used to work at microsoft i've not worked there for years but there's lots of work that's gone on inside of the sort of the core of windows to enable containers and windows cool. containers i personally use linux containers exclusively i don't have any windows docker containers i just know it's possible and i know that mm -hmm. we've worked that you so that you can support it in AWS, but really the magic, you know, is at a, a server level, and it's Microsoft and Docker which have been working on that. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you'd be more inclined to use a Windows container if you're using .NET Framework rather than the .NET Core. If you're using .NET Core, you could probably use you yeah, probably so favor Linux, I guess. Yeah, almost certainly. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's reasons why you would maybe want to run .NET Core or .NET Five on Windows, um, mm -hmm. um, but I don't. I use if I'm containerizing them, I'm doing it on Linux. Um, obviously, with .NET Framework, like full framework, it has to run on Windows. It, it yep. uses Windows, it uses elements of the Windows operating system, which .NET Core was abstracted away from. That's the whole reason why .NET, .NET Core and .NET Five are so exciting in my my view is that they've extracted they've they're no longer pinned to to Windows operating system. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, cross platform. Is good. In, yeah, if you're calling into a web forms, you know. System dot drawing or whatever, you're actually going into the Windows internal at that point. So it's not just it's not just at a software level. It's at a server, you know it's in, in, ingrained into the operating system. And so um, yeah, it's. I'm not saying I, I I would advise that like Windows containers, containers that run on Windows, the Windows operating system, are, are harder to to work with. They're they're not as common. Um, and generally speaking, if you can, you would you would generally favor Linux containers. I would say. Um, and mm -hmm. for the for the if if not just for the basic point is that Linux servers generally are cheaper to run. Um, for the same compute, you you don't have to pay the license fee. So, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a good point has um, also been made in the comments just now, actually, um, for, for sticking with Windows as, uh, and Dino Framework is that there are still many components, such as Crystal Reports, apparently, uh, that don't yet work on Dino on Dunnet 5. So that is yep. obviously a very good point. You know, if, if, you, if you have dependencies which require Dunnet Framework, then, then yes, yep. you're going to be... Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, you could have a system where you have um, a cluster which is made up of Windows, like you've got one Windows node, and then you've got like five Linux nodes which make up your cluster. And you could say, okay, um, I've got this Crystal Reports API thing which runs on the full framework, and I've containerized that, and that runs on Windows, and it will run in, on Windows in your cluster on your Windows node. And then everything else is .NET on Linux, and uh, that's going to that's gonna run as containers still talking to each other, they're still able to communicate over the, over inside the cluster, but one of those containers, it just happens to be Windows. Uh, just because you're using Windows containers doesn't mean you have to use it throughout your application. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Crystal Reports, System.Drawing, those sorts of things are tied very much to Windows. And uh, so you do have to architect around those. Yeah, cool. Cool. Do we do we have time for one more? I guess we have time for one more. Um, yeah. That also came in through the through the chats, and that was about uh, telemetry and failure feedback, like logging and so on. Um, is there an easy way to get logs from your cluster from your applications and start uh, yeah looking into what is going on in there? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't operate many clusters at scale to the need to need to to look into it. But there's there's any open source tooling which runs with Kubernetes. Um, you know, you, you can do, and there's tons of um, telemetry and logging systems for Kubernetes, which you could run and, and use. Um, yeah, I'm not going to make suggestions about which ones are the best because I frankly don't know, but they, um, it's, a, it's a very broad ecosystem. And that's true of Kubernetes and ECS. We have, um, we have uh, systems for both of those container platforms. We have things like FireLens for ECS, which is, is a built-in sort of uh, way of, of taking container logs and putting them into somewhere else. And, uh, yeah, but there are tons and tons of of companies out there which are building open source tooling and also proprietary licensed tooling to help you with that that sort of stuff. So yeah, we obviously have there is basic logging and and, and stuff, but most of the customers that I I speak to which are using this stuff in anger are probably using some third party um, or open source tooling to kind of <clears throat> deal with their logs and things. Cool. All right. Then uh, I guess we're almost out of time. So uh, thank you. Can, again I, can, I squeeze, for... can I squeeze one last question in, do you reckon? Um, if it's the last uh, one, yeah. Yeah, a question. A question about um, CI build. Um, you were mentioning about um, pushing uh, an image as part of your CI build. Um, yep. What about sort of uh, best practices, I guess, around that is would you do that on every build or would you do it on uh, like only on a, a uh, you know, like a, a proper production so, released type thing. You know, is it like a deployment build? Um, and what about sort of cleaning up and, and things like that? I don't know how heavy it is to push uh, an image to as part of CI. I mean, it's not heavy, um, and you absolutely can do that. So, depending on your CI CD pipeline and, 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 and stuff, you will choose exactly how you want to do deployments. Do you want often, you see how I tag that image, I tag that container with something. Now, in in the examples that I when I use Kubernetes, the way that I I've I've managed this is that when I tag uh, the container, I tag it with the um, ID of the check-in from GitHub. So it'll be like a long the long GUI that you get basically with each check-in. I tag each container with it, and then when I deploy it, I I alter my this is all automated. I alter the, the Kubernetes file to change the container image to be um, the container tagged by the uh, the the github uh, repos um id and then that's deployed um i do it basically on every check-in usually uh, every check-in which passes the build and, and passes tests and uh and my uh i have a little pipeline which we built i build in inside of we have an aws tool which does this which which was um uh, provides a pipeline and that has the ability to do um you know run a suite of tests and if the tests pass then it will then ultimately deploy to kubernetes um if they don't pass then it will um raise an alarm but you could also you know put in a manual step there to you know it requires a person to actually press a button to push it or maybe you will only do it when there's there's che you're checked into a specific branch 
Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways that you could manage that. So not everyone will do it on every single time that you push to a particular, to the, to, to, to the main branch, let's say, but maybe if you've got a release branch, um, you would do it, you would do it to that. So however you want to uh, deploy, you could, you can do it. Um, but the common workflow, which I use is I tag every container with the Git ID. And that's useful because then when you look at kubectl and you can see the containers that are running, you can see the tag on them and then you can pin that back to a specific point in your code. Like, okay, that's that particular code base that I was running or build that container. So you can, you know, be a little more specific about what version of the code broke the system, if that makes sense. Yep, that sounds good. That's uh, always good to know as well. Cool, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Um, so yeah, thanks again for your session. Um, I guess we'll bring in our next host, the next speaker. Uh, thanks again for replacing uh, one of the speakers on such short notice. Uh, and yeah, I guess we'll see you around. Yeah, you. great session. Thank you very much. Take care, Martin. Bye. Bye now. All right. And with that, let's also bring in our next host, uh, Matthias, and uh, remove myself again from the stream here. Hey, Matthias. Hey. Your turn now. See you guys. <laughs> see, you. see you later, Martin. Cool, cool. I learned about Kate's now, how it works. <laughs> Matt, we, we didn't, did we learn how to pronounce it properly? Not as exactly sure. Kate's. Kate's. Something was on in front of my house, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's welcome our next guest, Lorraine. Welcome to the show. Hi, Lorraine. Yeah, hi there. Hi there. You're from Cape Town, right? Yes, Cape Town, uh, bottom end of, uh, of Africa. That's far away, far away. <laughs> um, so the time's at ta same time zone as you, at least. But the time zone is almost the same, yeah, true. That I, makes I've it a little easier. I've already watched a couple of, uh, or at least one of your talks, which is, was really great. And since we're on time, I would just say stage is yours. And good luck and have fun to everyone else. Thank you very much. I hope we do have some fun. Legacy Refactoring. And my name is Lorraine Stain. Uh, my Twitter handle is LawCareRace, and I absolutely love it if people tweet and that's a nice way to get feedback. So please, if you, if, if I say anything you like, please put it out there as a, as a tweet. As I said, I'm from Cape Town and I'm the CEO of a software development company. One that we started over 30 years ago. So I've seen a lot of systems and a lot of legacy systems. Right. I have this fantastic role, which, which is, I suppose, how I build things for myself. But um, we've got about a dozen teams, and I get to join those teams and, and work with them, mentor, guide, train. Um, so I stay very hands-on. I'm not a manager at all. I'm still self-described nerd and software developer, and this is what I love doing. I just love code. But I guess none of us really love legacy systems, so... Let's talk a bit about a little bit about this, and hopefully I can share some some lessons. Do you get the, the vibe of, of legacy systems, which says here be dragons, that there is uh, something to be really scared of? And unfortunately, that is I think how a lot of people see it. And I maybe need to give my own definition of, of legacy, but. Then almost the moment you check code into the vault, it becomes legacy. It's, it's done. So we spend much more of our time maintaining code than we do writing it from scratch. That is my experience. So we should find better ways to do it, right? The general definition of legacy code is basically something that somebody else's code. It's something we don't really want to engage with. And I think that is actually a formal definition, somebody else's code. I don't really agree with that entirely. But maybe we know in our gut when it's legacy. You can ask almost any developer and they'll say, I don't want to touch that stuff. And that's a pretty clear indication that it's a type of legacy. The, the other definition is it's not safe to touch. We're, we're actually scared of this code. Almost everything we do, we, we end up burning our fingers. So we can talk about how we can make it safer to, to change.
this is a real connection. It's a mesa of electrical wires. And for me, sums up what happens to code. I mean, it starts off fine, right? It, it starts off as, you know, we will start off with the best intentions. And over time, it becomes this terrible, terrible mess. And the thing is, it works. So you're too scared to start pulling it apart because it works. There's business value in there. The business needs it. Why does it always become such a mess? Uh, the domain-driven design people have a name for it. They talk about a big ball of mud. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably use that term most of the time, the big ball of mud. And the thing about the big ball of mud is that it's, it's almost inevitable. I've used the avalanche picture to, to indicate this, but it's almost like you have this weight and it's going to start rolling and it's just going to become a mess. I think it's uh, in the foreword to the Working Efficiently with Legacy Code book by Michael Feathers, which, you know, is a, is a good place to start if you're looking for tips. But it's, it, it agrees with me. It says it's inevitable that it becomes a mess. So that's pretty sad. Before I talk about how we deal with that mess, let's have a, a brief moment to just talk about how much we all love shiny new toys. And if there's one thing the developers love is shiny new toys. Because of this urge, there'll be as much debate about whether we should rewrite the system as whether we should refactor it. So again, I have views that's from our experience, you know, over 30 years of systems, that you only rewrite if the functionality of the business has changed so much, the requirements of the business has changed so much that there's not no value left in the code. But while the business is still fundamentally the same, you know, moving forward, but fundamentally the same, you should refactor and not rewrite. Okay. I will go into that and why a little bit more, but that's not the focus. We look at legacy and we have a lot that does actually work. In fact, fundamentally it works. Against that, we have our problem areas. So we've got to be careful not to let a smallish amount of problems sort of took the scale as such, so that we think everything is a problem. It's also one of the reasons why the rewrite doesn't so often goes wrong, is people focus on their problems. So you get your new, new system emerges months, years later, and it's focused on the problems and the things that used to work now aren't, aren't well sorted. So you've got to keep on remembering that there are so many things in that mess, in that legacy, it's taken a lot of time for people to put all those little tweaks in, the things the users love, the button that just does their job more. Right. And, and that brings me to another point about legacy. In every domain, except for coding, legacy is a good thing. If you talk about leaving a legacy to somebody, that is desirable. That is a really good thing. And we have to get back to that sense of value when we talk about legacy systems. We have to remember that they represent enormous business value. We may hate the code, but we mustn't hate the value of what they deliver. Cool. So how do I recommend tackling this? How do I fight my dragons? I recommend looking at this kind of triangle. At its base, at the base we have tools and infrastructure. In the next layer, we have to deal with the people and the team and their skills. And only at the end of it all will we look at code. Okay. So let's start off by what do I mean by tools and infrastructure? You'll have to look at this picture and imagine that uh, this biplane is maybe uh, the engine's getting old, it's, it's spilling a bit of oil, um, it's probably just smoke. But, but hey, let's imagine so we, we can see an old plane. Imagine your system is a little bit like this. It's working, but everything's a little bit old. I find so often when I look at legacy systems that people have allowed the environment to get old as well. So they're not on the latest versions of Visual Studio maybe not using the latest version of C-sharp, if that's your tool. 
very often on old databases. Um, I can give an example of a system we've dealt with recently that was still in SQL Server 2008. Now, that was an easy discussion to have with the, the client because that's actually deprecated. It's not even good business value to continue on it. So what we recommend as a very first step is to get all your tools up to date. Okay? It, it's usually fairly e easy to have those discussions with your, your users, your clients, whoever they are, that say it's not good business sense to be using old tools, there's security problems, it's deprecated, support's bad. So what we recommend is that you find everything and you get it up to the most current version you can. I know sometimes there are libraries and their dependencies that mean we can't totally modernize everything. But take all the, I mean, these are quite cheap upgrades. Do as many of these standard updates as, and as far as you can. Convince your client to go for Azure if you can. Or, you know, take it up as, as up to date as you can. There's another bunch of things that I throw into this base of infrastructure. And that is this code that was never good. It's not like it was even good in its day. There's something about legacy systems that so often I find the most terrible architectural decisions have been made. You look at it and you have these absolute WTF moments. You're saying, who thought this was a good idea? And it's driven by a lot of things. Um, usually with great enthusiasm, many, many years ago, some team decided to write their own framework. Now, if that doesn't send uh, shivers into your, your spine, I don't know what does, because handwritten frameworks, they usually just get in the way. They're not as good an idea as, as they seemed when you thought you were going to get the system to be so clever. The lucky thing with software, of course, is that if we remove these pillars that are in our doorway, these big, bad architectural decisions, we don't have a roof that falls down on us. You know, software is malleable. It's something you can change. So I really recommend that you have a look if there are any architectural decisions that were taken that are getting in the way every single day. And it can be, as an example, a system we worked with had a multi-tier architecture implemented, but it didn't need it. And that's a, that's can, you know, it could be an architecture which is, is good for other purposes, but it wasn't useful there. In this architecture, we had a front end, a middleware layer, and a back end, which meant you had to do everything three times. In terms of supportability, it was a nightmare. I mean, just everything took longer. And you sometimes have to be quite creative to figure out how you can remove something like a middleware layer without breaking everything. But if you can do it, you just set yourself up for your next stages to be so much more successful. And in modern terminology, we could probably find quite a few implementations of things like microservices that probably shouldn't have been. And I'm sure you have a whole host of examples yourself. How do you identify these things? And um, here we must maybe talk about who am I speaking to? I'm in the lucky position that when I come into a team or and, and I, we take on a job and we look at an old system that we're going to help support and help move it forward, we have the authority to make changes. Sometimes, the, and most times, the team who's been in place have at least felt that they didn't have the authority to make any changes, but they always know what their problems are. So the way you find out what's really wrong, of course, is you trust your people, you trust your developers, what's getting in their way every single day, and then you tell them, well, we are actually going to let you fix it, which is such an amazing step, right, when you feel disempowered. And along those lines, Let's talk as well about, about motivation of people. When you start making upgrades, you bring software up to date, you allow teams to fix things that have been hurting forever, and they start to believe that management really cares. Ah, this isn't just the old system in the back room and nobody cares. Somebody cares. 
things are going to get better. I'm not just doing a, day, a job day in and day out with the soul destroying. So you, you can motivate people. You can raise morale. You can have some wins, which is also a really great place to kick off the next stages of the refactoring and, and cleaning up a legacy system. Start with a win. Right. So it's, it's a little mix of things. It's not that clearly defined. So, but that's the tools and infrastructure. And I do believe that unless you have a base that you can build on, um, you're going to just waste an awful lot of time. So deal with those big things. Get a nice solid base, a newer one. Get your tools up to date. And then we can talk about the next most important thing in refactoring any system. And it's your people. Right. It's the people that are going to do the work. Yeah, there's a deep and sad truth that the team who made the mess can seldom fix it on their own. Over many months, many years, the team has dug their particular hole and they need help to get out of it. There's another small thing there about the rewrite as well. If you have a team and they've begged and pleaded and management has agreed to allow a rewrite, unless that team learns some new skills, if, they, if the same team tackles the rewrite, you're going to get the same result over time, which is a legacy system, which is a tangled mess, and it generates into a big ball of mud. I promise you, you will get that. You also can't just bring in new, a new team because they don't have the domain knowledge. So although the Costa Concordia's captain probably has never had another job driving a ship, you do to ships, in software it's not quite so straightforward. We need the team that's currently in charge of that legacy software because they have the domain knowledge. And unless you have a very unique situation of a very well-documented a legacy system. It's actually usually more, uh, you know, here be dragons. There's bits of the code where no one wants to go and no one knows it. So you need the domain knowledge to be preserved. So we have to take the team in place and we have to raise the bar. We have to increase and upskill, increase their skills. So what kind of skills, you know, what am I talking about here? I usually look at, at extreme programming for the techniques that we need to bring into teams. And it would be the, the two techniques that are most valuable are obviously the unit testing or TDD, if you can get all the way there, but at least unit tests and pair programming. And before I go any further, I just want to say that when you start working with a team and we're doing this refactor, the team is often expecting, they know it's not a good job, right? And if you turn it into a blame game, you just get people who are sullen, they, they're resigning, they don't want to work with you. So when you talk about upskilling people, it's very important that it's not a blame game. It's very important that it's talked about as a growth opportunity, that you want to bring the whole team with on this journey to making the software a little more beautiful. So let's go and have a look at the first of the techniques, which is unit tests. I mean, bluntly put, we need a safety net. And without a safety net, which is your tests, any changes you make, any refactoring you do is very, very risky. Yeah, I'm going to refer back again to Michael Feather's book. His, uh, he actually defines legacy systems as systems with no, without tests. Now, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because I've actually seen systems that have tests, but the tests are useless. So let's define it as systems that have useful domain level tests. That's where we want to get to. Again, I'm, I'm giving our opinions, but this, and this isn't a talk about testing because we can get into all of the deep dives there. But what I value most is 
tests the test business logic, tests the, the basically prevent me as the developer on the team from constantly shooting myself in the foot, right? So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the kind of tests that, that protect us. And usually it's, it's quite difficult to, to know how to write these when you haven't been experienced in it. So there's a lot of, of mentoring as well, you know, as well as the upskilling and maybe some workshops, you, you have to figure out ways to actually do this kind of upskilling. The other technique that I really, really love is pair programming. So our own teams um, have been doing pair programming for a long, long time. It, it's obviously a great way to pass knowledge around and, and all of this. But obviously in the last year with COVID, we went fully remote as a company. So all the developers now work remotely. And for me, the pairing has become a lifeline. Right? It's my connection with a fellow human being, even if through my screen. It's somebody that I can talk to about design decisions, somebody I can learn from, I can share knowledge with. It's even something, so pairing helps me stay on track. So instead of spending another hour in the morning in my pajamas, because I'm working from home, I'll be thinking that my, my pair person is waiting for me. And then, you know, it really helps to formalize my day and um, helps me personally to do better work. And what I love about remote pairing, it's, it's even better than person, you know, in, in person pairing was because I don't have anyone in my space. I don't have to physically share my screen and keyboard. We're sharing it electronically now, digitally. So I've got no one in my space, which as an introvert, that really works for me. And, uh, and now it's only my real asshole cat you know, who's, who's in my space usually on, on, on the keyboard. Now, pair programming is a really great way to bring good habits into a demotivated team. So if you can, if you're bringing extra skills into the team and you've got people who may be slightly better coding habits, they know how to do tests properly, if you can bring those skills in and you pair somebody with higher tech skills, with a pair, you make a pair with somebody who's got high domain knowledge, that's actually a great way for the one to teach the other. You need the domain knowledge and you need the technical skills. So I find that to be a very effective pairing. Tech and domain together. Again, this is not a pair programming talk, but um, you should know the rules. You never put juniors together. Yeah, it's not just a learning environment. It needs to be a productive one where you're sparking ideas and coming up with better designs. So we have to change habits. Remember, this is we're only talking about this in the context of code that has become legacy, it's become a mess. And usually that has happened because of work pressure. Business has been saying we need these changes. The developers are, it's, it's an uphill slog, right? I mean, the code's ugly. You're working your butt off to get it done and you're coding. So you jump in there and you code. And we want to stop that. We want to get people to step back from that code and start thinking about alternatives, other ways we can tackle it. So we've got to change some big habits. If you're working in an agile environment, you know, and using something like Scrum, start making sure that those SP2s are happening and that they're effective. You know, whatever you do, you need to make sure that we, we're holding those design discussions. So something, again, that we like to drive is that part of the design session is explicitly coming up with alternatives, not just coming up with the first solution and then implementing it, but actually spending the time to say, how else could we do this? Right. Because you have to think about this, this enormous legacy code base in front of you as kind of a big ship that you can't just turn around. And if you don't start changing habits, people are going to continue coding in the style they always have the style that brought us to the mess because that's what's in front of them so yeah the, the biggest thing right it, right now is to start changing habits before you actually going to have success so you might do a bit of refactoring you might improve things 
you go away and it just reverts to the big ball of mud unless the habits have changed. So, so that's why the people and the skills are so important. Now finally, now finally we can talk about code. The Boy Scouts rule is the idea that you should always leave, what well, apply to code when you read, that you always leave your code cleaner than you found it. So whatever you checked out, you check it back in cleaner than you found it. Again, you can you don't have to say it has to be totally clean. They, they talk about don't let uh, good be the or better be the enemy of best. You know, at least better is fine. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be better. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And here, here's a nice way to think about, about the job. And these little diagrams are taken from our own Jeffrey's blog. And I really like this approach to refactoring code. Now, when you start out, for every job you work, point from A to B is very straightforward. You can work through the code. You know what you have to do. The lines don't cross very much. After a little while, you can think of the little squiggles as like bushes, a little bit of brush that's getting in the way. And these bushes are going to get, they tend to get more and more. We talk about tech debt. It's messy bits that you almost have to work your way around in the code. And they multiply. They multiply over time, right? And at some point, they get so dense that you almost can't get through the code anymore. And this is the point where, if, if not before, you now have to refactor. And ideally, you want to do it from that second one. But if, if you can refactor at the point where you're working on something, so this little diagram has five touch points through the, the tech data areas. And if you clean up just enough to do the job that you're, you have in hand, you've left things cleaner. It's worth also at this point just mentioning that this is, for me, the only way to do it. You, you shouldn't, that, that idea that you can put tech debt onto your backlog, onto your board, that you can go and ask management, can we have three months off to handle tech debt? First of all, you almost never get it. And, and secondly, then you will work on maybe some of those bushes on the, the top left there, which don't matter right now. It's not the area where we're having to make changes. So I'm fairly against generic tech debt cleanup sprints or pushes and, and, and think that you should really just clean up where you're working. And then the way this works is the next time, the next job you get, you're going to clean up a little more. And at some point, you hit that magical point where something you're working on, you end up going through code that's already been cleaned up. And sure, you could polish it up a little more, but you start finding that you speed up. So the orange line gets to benefit from a previously cleaned part, and the team will feel better because they're starting to see that yeah, it doesn't take as long as it used to, right? Things are speeding up. Yeah, run Jeffrey's blog. It really is the best approach to doing this. something called the legacy code dilemma. So we've talked about having tests in place as a safety net, but a lot of code is not testable. So we need, in order to put tests in place, we first have to change code. We're saying we shouldn't change code with our tests. All right. We, we certainly have to deal with this. The, the way that we recommend you, you consider doing it is that you clean first. You know, if you were doing an operation, you would first clean the, the area and then you do the operation. And just like that, when you, you first do the refactoring, refactoring by definition means the, the output of the code must still be the same, right? You must still deliver the same result, even if the way the code is written has changed. So in refactoring, we do that exercise first. We would normally recommend you would, you know, you make a branch, you check that out. You make those changes. If the, 
could use a pull request mechanism if someone approves it. It goes back and gets merged into your master. And only then do you apply the change that the business wants. So you, split, you separate those two steps very clearly so that you can test that you've got the same functionality as before, before you may start making functionality changes. And then in the pull request, um, one of the things you can do with the vault, of course, is you can enforce your rules that you don't accept the code back in unless it has tests. So you can start bringing in that rigor, which says there need to be unit level tests available at a domain level for each piece of code that's getting put back in. So you're improving things. You're actually enforcing the good rules and you're creating a nice safe environment in small steps for the team to engage with the code and get it better and better. Cool. So what kind of refactoring are we encouraging? The main thing is we are trying to reduce the inter interdependencies, really. I mean, there's fancy words for it, the law of Demeter. Low coupling. We want to reduce the number of connections. The more connections you have, the more trouble, right? That's the, that is when you change something here and three things break down downstream. So whatever you do, you're trying to reduce coupling. It's a, some... some Techniques, of course, like things like single responsibility uh, principle, SRP. That's a great, great way to do it, where you start taking individual small testable pieces out of what's often ugly long methods. Make sure you've got tests to cover them and they have all their dependencies as parameters and a clear output. No side effects, all those kind of things. Of course, if you are lucky enough to have a JetBrains reshopper license, you don't even have an excuse not to be doing this. It makes it so simple. You know, extract method is like, it's like the candy, I think, in refactoring. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing to use. It's so clever at working out dependencies, getting the arguments right, and putting it all together for you. That is literally just, you know, your, your, your fast key to extract method. And I know there's support in Visual Studio, but it's not as good. Cool. The other part of it is having extracted all these little testable methods is finding the right home for them. Where should they go? So this is considered cohesion, which is keeping associated things together. Now, we like to use domain-driven design as one of the ways to, to group things. So to group things by, by business domain. So, Methods that have to do with the customer go together. Methods that have to do with stock management go together. You use the domain to, to group things together. But it doesn't really matter, right? I am not saying you have to go any particular way. What you have to do as a team is communicate and agree what your structure is so that everybody knows where to find things. The thing is, if you extract a lot of methods, and the rest of your team don't know they exist and can't find them, and they're not well named, they're never going to get any reuse. And reusability is also one of the, the real goals because, you know, again, legacy systems, for some reason, everybody has just been like control C, control V crazy. There's usually so much copied code. So you've got to also change that habit and you've got to get people to be able to find methods and reuse them. I guess this is a good time to talk about domain-driven design a little bit more. So domain-driven design is it's a, so many principles and it's a fantastic way of structuring your approach to code, but it's really hard. And also it doesn't actually suit every domain. I mean, they talk about you know, any critical domains. There's a certain amount of things just don't need this extra level of complexity. But there are still techniques that you should be borrowing from DDD. And, and the one for me that's really, really absolutely core cool is ubiquitous language. And this is the idea that you use the same terminology for, for a concept. So you use the same terminology that the client uses, the business domain. That's what you use in the code, in the tests. So when you speak about something, there's no 
misunderstanding about what it is. Everyone is using the same language. And along with that, while you're refactoring, please remember that names really matter. Uh, you know, I don't know, we think that naming's easy, but it's not easy. Figuring out what to call something is, is absolutely so cool. Because that's how somebody else will find it again, right? So use the language of your users and avoid computer jargon. If you take nothing else away from domain-driven design, that's the lesson. Layering is also something that we need to talk about. And you can have too many layers and you can have not enough layers. I rather like this. It must be supper time. It looks good. So let's talk about the two few. That, that one we see a lot is you'll find a web controller and they've written the entire system into the controller method. No, no, we need to pull it out into small testable bits, organize it behind that. Or huge methods inside an event handler. I think you would know that these are, are not good things and you need to be extracting methods. But the, the opposite is also true. You find systems where it's seven calls deep before you actually get to the piece of code that does the work. And especially when you're trying to refactor, you're trying to get rid of dependence on globals, a seven level deep code often is dependent on some global and some state that you didn't know. So you're trying to extract all of those things and, and, and make sure that you've got no side effects, that it's obvious what's getting passed in. And then you end up doing something where you have to pass the same parameters down each level. This has got to get to the point where it's needed. So cleaning up levels and layers where you can, simplifying, asking yourself if this layer is serving any purpose. If all it's doing is passing it from there to there, it may not be serving a purpose. And having those design discussions and, and making sure that your layering is, is serving you. I'm not saying there's any one that's right. Although, you know, we really like to have um, front-end code separated from domain code, separated from persistence. Those are some fairly obvious things, I think. Often in legacy systems, it's all mixed up in that one big tangled mess in the ball of mud. So we can also talk about boundaries. A lot of refactoring talks, and I've watched some demos as well, and somebody shows you how you extract and, and create a bounded context. And, and it's absolutely the thing you should aim for. But when you have a tangled mess, it turns out that it's very difficult to pull sometimes. Now, again, we're just saying we're not going to let best be the enemy. You know, here we, we will just take better. So sometimes pulling on a piece of code, it's, it's like you're going to unravel jersey. So the boundaries are very important, but sometimes very hard to retrofit. So just cleaning up what you have, and even if it remains a monolith, is a legitimate strategy. Not as beautiful as if you were able to create a more modularized and bounded context solution. But, you know, we're working with old code here. I'm just going to put that out there, that if the tendency of all code is to turn into a monolith, sometimes it's too dangerous to pull on the, the string in the jersey. Oh, I do have one suggestion, though, for modularizing. Um, it can be justified to create a, a clean, new sort of parallel set of classes and methods so one of the approaches you can take is that you, you don't do a whole lot of refactoring on the old methods, but you start a new class structure almost in parallel. And as you extend that, you move the code that is dependent on it over from the messy calls it used to do to the new parallel cleaned up, nicely designed solution. And, that, and that's, that's quite nice. It does mean you end up with two copies, so you to watch that and you have to then have an actual commitment to kind of move logic from the one to the other as you go but it can give you a nice way to to just put something in nice and clean 
and not actually deal with a big ball of mud. So these are the things from code point of view that we really feel are, are, are vital. You need to teach people what is clean code. Right. There are various books and clean code is not the only one. Um, I remember the, um, the other one. I'll, I'll, I'll put some references up later. There are actually a lot of good principles around clean code and you need to teach your team whether it's by mentoring, whether it's by showing them, pairing, how to do a better job of cleaning up the code. You need to spend time on naming and try and get to some point of ubiquitous naming if you possibly can. You need to chase down things like globals and kill them. I've talked about single responsibility principle. It's a little harder than it looks. Uh, you know, if you take it to its extreme, every single line could be a single responsibility. So you need to, to really come up with something that fits your domain, which says, what is the logical single responsibility? You know, talking in code steps. It needs to be, again, you still need to keep code together. It needs to be together. So I've seen teams mess that up as well, as simple as it sounds. You need to be extracting testable methods. There are so many things in, in, in what do we mean by testable. And for me, mostly it means it's domain tests. I have a pet hate, which is testing persistence. I'm going to see the comments afterwards and maybe you're all going to kill me and say, no, no, you test everything. But I don't believe in, in, in test coverage per se. It really does nothing for me. I mean, honestly, I believe that my database will save this thing if I give it to it. If I give you a packet of data, I trust the packet of data will be saved. So <laughs> I'm quite anti-persistent level tests. I love domain tests. What is the logic? What is it that if we missed something and you know sent in a null it would break or we sent in the wrong sign and, and the accounts were all thrown out? Test for those things. That matters. As part of motivating people, Encourage the use of new features if you have to do little workshops on, you know, the latest features because the old code would have been written in an old style. So you start working with uh, C Sharp code base and Link is like, oh, wow, you know, new stuff. So, you know, you, you've got to work through this and teach the team and bring them along on the journey. There have been some lovely sessions today. I just finished listening to uh, all the C Sharp 8 stuff. Yeah, it's, it's always changing, right? So you, it's the people you have to change if you want to see the code change. Tighten up scope, you know, get rid of the globals. Those are some of the hints that we can give you. The other thing about legacy systems is there's usually too much code. You know, sort of imagine this is hundreds of thousands of lines of code often. And it's just so difficult to get through it. And you need to put that code on diet, essentially. <laughs> what we find quite useful, and again, it can't be done as a management stick, right? But metrics are useful if they're owned by the team. So I don't like lines of code metrics if some manager is going to come down and think that lines of code are a good thing. This particular metric, I want you to do it in reverse. Make a little game with your team, which says, how many lines of code did we get rid of this week? Every week, celebrate any wins. Because I promise you, in that legacy mess, there's a lot of duplication. There always is. So as you clean it up, as you get back to more ubiquitous language, as you extract methods, you should actually be slimming the code down, not bloating it further. Now, even... To, to really add a little bit extra, count your tests as well <laughs> and still try and reduce the lines of code. Because what you want to build is you want to build a habit and an enthusiasm for, oh my goodness, I found this terrible piece of code. I was able to delete almost all of it because it was deprecated, I don't know, no longer used. Do you know how much code is in execution paths that is never actually traversed? Things are built 
because, you know, the, the speck was this enormous speck. And later on, when you look at it, it turns out no one's ever looked at this report. That kind of transaction doesn't happen anymore. I mean, I'm talking very businessy systems, but I'm sure it works in all sorts of domains. So, yeah, play this game of um, put the code on diet and see how many lines of code you can get rid of every sprint. If you do all of those things, I really believe you will get back to why we all became programmers. I did it for the sheer joy of making things, for the beauty of writing some code and seeing it work. And it is a great pity when you can't have that sensation every day of your, your career. But this was fun. We got to make things better. So you want to bring that in. And I hope I've given you a, a track, a, a way, a route to making it possible. So that's it from me. Go forth and uh, tame your dragons. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Keep the fast. button at the same time. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. As, as has been mentioned in the comments there, there was a lot of wisdom in that talk there. We're, we're all sitting here kind of nodding furiously behind the scenes here, just saying that that's just uh, there's some, some great stuff going on in there. Um, very much I appreciate that. I think I counted wisdom like three times, two times in the chat, once in the uh, once on Twitter. It's all this gray hair. Hey, it's gray hair. <laughs> I, something. I, I hope it's catching. <laughs> That's all I can say. But any questions? Because obviously, I can't look at that when I'm inside. I also have a bit of gray hair, but uh, I wouldn't say otherwise. Any, anyway, one, one thing I want to I want to say is initially you. I was already saw, saw it because when you brought that analogy of avalanches in, that was really great because I thought like big ball of mud sounds, if you think about it, it sounds like something you can work around. You can just walk around it and be done. But avalanche, it's more like a something like a ticking time bomb that you don't expect and it may come at any point, you know, when you already have planned certain so to add new features. And then suddenly it goes boom, and you can't really do anything about it. Yeah, I so also like, was... if you don't mind, um, I like the idea that it, it keeps growing. Okay, so in my mind, that, that ball is is like the the snow, and it gathers everything up until it's all just more and more of a mess. And keeping pieces out of it is, is a real trick. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And trying yeah. to avoid them just being buried by it as well. You know, it it, it is it's, 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 um a great analogy. I loved all your slides. I like the slides of the uh, the, the cat as well. Um, well, a couple of cat pictures in that one actually. <laughs> that they got me for that. Uh, how wrong can you go? Huh? But I, not at all. Uh, I'm a big fan. This works for me. Were there any questions? Um, yes, he's got a, a bunch of questions. Um, so uh, the, the first one I think uh, I will uh, go with um, is uh, we, we're talking about. Um, uh, I guess the sort of the people and skills. You had your sort of your pyramid there of the of your different levels and that. And with things with uh, people and skills and everything, is a how do you kind of how do you improve the skills of the team? So I mean, it, it's kind of uh, great having sort of the permission and that. And you know, if, if you go into a team, you can help and you can mentor and so on. But uh, you're not necessarily going to be a part of that team for for long. Uh, so how do you kind of get that team sort of to to um, you know, to, to improve their skills as they go along? I, I, it's going to depend on the team and the skills. Some things that we've tried uh, work quite well is we bring in show and tell sessions. Mm -hmm. So maybe on a Friday, um, everybody contributes something. They'll talk about something they worked on in the week and how they got it better, you know, something they learned from it. And, and that's often an aha moment because it's real. It's, it's not just some learning out there. It's your, your project. And your colleagues showing you how they actually were able to, you know, put a test on this that you never thought would be testable. And you're going, aha, right? So, mm -hmm. so show and tells are, are quite a nice in-team mechanism. If you've got the facilities to bring in outside consultants and workshop a few things, that's useful to just, check, you know, for the big shifts. And mentoring is really important. So if you can inject a little bit of fresh blood into the team, 
Mm -hmm. um, and um, do, do you sort of feel the, some of the techniques like retrospectives as well uh, will help? So it's like a, a routine look back on how things have gone and looking at how things went badly as well as went well. So, you know, you, you gave an example there of like, you know, I figured out how to unit test this kind of thing. So just just those kind of ideas with retrospectives. Do you agree with that so or not? I'd love to. I, I mean, mostly what I see out of retrospectives is quite, it tends to be more people focused and less code focused. I'd actually love to hear from somebody who's able to do very code focused retrospectives because I haven't really seen it working. Um, yeah. Most people, and, and I, I guess, I don't know, you know, if the Scrum Master approach, you're often talking about team problems. So you're, it's often not the place we're talking about code problems. That team seems to move more into something like the SP2. Um, but yes, if you can have a code-focused retro, which says, you know, what what's, what have we learned in the code? What went wrong? Uh, they're a lot more difficult to hold. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how you'd kind of necessarily go about doing that. I mean, what what would you suggest? Is it like finding a particular example which you've hit this week and just going through it, just something as simple as that? Or uh, is there something more structured and more? Yeah, as I say, I haven't really managed to pull off a, a code mm. level retrospective with the team without it just sort of wandering off into discussions of, of people, you know, and, right. and process. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of all the process stuff that goes on in some of the Scrum things. Uh, we need to keep it fairly lean, in my view, and uh, serving the team. Yeah, I like I like the sound of that. <laughs> That's good. Um, and what, what about things like, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, planning stuff uh, as well? So. I, I guess with with things like um, a code focus, uh, you, you're talking about there. If you want to be sort of improving some of your code, there, there's going to be technical debt. There's going to be things that you you you, you uh, run into that are going to be problems. Things like when you're talking about the Boy Scout rule, you know, sort of cleaning up as you go along and, and finding those things. But what about bigger tasks where you know this system over here is? We know it's a big ball of mud. I can't do anything until I've fixed it. And so you've got a specific technical debt problem. Do you, do you think it's a good idea to have um, have those planned as separate activities, or do you think it's better to try and fix things as you go along? So you know, uh, uh, should you focus on fixing the legacy stuff, or should you focus on working on features and fixing the stuff as you go? What, what do you think? So, so I've got this kind of split that I try and aim for. Where if, if you're especially if you're going into a team, you kind of get an early chance to fix some big things because now you know you've got management support, you're kind of going into this, there's a, a focus on it, you're upgrading everything, that infrastructure type thing. And you're also able to say at that point often, these are just the big things, and until they're cleared, we actually can't do anything. So you do sometimes have those that so it's often bad architectural decisions. Mm. Um, and we, we just find that often it's been somebody with a, a, a title of architect and they want to put their stamp on how things will be done and the, the decisions that are made that cannot be justified ultimately, you know, and they just get in everybody's way, right? <laughs> I see you, Greg. <laughs> you know yeah, the you person get, I'm talking about. <laughs> too, much <laughs> of what, too much of what you're saying is resonating with me. This is a... <laughs> yeah, I do have that section there. and in, in some ways it contradicts what I said about having safety nets. Because sometimes it's so big, you've just got to do it. You know, you've got yep. to leap, honestly. So while you have management support <laughs> and if you have the time, you've got to take certain big leaps and you've just got to get them over with and then you can go back to stepwise. So, you know, they are both paths and they both have different roles to play. I, I have have you made one question. solution for every single question about <laughs> legacy? <laughs> Uh -huh. But those are both strategies I've laid out. I tend to try and get the big ones done first. And then do yeah, that's a, that's a good way to. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to get things started and get the ball rolling. I guess. I have one more question. You you talked about this uh, inversing the metric of lines of code, right? Uh, to to make it how much do you lose? That kind of reminded me when I um, during my study I had a side job, let's say. And I remember I, I removed some code and afterwards my boss told me, oh, that's not explicit enough. I, I think it was reading like uh, XML data through a 
more automated way with re uh, reflection over type, etc. And he said, no, we want to we want to keep this uh, we want to keep this explicit code, and even if it's more. And also, we had uh, one comment in in the chat, I think, where uh, someone said, um, you know, I'm not sure about the uh, exact constellation, but they didn't want to pay for for tests being written. You know, and all of this goes into the same. Uh, it, it makes it really hard. And the, and the question here is, uh, do you have any advice on how how you can convince your stakeholders to, uh, yeah, actually believe believe you? and make a make a good decision instead of this purely i don't know dogmatic uh, uh way of going it's it, you know it's really hard about it is that you, a team that's been working in sort of a bad way you know not not their, their fault right but just battling along they don't usually have the trust of management you know what management sees is a team that everything's slow they don't understand how much, you know, the team's battling against the code, how much they're fighting at every step to get things done. So you've got this mismatch of trust. And, and sometimes you have to bring in new blood almost. You've got to bring in somebody who can make that happen. So I say when you have their support, you've got to do as much as you can at that moment. And you've got to get some wins so that also management also sees, oh, it's all new. We've got a faster database. Oh, that's nice. Look, it's performing better. Oh, we can listen to these guys about what they want. So, so sometimes some of these little upgrades, if you can get a, a boost, so it also pays back because you start getting trust from the management. So it is a psychological game because you're trying to convince people to invest in something they can't see. And, I mean, if they don't want to pay for tests, you know how they're going to feel about pair programming. What? You want yeah. two people to do the job of one. No, it's not one. We need to talk. We, you know, you're going to get better solutions. Therefore, we'll get less code. Therefore, we'll have less maintenance and less bugs. You know, you, you've got to talk a longer game because luckily, one thing you can say about legacy systems, it's it, you're not normally fighting budgets as much as people think you are. You know, startups are budget constrained. I understand why we do things dirty <laughs> in, in startups. There's no money, right? We can get something out. Although there's a whole talk there about why I don't think quick needs to be dirty, but that's another talk. Um, <laughs> strange, hey, why do you say quick and dirty? But when you get to, to legacy systems, that system's there. It's a huge asset of the companies. They need it. Right? They assume a going concern here. So they have money. They have a team. These things are expensive. Surely they want to get the most out of their team and out of their code. So, you know, you're going to have to sell it. <laughs> I think it's trust. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I think what you said about trust is, is a is a, a big factor in in all that. Again, you know, if if the uh, stakeholders can see that you are actually delivering stuff, and then they can build build up the trust rather than just seeing that you're actually uh, slow, but you they don't realize that you're slow because you're constrained by these problems. And and so um, yeah, that um, we just had a, a question pop in there actually about stakeholders, which is uh, probably relevant there. Is, uh, do you think if a stakeholder has experience in developing uh, or programming, that makes them a better uh, better person to lead the team, you know, to sort of to, to join in so you can actually point and say, explain the problems a little bit better rather than from a, a business perspective, I guess? Oh, you get both kinds, right? I mean, you get people who honestly do understand. They might have moved into management. They really understand. And you get yeah. others who only understand enough to be dangerous. I can't answer that one for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you know, you need to actually spend time uh, communicating with your stakeholders. You can't expect them to just understand. So you've got to turn this into something they understand. You've got to talk about the longer game, the value in the software, the fact that low defect rates are really important, and that we're trying to run, you know, bring those down. And that long term will give us a faster speed. We'll be able to respond faster to business. And, you have to communicate this stuff. Otherwise, why would they know it? Why would they trust you to do it if you can't even tell them that's what you're trying to do? So yeah. Yeah. You're um, going to have to go and put a sales hat on sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I think that, that kind of plays into the, the, the idea of having the uh, the authority to make the changes. Uh, you mentioned that during the talk, and, and it sort of plays into while you've kind of uh, got some buy in, you know, having the authority of that. Um, do you have any tips for 
how you can push, how you can gain that authority almost from pushing it from the, the, the team? Is it, is it, is it ma mainly just about getting your sales hat on, as you say, or have you got anything else you could sort of suggest for people? So the more open communication that you have, the better, right? So what I think happens is that we cover our, our problems. You know, we just feel like we're going to be blamed for this. So mm -hmm. the other teams will be, they won't tell everyone, this is why we have these problems. No one wants to speak about problems. And you get management as well. They're like, don't give me your problems, give me your solutions and all that kind of nonsense. So yeah. you're going to have to, you know, get through that. A lot of what we talk about in Agile is getting that openness. Where we're actually all in this together. I mean, my success is yours, right? As, as business IT What's the split? What's the difference? If, if you want these things and I can't deliver it, then we're all unsuccessful. So getting this open communication is really important. I, I think that the team has a lot more power than they think, but they always need to band together. They, they, they have to be a team vision, if you like. That, that's, that's so useful because a lot of people are sitting in the team and, you know, everybody in the team is feeling the same pain. You're going home at the end of the day and, and you're not feeling like you did a good job. You're feeling under pressure and, you know, it's, it's, it's very negative often being on a long-running support project. It just feels like there's no benefit to it. So, you know, you're all feeling that. Talk about how, how, how could you, what would you like to learn that would help make your life better? Even if you just start at that level and you say, look, we're going to give 10% higher estimates on everything we do, which is probably okay anyway, right? Because you're probably always running into deadlines. A meta developer would estimate properly. <laughs> it's, it's hard, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and yes. It's hard. Okay, so just put a bit on it, build a little fat so that first of all you can actually hit the deadline and maybe you could spend a little bit of time doing a spike, a test, an experiment to see if this could be better. And, you know, just getting that sense that actually we can make our lives better uh, could, could get the team onto a road, a road where they can improve things. So if, if you're one of the developers and you don't have a, a lot of authority, but you can motivate your team to say, listen, can, guys, can we try this? I mean, what's the harm in that? You know, start there. A lot of what I'm talking about, other than having the authority to do it, it's going to come from the team. I'm talking about the team fixing these things, you know, with a little bit of motivation, a little bit of reskilling and a, a little bit of input. But I'm not talking about taking it away from them. I'm talking about the team getting on board and, and walking this this walk do, do you so ever think it's i'm sorry i missed that just start you know yes <laughs> did, did you ever um think that it's um it is too late to change the habits of a team did, did you ever find that it's just mm -hmm. it's just hopeless that the team they don't want to know you know it's you, you, you perhaps you're brought in by management and the team are just like you know it's just rubbish <laughs> So that's the danger, coming in with the authority to make change. you first got to get over the resistance of people who feel they're going to be judged, which is why I say if you can get some early big wins and you can listen to the team, what are their problems, you'll probably get them on your side. I, don't know, I think devs love learning. Most of us love learning. Else we wouldn't be in this. We'd have dropped out long ago. So if you can harness that desire to learn, and there's a whole bunch of things, the pair programming as well. You know, there's imposter syndrome. A lot of people just don't want to pair because they, it's almost like, what do they think of me? So you've got to get over those things. You really do, and they're hard. I'm not saying these things are easier. I'm telling you to do it, but it's hard to do. I feel like something that, that has really helped me, and I remember uh, when I joined my previous team, and it, it was all a bit mm, more like mi mixed up. Uh, it, it was a very new team, and... and a lot of uncertainties. Uh, everyone was new in the job, mostly. And uh, for, for the first time, I think it was all very, mm, not, not very agile, but as soon as we went into, uh, you know, retrospectives where everyone kind of uh, warms up uh, from being a, a little ice block, let's say, uh, that was the moment when everything got a lot better. We also built relationships you know because this is also like soft skills is a very big factor also in this to kind of convince your colleagues maybe even and and initially some some people i even didn't like <laughs> in that team and and that also changed over i mean using those retrospectives and i think that was a that was a big win for the team and yeah. we got a lot better through that 
you have to refactor the people. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you can respect them well. and the relationships. You've got to make them all nice and healthy, and then you can do good stuff. I like that. That's a nice way of uh, of looking at it, refactoring the people just as much as refactoring the code. Yeah, um, the the same yeah yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a comment with the, the rewrite. If it's the same people doing the rewrite as before, if they haven't learned anything, you'll get the same thing. It makes so much sense when it's actually said out loud. It's um, it's great. Um, I got a question about pair programming. I mean, you, I mean, firstly, the obvious question is, do cats actually make good pair programmers? Um, but more importantly, um, I guess, uh, how do you how do you feel about the the relationship between pair programming and uh, and code reviews, for example? You know, did, did, is is one better than the other, or do they both sort of serve two different things? Or, or, well, the or... ones afterwards, and the others while you're doing it. I always mm. pick the one while you're doing it over the one afterwards. You know, code review is too late. So you tell me there's 15 things you don't like. So what? <laughs> I'm finished <laughs> now. <laughs> yep, fair point. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it might have its place, you know, but it's too late. Yeah. You, you can, I mean, we, we've dropped. Uh, so <laughs> I can give you some of the things that we do. And um, if we have two seniors pairing, then they don't need an outside reviewer. If they're slightly more junior, we, we sort of specify who's. So the people who would be the reviewers and would say, yes, this is fine, they can basically, as long as they've paid, we're quite happy the code can go to production. If it's a more junior level than that, or actually junior, then absolutely they've still got to have the, the whole pull request process. Someone's got to approve what the work they've done. So even though they paid it, somebody else more senior still has to look at it if it's going to production. So that's production code, obviously. And you know, it's because, I mean, we're a software company, so we're pro providing systems to clients. You know, you, you don't want to have, uh, I, 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 oh gosh, I'm much too old to be pulled up on the carpet by clients anymore and yelled at because the the 17 year old made a mistake. <laughs> it's just not happening. Yeah. So we, we have you know, mechanisms <laughs> for that, but the best of them is the one that stops the error getting in, in the first place. And that's the pair programming. It's done enormous amounts for the quality of, of the deliverable and the reskilling and the sharing of domain knowledge. I mean, I'm just such a fan. And, and yep. it's not um, 100%, right? It's, sometimes you need a break away and you go and explore a bit on your own, but it's production code that we pair on. It, it's been interesting with the last year and everything. I mean, you, you mentioned it yourself about um, how pair programming has changed. It's gone much more remote. How do you feel that that has, or rather, do you think, do you feel that that's changed? I mean, I know you mentioned that, that you've got more space for you and your cat, um, but is um, do, do you think that's changed how you actually do pair programming? And is that for the better or the worse, do you reckon? You've you got to have good habits. I mean, you can have a dominant pair uh, who never gives over the keyboard, whether you're using a tool or whether you're using a physical keyboard. So... Um, we've, we've done workshops, you know, we, we try and bring people into what we consider healthy pairing, how it should work. We swap up the pairs, we, you know, so um, I find it actually with remote, we're, we're swapping pairs a lot more because, if, you know, used to, in some of our teams, we used to have at the end of every sprint, everyone took their, their equipment under their arm and they moved desk, all right, because <laughs> they were going to pair with somebody else that week. And we, mm -hmm. It was like big shift that went on, you know, so didn't really have a hot desk set up. I mean, and, and now it's fine. I, I pop into a session and help on this, and then I pop into that session and we work on that. So it's actually a lot more fluid. Really enjoy it. Cool. I have one more question. And that, that goes a bit more in the technical direction. You, you mentioned testing, you mentioned a couple of metrics also. Uh, well, what kind of uh, tools are you using or, yeah, do, do you put it more general, uh, what other tools are you using to kind of help with that uh, avoiding code to get a legacy? Is there any anything more specific like? I'm not sure if I understood the... the yeah, like, like, like calculate the metrics, let's say, on CI server oh. and, and what, what other... Uh, techniques and, and well, you know, it, it, there's all these good principles I mean, you, you should be doing code analysis I think you know just looking at the health of your code and the complexity ratings and 
I mean, I would recommend all that stuff's quite good. But, but again, the team needs to, for me, it's a team level thing. Um, you must be careful that that doesn't end up in the hands of some manager who's now going, oh, you're making my system smaller. You know, this is bad. What I paid for all these lines of code, I want them. <laughs> so, so whatever it is that the team agrees are useful metrics, and that's very uh, environment dependent. But yes, you should be doing complexity analyses and looking at all of these things. There, there's also some tools that I really like that analyze your vault check-ins and tell you where your hotspots are, what is your busiest uh, code. And, and that should be where you spend most of your time. Because we might touch something, but we know we're never going to, you know, we're not going to go back there in years. And well, you know, we said we'll keep it clean there and we'll do just enough. But don't put as much of your heart and effort into that. But the areas that are busy, you know, there's, there's parts of the system that are usually quite highly changing. And you want to really put effort into that. You want to spend more time talking about it, designing it, considering alternatives. How do you get it better? So if you can get yourself one of those tools that, that do analyses on the, the hotspots in your vault, that's also amazing. That, that was exactly my question. I just missed to phrase it correctly. Cool. Um, do you we have can give a plug to uh, Code as a Crime Scene by Adam Tornio here. <laughs> I love that. He's got some wonderful tools. Yeah, there's lots of them out there. It's, it's, tools have their place. You must definitely use what's available to you. Yeah, it's really useful. Um, Matt, do you have any any more questions? Um, I, I have one last one, actually. I mean, um, the, one of your, again, one of the levels of the, the, the pyramid you showed there was, um, um, I forgot what you said now, tools and, infra tools and infrastructure, I think it was. The um, sorry? Yeah, the base, base, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the industry moves so fast these days, you know, so you, you can have, you know, things change, new frameworks come out, new whatever. Um, and how can you find a happy medium between keeping things up to date and not spending all your time chasing these new, the, the next new, next big thing? I don't know. I think, um, you know, mostly I'm just talking about version upgrades that are non breaking. I'm not saying you now swap from one framework to another. That's not mm -hmm. really what I mean. I just say keep up, you know, keep using the most up-to-date version of the framework you're in. You know, if you get a chance to move from, you know, .NET Framework to .NET Core and you need to, then go because you can get some benefits out of it. Uh, most of that's fairly non-breaking, or there's quite good, you know, how-tos. You know, you yeah, watch yeah, these things will break and you fix that and you move on. But it's very good for morale. There's something about working on the latest stuff. At least everyone feels that's okay. My skills are staying up to date. I'm not getting left behind. It's that sense of, you know, I'm a 10-year-old software. You know, it's going to look so bad on my CV. There's a whole bunch of things. You know, we people, we care for ourselves too, right? So give the guys something nice to work on. Let them at least get the benefits of the, the latest IDEs and, and those things because so they keep improving. Okay, they also keep getting more memory hungry. And <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, so it's just an interesting way to look at it of, um, you know, moving up to the latest version of something uh, as a boost to morale. I wouldn't oh. have um, I wouldn't have thought of it like that, but yeah, you know, it makes sense. It does matter. You see, I'm trying to say people matter. Mm. <laughs> uh, and it matters for things, you can talk about security holes and things like that in older versions, you know. So you can, you can make it matter to the business too, but it should matter most to all of us is that people matter. People do matter. I think that's a very good closing note, maybe. For sure, of course. Again, there was there was a lot of wisdom in there. Uh, thanks again, Lorraine, for, for mm -hmm. being here, for uh, teaching us, entertaining us. And yeah, have a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. Thanks, everyone. Been great. Bye. 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 OK, Matt, that's the moment we bring or we change hosts, right? Yeah, we get to bring some more people in. Let me see. Khalid first. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've noticed something so funny. Uh, we've all worn black today or some variation of it. So I'm, 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 I'm gray with a bit of green. We I'm did saying, that yesterday yeah. too, which is why I wore a different black shirt again today. <laughs> I was in blue yesterday. We yeah, I'm getting in a memo. Nobody told me it was going to be black. I'm saying was we it? it was really dark. 
<laughs> but man, that that talk is like so awesome, you know. Because I absolutely uh, loved it. Like, it, it's nice to like take a step back, think about people, and also think about like the philosophy and the psychology of building software rather than just always focusing on tech. So uh, super awesome talk. Uh, might go back and rewatch it uh, even after after this, uh, you know, uh, conference is over. So very cool. First you it's have to take as... night shift. <laughs> night shift. There's that. Uh, it's I'm almost not... as if tech is built for people. Imagine that. <laughs> it's so easy to get that, though, isn't it? I mean, so many it, things just make sense there. You know, it's like you know, upgrade to help morale. It's like, okay, never thought of it like that, but it, right. it, it, really, it really works. It's true. You do like using the, the newest things, the, the latest things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So simple. It reminds me, I need to upgrade my CV with all the latest buzzwords. Uh... <laughs> that's that's <laughs> not what was meant at all. You, you've oh, missed the point oh, completely. No. Right. I'm... In, in that case, then I, I'm I'm out of here. It's honestly, killing. <laughs> well, th thank you guys. You, you did a great job uh, again, Martin, uh, Matthias, Matt. Excellent job. So well, we've had fantastic speakers to uh, to help us along there. So it's great. Um, we will leave you to it then. You All do right. have fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, See you. Fun with you. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, Rachel. Well. Going from uh, Lorraine's talk to our next speaker, uh, it's a really nice segue because it's about, uh, Lorraine's talk is about sharing success and responsibility uh, and making sure you know, you're know you good tenants of uh, code and solving a problem. Uh, and our next speaker is actually going to be talking about uh, null and void. Uh, let's bring him, bring him in right now, uh, Stefan. Uh, I'm going to add you to the stream. Hi, Stefan. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Hello. I'm wearing a, I'm, I am wearing a, a red shirt. I hope this is not a bad omen. <laughs> that that's totally cool. Yeah, you're 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 gonna be fine. You're you're actually a nice bright spot in this dark and dreary uh, jet brains uh, color <laughs> color choice. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean. Um, if you're ready, we can just kind of give you the stage and uh, we'll wish you the best of luck. Uh, and I'm really excited to watch your talk. So thank yeah. you and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited. I guess I'm 80% excited and 20% nervous, but I guess it's the other way around. So let's get started. Today I, am, uh, I get the chance to share what I gained on knowledge about null and void in, in .NET. So a little bit about myself. I, my name is Stefan Pertz. Uh, in the web, I also go as Flashover. I like clean code and I like test-driven development. Uh, my journey so far has been, I started coding in 2020, uh, in 2020, 2008. I'm doing C Sharp since 2012. And then a year afterwards, um, doing .NET, I started out with Mono. And somewhere along the way, it's more of a stretch journey, but it has, really enforced lately with C Sharp 8 and, and the nullable features uh, became not aware, or let's say not aware wish. Currently, I am working in Vienna at Admiral and also get there a lot to play around with, with nullability lately. We're doing a lot there. And yeah, so some of my alter egos, but I will share them later on if you have any questions or perhaps suggestions. I would really like to to hear them. So we got quite an agenda now for the next roughly hour. So first of all, let's clear out the terms. What is void? What is null? In .NET, I will mainly focus about C Sharp. We heard in Urs's talk um, previously about how null is, is handled in F Sharp. So I will focus on C Sharp. Um, then we explore the nullable reference types feature, which has been added in, in C Sharp 8. And what this question mark that we add is all about. And we're going to explore the nullable context, um, what, what it looks like in the metadata, what it looks like in Waslin, um, how the flow analysis works. Um, there is a little bit of a tricky question with generics. It's not as straightforward. Um, then there's a lot of nullable attributes to really state our nullable intent. And then give a few tips about how one could adopt the nullable um, reference types for, for an already existing project. And then we have a look at some alternatives like um, the null object pattern or optionals to avoid null 
in the first place. So let's get to it. Void, what is void in .NET? It denotes a return type, which means nothing. So that a method returns nothing or also a local function. It can also be, we can also have a pointer to void, which means that we do not know the type that this pointer is referring to. Then in the BCL, we have the type system.void. However, this cannot be used in C sharp code, but it's there actually brought evidence. So if we have a look at the source code, um, it sits right there. It's a public struct void. It's pretty much empty, um, but we just cannot use it from, from our user code. So let's fire up the first demo. So I want to see we, uh, how we can use the system.void or void in general via reflection. So I have here a record type. I get every record type. We learned that in um, Chris's talk today that uh, record types synthesize a lot of methods, also the deconstruct method. We will get that. And then we want to see what return type that deconstruct method has. It should be null. So let's see if we can, can confirm this in this very test. So I comment in, in this last assert here. And it doesn't allow me. We see here, you cannot use system void. This does not compile. But what we can you do, we could use system uh, type of void. And let me run this test. And it is successful. And so this is how we could use the void type in reflection. And this is basically one of the more dynamic usages of it. It's actually the single dynamic usage of it. So let's go to now. By the way, in this presentation, I also link up uh, references. If you want to read out more, I put this later on on GitHub and link it up. So this will be all available. So what about null? Null is a reference to nothing. It doesn't refer to anything, which is now a little bit dangerous because if we try to dereference this null reference, we will end up with a null reference exception. So the default for a reference type is null. So for example, I have here this code. What it does is it prints out the length of the string if I would assign default here, since string is a reference type, it would be null. And now we get a nasty null reference exception because here the string or the text, we try to dereference it, but it points to nothing. So, so this will fail. So there is also a nullable value type. So, but the thing about value types is a value type just cannot be null. They are never null. So there is a nullable value type. We write, um, for example, int question mark, which would mean that it's a nullable type of int. So actually, if I would now write here int question mark, the question mark, this doesn't really exist. This is under air quotes, just a C-sharp feature. What this lowers down to is actually the nullable of T. So this would be a nullable of int. So nullable is a struct, cannot be null. And the encompassing type, in this case, the int, can also be not null. So I couldn't write something like, like this. This doesn't work. So, and the default value is now also, well, it's not really null, it's nullish. So the, the right line method goes into the two string and it does nothing if the nullable, if the value of the nullable um, has never been initialized. So with nullable uh, value types, we can check the has value property if this thing has a value. And if it does not have a value, and if we try to get the value, then we will get an exception. But it is the invalid operation exception, not the null reference exception as above, because the structures cannot be null. This is the, the nullable of int is just a, just a container which wraps this um, uh, destruct. So much for now. Now let's come to C sharp eight point part of 
things. So in C sharp 8, the nullable reference types were introduced and it has the same syntax as a nullable value type has. So we just add a question mark. But again, there is no question mark. Let's say string question mark. Um, this is now totally different than the nullable value type because the nullable reference type has absolutely no influence at the one time. This is just, under air quotes, a compiler feature. So what it does, it emits uh, uh, attributes um, all around the code to indicate whether this type or this instance there may be or may not be null. So basically we will never, if we get a compiled code, we will only see it by the attributes. There is no sort of, of a special type for a nullable reference type. It's still just the plain old reference type, which still could be null. It's just a compiler feature. So the compiler will generate a lot of warnings for us. And we could enforce these warnings to become errors to be a little bit more aware, but still technically we could end up with null reference exceptions. So what about this nullable context? So per default, because it's a new feature and if we would enable it, per default, all of the existing code base would have a lot of error uh, errors or warnings because they, they weren't built with nullability in mind. So that's an opt-in feature. I can do this via the nullable um, preprocessor directive and let's say enable. So now the rest of this code file has uh, the nullable context enabled. Actually, it has two nullable, nullable context Every, uh, enable, but we'll get to this just in a minute. But I still don't get any warning because I'm having here a null oblivious type. This type actually again has a text property and I do not initialize this text property. So if I run this, this will, this should fail. Ah, yes, because I wanted to de dereference actually this text property. Now it fails. So null reference exception. But we do not get any warning because this null oblivious type, oblivious means it hasn't been built with nullability in mind. So the context was, there was no nullable context. So this is this is like any code pre C sharp 8 state or when the feature is just disabled. Um, I also have a second type. I called it the null error type. And this type actually has been built within a nullable context. And now we get actually get the warning because this nullable array type now has all the annotations and the compiler knows, okay, text could be null here. And now we get a warning. So still, if we run this, we still end up with the same null reference exception, but we now get a warning, which, which tells us, hey, this could be null, perhaps we should do a null check uh, beforehand. So nullability, there is four kinds of, of nullability. Um, something could be non-nullable. So this is when I enable the feature and I have a string without a question mark, then this thing is null nullable. So if I try to assign null to this non-nullable string, I will get a warning. Then there is a nullable string. So this will be a string of question mark. I can assign null to it, but also if I try to dereference it, I will get a warning if I haven't checked it, if the compiler isn't sure that we are in a code block where it has been checked for null before. Then there is null oblivious. This is basically everything pre C sharp 8 or when the feature isn't labeled. So there are no annotations, no attributes, no nothing. So we just don't know. And then there is unknown. This is for, for unconstrained generic uh, types, uh, parameters, and when the compiler cannot figure it out if it is now null or not null, because with generics, it's a bit tricky because a generic could be both a nullable or a value type and a reference type. And there is quite a difference between the nullable value type and reference type. So let's jump to the nullable contexts. So we can, what, what I showed before in the source file, I enabled the nullable context, but there is a more fine grained option to that. So actually we could go ahead and set it for an entire project. We could set for an entire project. Um, nullable enable and this means that both nullable warnings and nullable annotations are enabled. So nullable annotations, this was for example the type before, the null aware type, this was compiled in a context where nullable annotations were enabled. And then in order to receive the warnings, I need to be in an 
warning enabled context. So I need to have both. I need to have a type which is annotated and then need to be in a, in a context where then the warnings are produced by the compiler. And we could set this on the project level and then this, this, this applies to the entire as sort of default for the entire assembly. We could also do it, for example, in a directory.build.props file to, to apply to our entire solution or to our un, an entire repository. And then we can also control this in a source file level. So what I showed, showed before, with the nullable enable, we could also do nullable disable and then a nullable restore. Where the nullable restore then restores what the project setting says. So if the project setting up here says nullable enable, then the restore would be the same as if, if I would have said nullable enable. And I can also enable and disable both the warning and the annotation context independently of each other. So I could, for example, disable just the warnings, but enable the annotations or vice versa. So let's see how this looks like. Uh, let me enable the context here, uh, nullable enable. So this enables both warnings and annotations. And now we immediately get here the warning. So this class, is, there's, an, there's a default constructor, but now this required text property, we, it doesn't have a question mark, so it's not annotated, which means it is not nullable. Um, but it here, when the class is instantiated, it actually is null, or it at least could be null. So I could set like a default, let's say string.empty. Now this warning goes away because it's ensured when this class is created, or an instance of this class is created, it's the, the required text property is not null. And down here, now we get a warning because we try to dereference the optional text without a null check beforehand. So I could go ahead and disable these warnings here with nullable disable. And now I don't get any warnings. So, but again, we need both. So if I would say enable warnings, but up here with the, with the class that I compile, I would say um, disable the annotations. Then I need to remove, then I get this compiler error because we're now in a disabled annotation context. So we cannot use the question mark, cannot use this feature. And now again, I have no warning, although here the compiler knows we are in a nullable enabled warning context, but the class we are dereferencing or using is in a has no annotations enabled. So this is null oblivious. So we don't know. And this nullable annotation, this global nullable annotation context that we set in the project goes for the entire, goes for all the C sharp files, um, except for generated code. We can mark generated code with a editor config in that directory where we say generate code or code true, but also have the auto-generated comment uh, on, on the top within should be the first comment of a file and then if it includes auto-generated it's an auto-generated file or it either starts with temporary generated file or if it ends with one of these file names this would mean it's a generated file so for those files we need to explicitly enable via the nullable enable um, the nullable context because the project wide settings are not applied there Okay, so that's about nullable context. So we now saw that there is something with when we are in a nullable enabled annotation context and something gets added to this type. So what is it? It's actually one of these two attributes. So we have the nullable attribute and the nullable context attribute. Those are compiler generated attributes. They do not live in the BCL. They will, gen will be generated for each assembly if they aren't there yet and they are internal. They cannot be used by any user code. It's forbidden to use them. This is for compiler use only to generate annota uh, annotations and then warnings from it. So we have the nullable attribute. The important part of this, this basically is a byte array. Uh, what that means, I will come to that later. And then we have the nullable context attribute. This has just a single byte. So the nullable context attribute actually refers to 
something as a default state. So if there is no explicit nullable attribute at at a type um, or at a property or some member available, then it would fall back to the whatever is the, the closest context. And the sprite can have three values. It's either zero for oblivious, which means we don't know if it's nullable or not. It is one, which means it is not annotated, which means it doesn't have a question mark, which means it is not nullable. And the other thing is it could be annotated, which means there is a question mark on this reference type, which means this is what is, yeah, this is nullable. So this would generate a lot of attributes on all our members and return types and, and parameters everywhere. So there are some optimizations in place. If the byte array would be empty, which denotes um, the, the nullable state of, of this member, um, it will be just skipped entirely. If all values in this byte array are the same, then it will be just collapsed to this one single value. If there is no nullable attribute, I mentioned it already before, then the nearest nullable context attribute is used. So the nullable context attribute is some sort of a default and the nearest wins. Um, and there if, if there is no nullable context attribute in the entire hierarchy, then there will be a nullable attribute uh, will be treated as uh, if it was initialized with, with zero. So this would now these optimizations reduce the amount of attributes that get emitted immensely. So let me show you how this looks like. So this is actually, let's go to the class, have your class in place. And this class has some methods and I want now to find out, basically what I want to do is trying to find out the parameters, if they are nullable or not nullable, or perhaps oblivious. So I want to write some reflection code, which goes through all of those parameters and finds out, okay, this one is nullable. Where this one is not nullable, this one again is nullable. And then with arrays, it's, Arrays can actually have up to two question marks because one nullability refers to the array itself and the other nullability refers to the encompassed type, for example, the string. So here we have a nullable, nullable array of strings where each string element is not nullable. And the other way around here is the array itself is not nullable, but the elements within this array are nullable. And then there's also a combination of both. So the array could be null, but also each member could be null. And if I run this application, we see that it now generates this as, as text. So basically it goes through the, through the, through the reflection uh, code and, and then generates the strings. So, so the first, let's see if this is actually correct. So we have here a nullable string and here a nullable string. So this is correct. The second one, not nullable string, and with a nullable string, and here also correct, not, not nullable string, nullable string, and the same that goes for the arrays, where we have, uh, let's have a look at this one. So the third parameter here is a nullable, a non-nullable array of nullable strings, and let's see if this is correct. Yes, a nullable array of non-nullable strings. So how would code like this look like? So this example is very limited. It doesn't handle a lot of corner cases. It only works with properties and only if in the uh, in a top level type. So, but if we want to find out reflection what's going on, we can get the names of those attributes that I showed before, the nullable attribute and the nullable context attribute. Then we do some mapping from, from the byte to a string that it gets human readable. And then I will mark, I will highlight the, the interesting parts we will try to get the nullable context. So how does this look like? From this type, we see if it has this nullable context attribute. And if it has, if this is not null, then we know this 
uh, nullable context attribute has a single byte. So we basically retrieve this byte and return it. So then we go on. We get all the methods of this type and then jump into this type method. And now we have jumped one hierarchy deeper. So we now are on a method level. And again, each method level may have nullable context, context attribute. So just the attribute that the enclosing type would also or may also have. So again, we do this check, see if this method now also has a nullable context attribute because it's the nearest to wins. So if it has, we use this one. If it doesn't have, so we already learned about the null coalescing operator for uh, in quiz session. And if it, if this method doesn't have a nullable context attribute, we fall back to the one from the enclosing type. Then we will get all the parameters and basically do a very similar game again, where we now get the nullable attribute. So this is now on each parameter, we may have the nullable attribute. So we basically get that one. And we see, so if we have a nullable attribute, we can, we know that this nullable attribute may have, this has a byte array. So if it actually, it may have a byte array or a single byte. So if the, if it has the byte array, then we basically return this byte array. But if it has only a single byte, oops, if it has only a single byte, then we just return this single byte, but wrap it also in a byte array. And now we have all the information that we need. We know the, the closest nullable context attribute, and we know if it has the parameters nullable attribute. So the first case is I only handle arrays and non-arrays. So if this array has a nullable flag, then it may have up to two entries because the element type and the array type itself. If it has two elements, we know the first element is the array, the array nullability and the second one is the enclosing, the encompassing types nullability. But it may be optimized, there may be only one, then we now both apply to both the array. Also this one single one, this one single byte um, applies to both the array and the enclosing type. And if it doesn't have the nullable flex attribute, we know we can fall back to the closest nullable context flag. And this is only a single byte, so this would also apply to both. And if it's not an array, then again, if it is a flag, we know this it's not an array, so it's a single value, so it could can only have one annotation, so we get the single annotation. But if it doesn't have a nullable flags, then we know it has the context, we can again fall back to the to the enclosing uh, context and assign this one. And then again, I the last part is then mapping, so doing doing the mapping and to, to the string, and this is then how what, what we end up with. So let me run this one more time. This is how we can analyze the attributes which get emitted. And basically the compiler is doing something, I guess I should, uh, should do the same, but with more, with more smart code. Um, but this, now this example, don't use this in production because I'm, I've missed out on a lot of corner cases. Um, in a recent API review that the .NET team is, is streaming on GitHub, there may be an API for this coming for, for .NET, uh, for .NET 6, because this may also handle much more cases. Okay, so that's how this thing looks in, in Reflection. Now I want to show you, this is my favorite part, how this thing looks like in Waslin. So Reflection is doing runtime, but if you want to do something already at compile time, then we can, then we can, for example, write an Waslin analyzer, or maybe also a, a, a source code generator that Andre showed in his session yesterday. We have several enums in Waslin that help us figure out the nullable state of something, of a symbol in this tree. So we have the nullable context options, which again, they may be disabled. One is warning, two is annotations. And if we have both, then it's 
the enable. So this this refers to the this is very the same as the as the nullable preprocessor directive that we write in our source code. So this goes for the entire ARM project. Then we have the actually I I now mixed up stuff. So this is the same that we would set on a project level. So this the nullable the nullable um, XML attribute that we set. And in a source file location, now we again have something very similar. So we can the first the first um, two bits they refer to what we would have set via the the preprocessor directive. So nullable disable, nullable enable, or nullable warnings uh, disable enable, and also annotations. And the second two bits referring to what may be inherited from the project level. Then we have now this, the nullable annotation enum is very similar to what we saw already, where zero means none or oblivious in the reflection space. Uh, not annotated is one, which means it is not nullable, and annotated is two, which means it is nullable. And the last part is there is in the syntax tree, there is a syntax node called nullable type syntax. And this means that this node in this tree is basically has has uh, the question mark. So how could we write an analyzer which is null aware? So let me go to this file. So here I have a message, so some data contract message, and I want to enforce some rules. So I want to enforce that if is required is true, then the property should be not nullable. It's required. But if required is false, or if this is required named um, argument is missing entirely, which means the default, so it's false, then it should be nullable. So if I would remove, let's say I would add here to the required text, question mark, make it nullable, now I immediately get this warning. From, from, from this Watson analyzer. And in the other way around, if I from the not required, from the optional one, remove it, then I get a warning. And now we can also write a code fix, which then basically swaps it around. So if it's nullable, I have here the change nullable um, code fix, removes it, but the other way around also adds it again. And now the diagnostics, these warnings are gone. So, and also this analyzer should also work. So if I would remove the data contract, then this analyzer should not um, or will not emit any warnings. So this is just some rules that we can set in the analyzer. So how does, I will briefly go through the analyzer. So this will look somewhat familiar then with Andre's session because this is also using the Wasland API. So I will again highlight the most interesting parts. So for the analyzer, we want to define some diagnostic. This then shows up in the editor or in the .NET build um, output. Then we want to listen to those syntax kinds. So we listen to all the class, all structs and all records where we may have the data um, contract attribute. Then on those nodes, we want to find the nullable context options, oops, but also the nullable context. So just again, as a reminder, the nullable context options is the global setting on a project level. And the nullable context setting, this is again, we can set it in the source file and we can basically, we are the preprocessor uh, directive, can set it in the source file pretty much anywhere. So this is very, very location dependent. So in order to get the nullable context, we need to put in the location of this node actually. Um, in order to find out if at this basically cursor position is the nullable context enabled and if if the is it warnings or annotations or both. Um, then we have some some early out if we are not in a nullable context. So now we get oops. Sorry for that. Now we want to get this data contract attribute. So via the compilation, we can find this attribute. Then we see, does this symbol, for example, this class, 
or a record or a struct, does it have this attribute? If it doesn't, we early out, the analyzer should not emit any warnings. Then we go through all the members. So we go, we get just all the public properties. This could be expanded to two more members. And then we check, we try to get the data member attribute and we see if this member has the data member attribute. And if it doesn't, we again early out. But if it has, we now try to find out the nullable annotation of this of this property. So this is what the user, if the user has added a question mark or if they haven't. And if the nullable, if the nullable annotation is none, which means this thing is null oblivious, so there was no context in the first place, no annotation context, we early out because we don't know. But if we do know, we can now get the is required, this named argument from the attribute and see if it is an error or if it is false. Error means it hasn't been, there is no, it's, there is no is required. User hasn't written is required equals something. Or if the value is false, then we check if it is not annotated. So this would mean if it is required, but not annotated, so not nullable, this would be the wrong way around. So this is when we report a diagnostic. And also in the other direction, if we do have, so if this is required is set to true, but this property has been annotated, which means there is a question mark, so it's nullable. So it would mean is required, but nullable, again, violation, and we report a diagnostic. And now this is how we get the warnings and how we get the quick fix, uh, the code fix. It's actually um, quite little code because what we want to do is basically just invert. If it has a question mark, we want to remove it. And if it does not have a question mark, we want to add it once this diagnostic has been um, reported because the analyzer already did all the hard work. Now the code fix only um, turns it around. So we just get the node. We see, is this a nullable type syntax? So is this something with a question mark? Then we get the element type, so the, so the nested type in it, and just return this one. So we basically throw away the question mark. But if it does have the question mark, uh, sorry, if it does not have the question mark, then we want to add it. And so we had a syntax factory. We now wrap this old declaration in a nullable type syntax. And this is basically how we get the question mark. Then we return the new document. And this is then how after um, in, in wider after we apply this uh, quick fix that gets reported via the Western analyzer. We can then say change nullable and Basically, this is how nullable looks with Roslyn, and this is how we can build nullable analyzers, nullable code fixes, but also nullable source code generators. So now we talked a lot about representations. How does this nullable context look in source code or in the assembly? So I would like to talk about the static flow analysis. So this is where the compiler comes in and tells us basically this is where the, how the compiler now generates the warnings. So this is depending on the static flow analysis. So first of all, the flow analysis, they skip conditional attributes. For example, a debug assert will always be analyzed independent of whether this is release build or not. So I would like you to keep this in mind because this is now my favorite um, kind of kind of um, telling the compiler that that I know that something is not null. We could also do it with the null forgiving operator. That is also something that Chris mentioned in in his session. Um, this is basically how we can suppress warnings. If you, as an author of the code, know better than the static flow analysis that this thing cannot be null here, then you can just apply. Uh, uh, exclamation mark, or some also refer to it as the damn it operator to, to help the compiler figure out if something is null or null, not, if something is null or not null. And then there were some, some caveats. So let's jump right to the example. Let me enable. And we will get a lot of warnings. So again, we have here a warning because we have here a constructor which does not initialize this required, this not nullable text field. 
And what if we change this to a struct? Now the, the flow analysis for structs works a little bit differently. We cannot have a default constructor here. Um, it does not emit a warning here. So if I change it back to a class again, we do get a warning. Okay, so let me just create this here. We, also, yes, because I have here a constructor, do it like this, right, because I delete the constructor, of course. Um, so if we have a default constructor, now the text could be not initialized. And so, so with a struct, this, this null initializations do not get reported because this would cause a lot of a lot of warnings. So this is not reporting any warnings. Also, arrays are not reporting any warnings. So if I would have, if I would write here string array, new string array with three elements. Now, if I would write array on position one dot length, because it's a string, this would throw, let me assign this to something. So this would throw an exception because the string has not been initialized. But for arrays, this uh, null flow analysis does, not, does also not kick in because I guess this would generate too many warnings then more than this feature would be useful. Um, also, what we need to take care of that this thing, all this nullable analysis, it may not be 100% thread safe. So, for example, um, let me run this code. We see the we have here a text. And actually, let me change. I will refresh this page to so get back to the old example. Yes. So we now have a null reference exception because we call the default constructor and text is null. So if I I could now set it, I could say instance text equals null. Actually, again, let me enable nullable annotations. Um, I could set it to, uh, not null, of course, set it to something. That's toilet text. Now we don't have any warning, but what could happen is that another thread or some other code kicks in and actually sets it to null again. So that's, I want to show you the Compile is only doing static code analysis. It doesn't really do flow analysis. And although I've set it, and we do not get any warning here, down here we do, because we set it to null. I will now suppress this warning with the damn it operator or the null forgiving operator. And now if I run it, although I have no warnings, I still get the null reference exception. So this feature helps, it helps a lot, but it's not, it cannot just cover everything because if we would do dynamic analysis, this would not be a very pleasant experience. So, how can we influence this null analysis? Basically, we need to do null checks in order to be sure, okay, this thing is not null here, so we can dereference it safely. And there is, there's a lot of null checks. So, we can compare with the equality operators, we compare something to null. We could also use the um, object equals method or the reference equals method if we compare it to null. We could also use the the base objects equals that can be overridden. Uh, also the i equality, uh, i equalable dot equals, but also the equals from equality comparers. And then since the later C sharp features, there's also pattern matching via the is operator. So all of these checks, but actually let me check, uh, show them in code. This is a little bit more exciting. So here we have now some null checks. So equality. So we can check by equality. For example, here I, I call the equals method with null, and now the compiler knows we had a static code analysis. In this context, in this in this uh, code block, record may be null. But here in this else, it is where record does not equal to null, it may not be null. And this is where we do get here a warning, but we don't get the warning here. So if I would uh, turn things around, then the warning pops down to the else block. And so this is just how we inverted it. And so this is, this is what we can do with all the null checks. Now, 
what I want to show you, and this is something that I found interesting, uh, Chris has already mentioned it. So there is a there is difference between null checks. So all of those null checks, they do contribute to the null flow analysis, but some do maybe more than just a null check. For example, if we have overridden this equals method on the type, we actually call onto the equals, and maybe this equals is not super efficiently implemented, so it may do more than basically just a null check. Or if we check via via um, via identity, so this is means that we do more of a reference equals check, so we can cast this record type to object, and now we actually do use the object's um, equality operator. So this is basically doing a reference check. So this is super efficient. If we do not do this cast, we would use the overloaded operator from the record because records do synthesize a lot of equality uh, methods and also do override the equality operators. So now we actually call into the equality operator of the record and not and maybe do more than a null check. So it's the record, uh, the, the implementation will be right, so we will not encounter any errors, but we may do a little bit more. So what I want to show you is, now I have here a class, I implemented it myself, and I implemented all the equality methods, so the win the equals, and the I equal, equalable equals, and also the, um, the, the operators, but they're all not implemented. So if I would, Run this code, I now have here a null instance. Then check it for null. This will call into this very operator. So we will get the not implemented exception. And let me give you proof. Yeah, so this test fails. It says not implemented exception. So now there is pattern matching. I love to check null via pattern matching. So if I do would write here is null instead, this now actually does indeed just a null check. So if I would run this, we now, now the test pa uh, um, passes, we don't get this um, exception anymore because we do not actually call into this overloaded operator. So let me sh show you how this looks in IL actually. So we have is null one and is null two. Let's, what am I doing wrong? So let's bring up the IL viewer. Let's build a project to get the latest view. And we see that, oops, my view has jumped. Here I am, so. Uh, and we see that if we do have this um, equality null check, we actually do call into the, the overridden equality method of the class. But if we do, we are, we are pattern matching the null check, we see there is no call to any method. So we basically just load the, the, the parameter, then we put null on it, and then we compare those two. So this is actually as close as a null check as it can get. And now there are several aspects to this. Now since C sharp nine, my favorite feature, we can also do the inverse. We can say something is not null. And I personally find this super readable. And it also has, well, it does have a performance impact. It's quite neglectable, but I do want to show this to you. So I have, we are benchmark.net, um, what you have seen in Steve's session yesterday. Um, did a bit of benchmarking and we see that, for example, the record is null check, takes like not a lot. And for example, the good old equality check, we are the equality operator on this record. Again, the record does overload the equality operators, um, takes takes longer. So it is in a nanosecond, it's sub a nanosecond. But yeah, so this is I this should depict that there is a difference between between those two. And yeah, so we can with all this way we can check for null and influence the nullable, the static code analysis. So if I find my presentation again, yes. So 
now already mentioned that there is a little bit of a tricky situation with generics. So, because if we have an unconstrained generic, this means the generic could be both a nullable value type or a value type or a reference type. And there is a difference between a value, a nullable value type and a nullable reference type because the nullable value type is actually nullable of T. It's a totally different type. But the nullable reference type is the very same type just with a few um, attributes on top of it. So this is why, for example, let me actually jump to Rider. I can show this a little bit better there. Close the IL viewer. So for example, in an unconstrained uh, generic, I cannot write, I cannot have a method which takes not a nullable version of it because this would be, it means something different. So if this would be a string, it would be a string of question mark. So it's still a string, but if it would be int of question mark, this would be actually a nullable of int. So this is a totally different type. So this is not compatible with C sharp eight. Um, the same, so there is a, since C sharp eight, there is a not null constraint. So now I cannot pass in any type parameter, which is not nullable. Now strike reverse it, which is nullable. So it must be not nullable. And here again, I cannot, I cannot write um, this in C sharp eight. So let's go down to the usage. If I have here this, uh, if I get this null, this not null type, so this not null type has the generic constraint of not null. I can pass in a string. I can pass in an int, but I cannot pass in a nullable int and neither a nullable string. So I mentioned C sharp eight twice. So because if I would switch this project, I currently have it on C sharp eight. If I would switch it to C sharp nine, there has been a relaxation to this rule. So now I actually um, is it building. So now, um, now we can actually, for example, in the unconstrained, we can actually now write T question mark and also the in the constraint uh, version, we can also do this now. It still means that this can never be a nullable of T just because we constrained it to not null. So this cannot be a null value type. This just doesn't work. Okay, so now with keeping generics in mind, there is now a lot of a lot of nullable attributes out there. Um, I will not go through all of them, but I will go through some of them. They help us um, give a bit more precision, give a bit more meaning to our to our nullable annotations. So let's start with the allow null example. For example, if we have here this property. It is not nullable, but I have code in place. So neither the backing field nor the property itself is nullable, but I do have code in place. If we had a setter, I would pass in a null value. I would set empty string, which again ensures that the backing field is never null. But still I get this warning because I try to assign to this not nullable uh, string because here we have not annotated it. I try to assign the null literal and this just doesn't work. So there is the allow null attribute. We can put this on the property and this now tells the compiler, okay, it is it is cool to assign null to it. So there's a precondition check. Assigning null to it is okay, but when we read it, when we get it, it will never be null. So then there is the same goes in the other direction. We are disabled this allow null and there is many, many more. I want to show out one more. So because all of, there's a lot of which have been added in .NET Core 3.1 and they're also in .NET Standard 2.1. And now with .NET 5, we have two more because one, one example was not really covered. So because if a field is not nullable, it needs to be initialized in the constructor. Otherwise the compiler will give a warning. If I remove that, compiler warns me, Achtung, 
uh, <laughs> sorry, um, warning, this may be null. So we can create this instance of a class, but the not nullable string, the not nullable field is null because it hasn't been initialized. Um, so we need to do it in constructor, but what if we would move this into an initialized method? So, and then call this initialized method from the constructor. So the compiler, oops, let me forward this, yes. So the compiler does not check that. Now again, we get this warning. The not nullable field is uninitialized. So we can help the compiler. We can say with the member not null attribute, we can put this on this, on this method. And we can then tell the compiler after this method has been invoked, which members are not null. And I pass in the name of the field. And now we have no warning anymore. The compiler is not happy because we told him, okay, this is after this initialized method has been invoked, the field, uh, the underscore field field is no longer null. But yeah, we could lie to the compiler. I could now remove this code and the compiler won't compile, uh, won't, won't complete, actually it does. Hmm. Also, oh, because it's never assigned, yes, but, but that's a different warning. This is not the null warning that we that we would get. Um, so we, via that, we could lie to the compiler. So we need to place these attributes with care. There's many more. I also linked up the articles. So there is a lot of details about that. So now how could we start using nullable reference types in a brownfield project? And there is two different strategies. We either go ahead and put on the project level the nullable enable, and then on every source file, the preprocessor directive nullable disable. And then we go file by file. And for every file that we touch, we could start removing the nullable disable and then fix all the warnings and annotate our code as, as every file we, we, we progress. And at the end, when we are done, then all the nullable disables are gone and we have nullable um, reference types enabled for our entire project. The other strategy is in the other way around. So we keep, oops, we keep the default disabled and then we start, one, when we start touching files, we add the nullable enable attribute and then at the end, when we are complete with all the files, then we add the nullable enable to entire project and start removing the nullable enables from every file. And there is a little bit caveat to this strategy because new files will still be disabled. So we would need to take care that new files, we add this nullable enable automatically. So these are the two strategies. And what about if we have a .NET Framework or a .NET Standard project? Because the default language of .NET Framework and .NET Standard 2.0 is language version 3.0. Uh, 7.3. So this doesn't support nullable annotations yet. So we could add, we can change the language version, but then some of the nullable attributes are missing because um, the nullable attributes I showed you before, they are available since .NET Core 3.1 and .NET Standard 2.1, but not in .NET Standard 2.0. So we need to, but there is a NuGet package we could add to still get this, get these attributes. We could also add them ourselves. So those nullable attributes, this list where I showed you two of, um, they just need to be available um, best internally. So you could add them manually, but there's packages for that. And then we still may have the problem that we do not get the annotations of the BCL because now with .NET 5, I think the BCL is almost 100% or even very close to 100% annotated. But with .NET Standard, this was pre C-Sharp 8, there are no annotations at all. So we do not get the annotations. So there is, um, you could, for every project that you have, multi-target with .NET 5, and then get for the .NET 5 target all the nullable warnings. And, but then you have to disable the nullable warnings for this .NET standard project, but just the warnings, not the annotations, so that it compiles. So this is how we could still use the feature. Um, let me briefly show this to you. So we could have in this CSProj, we could 
Multi-Target, wo auf .NET Standard 2.0 und .NET 5.0, uh, set the language version to 9.0 or at least 8.0, enable the nullable feature, and then we need some compatibility. So we need this NuGet package. It's the nullable NuGet package. We say private assets for um, all because they should not, they shouldn't be transitively um, depending on other projects or causing dependencies for other projects. It should be only for internal use for my project. And then, so we do this for .NET Standard 2.0. Uh, and then we need to disable the nullable warnings for this standard 2.0 project because there are no annotations and we would get warnings all over the place. What we could also do is, so there, there, there is a different approach as well. There is a project, I put in here the link. Um, this does ELV, IL weaving and would add to, for example, the standard 2.0 target, the notable annotations from, for example, the .NET 5 implementation. This would be an alternative. And what I would also suggest to you is to have a directory.build.props file where we, for example, I, I really like um, usually to set, in general, treat, treat all warnings and errors, but this is everything about nothing. We can say we want all the nullable warnings as errors, but perhaps only for the release mode, because then in debug mode, we can we can do some prototyping, but then on the CI, it will, if, if it, it, it would really fail if we violate any nullable rules. Okay, so we are almost at the end. Now I would like to show you two alternatives to nullable reference types. So to ensure that we are just not null. So the first thing is a pattern. It's the null object pattern. A null object is an instance of a object which is not null. So it is actually an instance, but the implementation just does nothing. And I believe we all have already used some sort of null object pattern already. For example, if we want to return, if we have a method and we need uh, an enumerable of strings, but we do not want to actually yield some elements, we could use, for example, array.empty. And so an empty array, if we for each it, it does nothing. So this fulfills the null object pattern. Um, with a task, if I don't want to do any operation, I can do a task dot completed task. Speaking of task and nullable, if we would be in a nullable enable context, never return null as a task. This is not what a consumer would expect. Um, I would not expect to have code in place to first check the task before I await it. What is okay if the return type of this task, this one could be null, but the task itself should never be null. Um, I also want to give you a very brief demo about how we could implement a null logger. So we have here from Microsoft.extensions.logging the iLogger. And so when we have a null object, um, it is best combined with the singleton pattern because this null object should not have any, any, any chain, any state or at least no observable state. So we can have a single instance of it and make the constructor private. And then all, our, all the methods should do nothing, which means um, the begin scope method should return at I disposable. So now I need a disposable, which does nothing. So down there, I have a null disposable, which does in the dispose, um, sorry, which does in its dispose implementation, nothing and then back up to the rest. So is enabled would be false. This would be closest to nothing. And the log method, it's a void method, so we can just do nothing. And this is how you could now give into a system or for a mox or whatever, we can, we could put in um, null objects and they do nothing. So there are no side effects, but still we don't have to check for now. And the last thing is Optionals. So there are several NuGet packages, and some languages have the concept of an optional value. And in 
app.net, we don't have this per, per, per default. But for example, as I talked about um, Wurstlin before, Wurstlin actually has an optional type. So let me bring up this test. This is the optional type from Wurstlin. This is actually very, very similar to the nullable of T with the difference that the encompassed type may also be a reference type, so it's totally unconstrained. And it does not throw an exception if the value, if it does not have a value. So we could have a brief look at it. So basically what it has is always the has value and the value itself. So this is very similar to the, to the nullable of T. And yes, I went render test before, they're all green. So if you want to check out this example, this is one example for an optional type. There is more, I found the library one of which actually does more than just optional value. It also could be combining different values. So it could, something could be either an orange or an apple, and then you can, can add um, lambdas on, which should be executed if it is either the orange or the apple. So there is a lot of NuGet packages out there where you could avoid null in the very first place. And this is this is everything I wanted to tell you about nothing. So now I'm wondering just which questions have I left unanswered? And if you later on would like to, if you have any feedback or any questions later on, then please just message me and I would like to get in contact with you. Okay, that was uh, that was a very, very awesome talk. Uh, there's a lot to say about nothing, which is uh, weird. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was surprised myself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you you know what's funny, you like as questions were coming in and I was thinking of questions, you were just kind of nailing the answers as we were going along. So yeah. Um I think the big one was really like with nullability, um, you know, does it uh, only offer compile time safety or do you get any runtime uh, benefits of uh, enabling nullability? No, there is no impact on runtime at all. Um, this is only a compile time feature. The compilation may take a little bit longer because those attributes are um, emitted and the null checks are doing compilation. So, but this is all during compile time. It has no one-time effect. Unlike the nullable value type, this actually has a difference in runtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Rachel, do you have uh, any questions that kind of stuck out to you? A uh, hmm. couple that came up was if it was still a good practice to do null checks, even if you have nullability enabled. This, yes, uh, yes, the answer is yes. We should still, at least for publicly ex for publicly accessible methods or publicly accessible members, we should do null checks definitely there because we do not know if the consumer also has nullable context and nullable warnings right. enabled. So they could just totally ignore it. That's still the default. Um, and, but we could omit them or actually I encourage you to omit them for internal non-public methods, because if we, especially if we have set up in our project um, nullable warnings as errors, then it wouldn't compile if I would violate any rules. So we could get, but we still, we could get rid of the null checks in internal methods, but still keep them for the publics. Yeah. So, so are you saying that when I'm writing code that I have control over uh, doing those null checks um, while um, it would be technically correct, wouldn't really offer me much and might add noise to my code base. Um, and plus we wanna catch those when we do have null situations. You kind of described uh, thread safety and those kind of edge cases that you could have uh, with nullability. So uh, you probably wanna see those as soon as possible, right? Yeah, and this would be then the, the, the compiler warning me, hey, this, this could be null. <laughs> but if I don't, exactly as you said, if, if I don't control the code, so it may be called from somebody who ignores the warning or doesn't opt in the warnings, yeah, then it's still better to give an explicit argument null exception rather than later on somewhere down below the code than a null reference exception. Yeah. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is kind of like a note I realized. Uh, you're using try.net uh, for a technical talk, and it's kind of cool to see you go through and just... Um, 
essentially have a workbook that people could probably download uh, and try out uh, your samples. Uh, I'm sure the folks at Microsoft who work on Trinet, like uh, Maria Nagaga, would love to to see your uh, presentation if she hasn't already. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely um, not common to see that. So it was quite nice. This was actually my intention. So this should be check it out. I I will I will publish this uh, to, tonight. So. Um, check it out and try it out yourself. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, so uh, I saw you gave like strategies for actually adopting nullability. Um, out of all your strategies, which one do you favor and which one should folks maybe lean towards? I personally prefer the mm -hmm. first one where we enable it for the entire project and mm -hmm. then put on all the files the, the disable enable, uh, the disable context and then file by file remove this opt out and then we more and more come to the to the complete null awareness because for, for, for new files this new files then automatically get it and I am more this is more of an aggressive solution and I like the more aggressive solution but this is my personal preference I guess it's totally too if, if a team works better with a different with a different approach than well means um, this should be the team's decision yeah mm -hmm. yeah it, it makes a lot of sense but like you said uh, it's really about the team and their comfort level and kind of what their code base is right so uh, I could definitely see all the strategies you described are very good strategies um, to getting into nullability which is very cool I, I believe so they are, they are also there from they are also from Microsoft officially suggested so they should be good. <laughs> uh, Alessandro is asking if you would start from libraries or from your main application with this. I would start from the library because if my main application calls into a, lo a lot of not oblivious code, then I later on, when I then fix the library, I still need to go back to the to the application and then go all of it again. So yeah. I would start with the library, but it perhaps also depends on the size of the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I guess in related to that note, um, if if have you seen open source authors kind of adopt nullability? Uh, I know Microsoft has gone through a lot of effort in terms of annotating uh, the framework, uh, but I'm curious if you've seen open source authors start to go through and annotate their uh, public APIs. Uh, yes, there, there's like this is like oh this is like in most of the repositories it's like oh I now introduced nullability a huge pull request. Um, for example, I'm still waiting. I'm really excited about um, X units nullable annotations. For example, um, fluent assertions doesn't have them yet. Um, I'm not entirely sure about all these nullable states, but yeah, it's it's fairly new. It's out there since uh, 2019 was that I believe. So we still have to wrap our hands around that new topic. Yeah. You know what's interesting to me about nullability? It almost feels like uh, async await uh, when it first came out, which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a, a few people started with async await, but a lot of the libraries didn't catch up. So you had this like, um, you had this dichotomy in .NET where uh, some supported and some didn't. Uh, luckily, nullability is not as a dramatic uh, shift from async await. So uh, it's easier to adopt, I think, than the mentality of tasks and async await. But it kind of feels the same to me. I don't I don't know if it feels the same to you folks. It has to hit like a certain wave of momentum <laughs> of usage. And then now like with the async await, now everything is async first. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so one day everything will be, you know, nullable, you know, aware first so. and yeah. when and when everything is now aware then there is some concept, concept that everybody has to start a new from <laughs> yes yeah and I, I know martin mentioned he's working with kotlin a lot and um you know when you compare c sharp and kotlin they're kind of both c-based languages uh, but kotlin started with nullability as one of its core tenants and in c sharp nullability is kind of like an added feature it's interesting to see both approaches kind of happen, uh, but I'm hoping with C sharp nullability we get to that critical mass that we're talking about, mm -hmm. and it becomes kind of the norm and standard um, by default. I, wa 
I wonder if it becomes default because yeah, there's a lot of code out there. So if it, if you would enforce it by default, this would give a lot of warnings mm -hmm. and make a lot of people unhappy. So I'm wondering how the default malleability will go along over the years. Yeah, well, I'm I'm excited for the future of .NET. I think with .NET six right around the corner and some of these newer features, I think it's pretty cool. And um, yeah. yeah. Oh yes, I'm already counting days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rachel, do you have any other questions for Stefan or? Uh... I think we're pretty much out of questions. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks for joining us, Stefan. It was an excellent talk. We really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. And while preparing this talk, I learned so much more about all this topic. So this was a great opportunity. And thank you for having me. This entire event is super. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Yo, good see bye. you. All right, Rachel. Well, uh, it's this is a good segue because nullability, we talked about how it's kind of similar to um, the feel of async await when it first came out. Right. And, uh, and conveniently. Conveniently, right. <laughs> <laughs> we have an async await talk coming up. Yep. So uh, I'm going to, uh, if Damir is uh, ready, uh, I'm going to add him to the stream. He looks ready. There we go. Yeah, I'm ready. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he's ready in his race car chair. So I'm guessing he's going <laughs> to take us to 60 miles an hour very quickly here. So um, yeah, if uh, if you're ready, uh, we can definitely hand over the stage to you. And uh, I think everyone's excited about this talk. So thank you definitely. for coming today. And uh, we're going to hand it off to you now. So thank you. OK, sure. Let's start. Uh, so yeah, as evident from the title of my talk, uh, the main topic is going to be the async and await keywords in C Sharp. And yeah, uh, we've been having them in the language for years, but uh, the key question that we should ask ourselves is, um, how much do we really understand what's happening when we're using those keywords? Because they seem to be pretty easy to use, but uh, there are still some gotchas. And if we don't know what we're doing, well, we could shoot ourselves in the foot. So the whole point of this talk is to uh, explain the things that are happening in the background and help you avoid those gotchas to make your code better and more reliable. Uh, so before we go into it, uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Damir Arch, and uh, I, in my full-time job, I work as a software developer and software architect in a small Slovenian company. Um, my day job mostly consists of writing code uh, for .NET in C-Sharp and also some TypeScript code in the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, but yeah, as a team, we do a lot of other tech stacks as well. Uh, in my spare time, I really love to uh, blog about the things I'm doing, write articles about it, speak about them um, at conferences and uh, uh, local events and so on. And yeah, because because of all this uh, activity, I also got awarded a Microsoft MVP uh, title uh, for developer technologies. Uh, and yeah, C Sharp is part uh, of that uh, specialization. Uh, on a side note, yeah, I also wrote a book about uh, C Sharp. It's uh, not, let, let's say it's not the most recent anymore, but yeah, the, the things are still true, just uh, there's no mention of the latest features that came in C Sharp 9 and are coming in C Sharp 10. Um, if you will have any questions after the event, you can probably get me on Twitter, although I'm not really active there, but uh, I tend to see the mentions and answer them uh, when I see appropriate. So that's probably the best way to get in contact with me if you want to. Uh, so let's look at what are we going to uh, talk about during this talk. So uh, just to get everyone on the same page, uh, we're going to start with some basics. And uh, this is going to include, uh, a basic, uh, let's say, a basic explanation of what async and await are, uh, how they work, and uh, what's actually happening with the threads in the background. And it's kind of going to lay the foundations for all the other topics so that it will be easier to understand them. Uh, from here on, I'm going to move on to the uh, async white topic. Um, it's kind of a 
pet peeve of mine because I see it still being used a lot. And uh, I guess that that's because it doesn't seem as dangerous as it could be uh, if you're using it. So I'm kind of going to explain uh, what can go wrong if you do it and uh, how you should do it to avoid all these problems by just not doing it. So no async avoiding your code uh, is a great approach. Uh, the next topic will be um, the the methods that kind of lie about their synchronous or asynchronous nature. Uh, these uh, are also a potential danger at could link to bring to uh, deadlocks in your code. So we're going to take a look at an example of that and see how they can be fixed. And then at the end, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit uh, the topic of the threat synchronization. Uh, so the let's say the key method that's related to threat synchronization in uh, tasks and the async and the wait uh, async and the wait keywords is the configure wait. So we're going to explain uh, what this method does uh, and when to use it and when not to use it uh, because yeah it can give you some great powers but yeah you should be aware of uh, what's actually happening if you use it. So. Let's say that this is kind of enough for starters. And um, let's start with a, a simple demo for start uh, to see actually why we want to use uh, asynchronous methods. So why not just with, stick with synchronous ones and then uh, compare how the uh, code executes when we use one or the other. So let's switch uh, to our sample and run it. Uh, so this is going to be a really small sample application that's uh, going to show you uh, what exactly is happening uh, when we uh, call an asynchronous or an asynchronous method. And in both of, both of those cases, uh, what the application does is it kind of simulates a long running IO operation, or it could also be a long running CPU intensive operation, which uh, makes the uh, the thread busy, and uh, to see how the behavior changes based on whether we're using a synchronous call or a, an asynchronous call. So if we do it synchronously by clicking this button, we see that the application itself stops responding for a little while, and only afterwards we see that the focus again moves. And also, if we try it again, if we try to move the window in the meantime, it doesn't happen immediately, only after the uh, synchronous method stops executing uh, the window response to my action. So this really isn't a very nice uh, experience for the user uh, because if this takes even longer, for example, than, the, than in my uh, sample program, here it takes just half a second. But if it would take longer, uh, the user would actually think that the application froze or deadlocked or something and uh, could even decide to shut it down on or force it closed because it doesn't respond anymore. On the other hand, if you're doing the same with an asynchronous uh, method call like this, we can see that in the meantime, uh, the application is responding just nicely. So the focus is moving. If I try it once again, I can even move the window and everything is fine. Uh, the way we see that something is being done in the background is this processing label that's being shown uh, while the background process is being busy. Uh, so I think we, uh, from looking at this, we can just conclude that, yeah, asynchronous is better for user experience. So now let's compare what's actually happening in the background. So to do that, uh, let's just switch back to our slides and look at the first example. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the first synchronous button, what was happening? So first of all, this is kind of a simplified uh, display of the method uh, that is running in the background uh, in that sample application. So basically what it does, we can see it uh, uh, show some text that the processing is being done. And that text actually didn't show, show up at all in the application for the synchronous method, although we have set it up. Uh, then we simulate the processing or the I operation by doing a thread slip call, which makes the thread busy. And then once we're done, we clear up the text. Uh, 
So let's just move through this and look at what's happening. So at the moment, when we click the button, we invoke the method. And the method keeps executing until it reaches this long running thread.slip call. When it reaches this one, it stays here for a while. That's why I draw this red dot here. And uh, actually, what is being done is the thread is kept busy, although it might not even process anything because it's just waiting for the I/O operation to complete. And only when this I/O operation completes, the execution uh, continues and moves to the end of the method. And when we complete with that, we give back control to the main thread. So the key part of this is that for the whole time of this method call, including that half a second long sleep period, uh, in our case, the main thread is busy with our method. So in that time, instead of doing anything else, it just uh, waits for our operation to complete. And that's why it can't process the messages that are incoming from the operating system, for example, to uh, to re-render the window with uh, the moved focus or to actually move the window when I moved it and so on. So by doing that, we're kind of bad neighbors and we don't allow anything else to happen in the application while we're doing the processing. On the other hand, uh, with the asynchronous method call, uh, we are kind of much more well-behaved. So again, when we click the button, we invoke the method. Uh, this method is asynchronous. And until we reach the, uh, the key part that's taking a long time, uh, everything behaves the same. Now, in this case, to simulate an I operation, I'm using, an, uh, let's say, a waitable uh, implementation of a sleep or wait. That's the task.delay. And what this one does is uh, it does the waiting in the background. So when we invoke this method, and use the await keyword with it. Uh, what's happening is in the background, uh, the execution doesn't continue all day, un until the sleep period expires. But in the meantime, the control is given back to the main thread so that it can process anything else that's, be that's happening. So that's why uh, when I was moving the mouse, we saw the focus, uh, we could move the window and so on. Now, when finally uh, this, uh, time expires, or on the other hand, in the real program, when the I operation completes, uh, what happens is there is a message being sent to the main thread that the uh, operation is complete and the, uh, the method can continue executing from here on. So when this happens and the main thread processes everything else that uh, it might have in its queue, uh, it jumps back in, uh, to the point where it was. And from here on, continues executing to the end of the method, and then quits the method. The key difference in this case is that uh, unlike uh, the synchronous method, uh, we didn't block the main thread for the whole duration of our method. And if uh, this method takes a long time, it doesn't really matter because most of the time, the main thread was available to do other things. So for this half a second here in between, when we were waiting for the I operation to complete, the main thread just kept doing its job like it would normally do. And uh, the main thread was only busy for those short periods uh, before this method was reached and from this method to the end of the uh, method. Uh, so also the important detail is uh, this status text that I was uh, setting actually managed to have to be rendered in our application because without uh, giving control back to the main thread, it didn't have an opportunity to do the rendering and to update its UI. So although in the synchronous method, I have also set up this text, it never showed up. But here, because as soon as we reached this task.delay, the control was given back to the main thread and the main thread could draw this uh, text. And once again, when it continued, it could again uh, remove this text from the window. So. All, the, all of this that I have explained seems kind of simple. And probably you think to yourself, OK, I understand all of that. Of course, that's how it works. The important part here is that just by knowing all of this, uh, we will be able to explain all the other behaviors that can uh, kind of end up in bugs in our asynchronous code. So all of this 
basic sim simple they are actually a key to understanding everything else that's happening in asynchronous code so let's just quickly move on to uh, the next example and see uh, how async white can actually kind of break our asynchronous code uh, although at first sight it might seem that it works as it should so let's go back to our samples switch to the second sample and run it okay let's move it to the right window okay so before i start clicking the button let me just quickly explain uh what i'm doing here again it's just a simulation of the uh of let's say a real program that does asynchronous work. So once again, uh, I'm simulating the long running asynchronous operation, an I operation in this case. And what I pretend uh, to be doing here is just getting some data from a remote, I don't know, from a remote API, for example. So every time I click here, I let's imagine we receive back a message and as a result of that, I show the number of messages received at the bottom. So each time I click on it, I get a message and add it to my collection of received messages. And even if I click quickly or anything, everything seems to be working just fine. So every time I click, we increase the number by one. Now, uh, when I click this checkbox, I change the flow of my uh, uh, of my code uh, so to simulate a slow network. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the asynchronous uh, API call that I'm doing is not going to be completed that soon, but it's going to take a little bit longer. And that's how it usually happens in the real world, uh, especially if you're not on a wired network, but on a Wi-Fi or even a mobile network, then it's kind of expected that the network might not be all that reliable and it might take longer. And now, at first it seems to work okay, but then suddenly an error happens. So we look at the code, but when we get zero instead of a specific number, it means, okay, somewhere something went wrong. The data that we expected to receive, we didn't actually receive it. And then I try again and it seems to work again. And it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work works, doesn't work. So it seems to be really unreliable. So when this happens in our real applications, it can be really unfortunate because typically this is not happening in our development environment, but it's happening to our customers and it's not even happening to them every time. And yeah, it's really difficult to reproduce and fix. Now things can go even worse from that. So instead of just simply uh, having a slow response that actually ends up uh, being received at some time in the future, uh, we could actually receive a, an exception instead of that. So imagine that instead of receiving uh, the requested response from the API in some reasonable time, uh, we end up receiving a timeout, which ends up being an exception. So yeah, to, to handle that, what we do is, of course, we add a try catch block to our code so that we uh, catch that exception. And yeah, okay, we can handle that and show something to the user. But well, although we can do that, it can still happen that the exception will not be caught as it should be. So just before we go back to the slides, let's take a look at the code to show that it really seems that the exception should be call, uh, caught. So let me just open up this i think that would be a good location yeah and close down this so let's take a quick look at the code so we have a try catch block here and inside this try catch block we are calling the download messages method and this download messages method uh, in turn calls the get messages method which uh, does the call to the api and this is the method through the exception and Although everything seems just fine, well, this try catch block didn't catch the exception and didn't show the inception message. Instead, the application crashed. Well, we could prevent this crash still by having a global error handler, but yeah, I don't have it uh, for a purpose just to show how we might think that we will catch the exception, but we don't. So let's move back to our slides and take a look what's happening in this case. 
so as we are already used to from the previous example, uh, this is what's happening here. Mm. We are having a simple method which uh, has a try catch block, calls the download messages method, and this download messages method then in turn calls the method that calls the API. So let's just look how the execution goes. So first, when I click the button, we invoke the method. Then we eventually get to the download messages method. And of course, this invokes the download messages method. Inside this download messages method, we've seen that there's more code to it, but the important part is the call to the asynchronous method to get the messages from the API. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're calling this method. And as we've already explained uh, in the previous sample, uh, when we call this, the method continues executing in the background and eventually it will notify us that it completes. But on the other hand, the execution doesn't immediately go back to the main thread, but it goes back to the uh, top level method which invoked these download messages. Uh, this is happening because the download messages method is not awaited. So we move on to the next method in line and call this task.delay. The important part here is this task.delay is not, uh, let's say, it's not a simulation of some other operation, but it's something that a developer might actually add to his program uh, in order to fix some issues with reliability that he has encountered. And yeah, I know you might roll with your eyes, but uh, trust me, I've seen this more than once. I've seen this many times, maybe not in such a obvious way, but yeah, uh, sometimes random delays somewhere in asynchronous code somehow seem to fix issues which we are not able to fix otherwise. So if we do that, what happens at this point, again, is uh, the execution of this task.delay method continues in the background. And finally, we give back control to the main thread. And now, actually, this is where the problems start. So what can happen now? There are two options. Uh, as you can see, we have two methods that are executing in the background. And now, whenever one of those two methods uh, completes, it's going to notify the main thread that it has completed, and the main thread will be able to continue with its, with its execution. Now, uh, if it happens that the download messages uh, method with its get messages async call is the first one to complete, everything is going to be fine because this one is going to uh, execute till the end, the messages field will be initialized correctly, and the uh, on get data method uh, will have the messages dot count initialized correctly when finally the task dot delay completes. On the other hand, if it uh, happens the other way around, so the test dot delay completes before the download messages method, well, in this case, we have a problem because uh, we haven't initialized the messages value uh, in the download messages method. So when we inspect that value inside this top level method, it's not set correctly. So what we're seeing here is something which is a typical case of race condition, as we call it. So it's a situation when we have two operations which actually depend on each other. So the on get data depends on the download messages being complete and initializing the messages field, but they are not synchronized in any way. They just ran in parallel and whichever ends first, this one is going to continue first. So this is something that we will need to fix. And I'm going to show you how, but just before we do that, uh, let's take a look at the second problem which we have encountered, that's exceptions. So when looking at this code, as I've already mentioned, it seems that the try catch block should do its job. And instead of the application uh, crashing, uh, the status message should be set to the exception message, but that's not what happened. So let's explain it why that's the case. So I've just skipped to the point where we have uh, the two asynchronous methods running in the background. So the task.delay method and the get messages async method. And 
at this point, uh, when a timeout happens, uh, it's going to be here. So an exception is going to be thrown by the get messages async method, and the main thread is going to be notified about it, and uh, the, we will be at this point in the code with an exception that starts to bubble up. So what happens with the exception, it kind of try, if it isn't handled in the method where we currently are, it's going to uh, bubble up uh, across the call stack until it finds a suitable uh, handler in a try catch block. And if that doesn't happen, well, in that case, uh, we either have the global error handler or the application crashes. So uh, in our case, what we would expect to happen is this exception should be thrown up uh, to the uh, top level method and the top level method should catch it. But uh, since the top level method has already moved on from the download messages method and is already at the task delay method awaiting it to complete, it's not really expecting anything from our download messages method. So if a method, if a, an exception is thrown here, it's not going to catch it. It's just going to bubble up further. So because of that, this try catch block, which we have so conveniently placed here, it's not going to do its work. So what should we do? Let's see how to fix the code. So here is the fixed code and let's just go step by step to see what the changes are. The most important one is here in the inner method. So previously, we, this method was uh, declared as async white in its signature. And what we've done instead is we changed the void type to task type. And just to follow the conventions in the uh, .NET ecosystem, we added async at the end of the name. But this part is actually optional. It would act, of course, the same even if we didn't do the rename. So by doing this, what we have allowed, allowed is to actually be able to await this asynchronous method. Because an async white method, although it does have the async keyword, uh, only allows to await other asynchronous methods inside that method. But on the other hand, the calling code cannot await it. But by changing the void to task, we actually added the option to await this method. And now we can do await here in the top level method. Uh, of course, we rename it just to uh, match the new name of the method. And also, now we don't really need this random delay anymore because uh, we are actually waiting at this point until the inner method completes and continue execution afterwards. And there's no need to synchronize these two methods in some other way. So let's see what's actually happening in this uh, let's say modified and fixed code. So uh, it starts the same way as it was before the fix. So uh, we click the button, uh, we invoke the method, we reach the download messages async method. We go into that method, we get to the get messages async call, and this call is asynchronous. That's why we're awaiting it. And this means that it's going to continue executing in the background. But unlike before, the execution doesn't continue back in the top level on get data method. Uh, instead, the control is given back to the main thread. And the main thread is going to do its job until this inner call to get messages async completes. And when this happens, it will return back to here to the point where it started awaiting and continue execution from execution from here, complete this method, and only then move back to the top level on get data method. So unlike before, where the top level method continued its work before the inner method was done, now it actually waited here or awaited here and uh, will only continue when the inner method is complete. And because of that, we can now be sure that this reference to the messages count is going to be properly initialized uh, because we know that this inner code has completed. So the issue that we had previously is gone. And yeah, of course, from here on, what's going to happen is 
yeah, the method is going to continue executing uh, till the end, and then the control is going to be given back to the main thread. Uh, as a side effect of this fix, uh, the error handling or the exception handling uh, also starts working as expected. So let's think about this. So first, uh, where was where was the exception thrown? The exception was, th was thrown in this point, so at the get messages async call in the inner method. And as we've seen in the, let's say, positive scenario, also in the case of exception, when the exception is thrown from this point, it's going to be returned back to the on get data outer method. And conveniently, this outer method now actually is waiting here. So it expects to receive a result. Instead of that, uh, an exception bubbles up, and this exception can be handled by the try catch block which we have. So uh, there, are, there are no unhandled exceptions, no crashes. This code which we have written will actually update the status text with the details of the exception that happened. So this problem is solved also. Before we move on, uh, one more thing to mention. Uh, this code can actually be improved even further uh, if it was just to do the thing that we see here, because what we're doing now is we're assigning the uh, result from the get messages async call to a local field messages. And then we're reading the value from this local field again in the top level method. So instead of doing that, we could just simply return uh, the uh, messages which we receive uh, from this method and then assign it locally here. So we would have a task of a list of messages, and this would be returned to the top level method. And here we would use it directly. But this doesn't really affect the flow of the execution. It's just, let's say, better uh, pattern of uh, doing such calls because a method should return the value instead of just assigning it to a local state uh, because having less state is always better. Okay. That's about async white. Maybe one more thing. Uh, here, you can see that I still use async white, although I'm saying don't use async white, use async task. Uh, the difference is that the on get data method is actually a event hand, an event handler. And an event handler uh, doesn't really have an option to return a task. Uh, it can only be either a, a synchronous method which has a signature of white, or it can be an asynchronous method, which still returns white. So it's just an async white method like this one. Uh, so first of all, we don't have a choice and we can't do async task as we should. And on the other hand, uh, this isn't really a problem because we need async task when we try to synchronize multiple methods and uh, event handlers don't really need to be synchronized because they are just called from somewhere in a, in a fire and forget manner and they aren't expected to return anything or nothing is actually uh, expecting them to complete and give back some kind of a result. So because of that, async white is just fine in this scenario. Moving on. So the next demo will do We'll create a deadlock in our application with some really innocent looking code. So let's just go to our third example. Let's close all of this and switch to demo three and run it. Okay, let's move it to the correct screen. So. Yeah, I have kind of a button that gives everything away. So when I click this button, it seems like uh, the application temporarily stopped responding, but that's not what happened. The application actually permanently stopped responding. So I can't really move the window anymore. I can't close it. I can't do anything with it. So the only thing that's left to the user is to kill the application. Uh, and yeah, you could do that uh, through task manager or here in the development environment, I just kill it. Uh, but yeah, the important part, let's look 
at the code that caused this. Because at first sight, I'm pretty sure most of you wouldn't expect it would cause a deadlock. So these are the methods. Uh, again, simplified a little bit to be easier to follow that are being used uh, behind this deadlock button. So at the top level, we have a, an on deadlock event handler. And this event handler calls an asynchronous method, which does some processing in the background and returns some kind of result. And yeah, it waits for this result because it's not an asynchronous method, it's a synchronous method. And to get the result of the task, it can call its result property. And in this asynchronous method, I don't do anything particular. So what I'm doing is, again, I'm simulating a long running uh, operation, let's say an I operation that gets some data from somewhere and return a result. So doesn't really look that suspicious, I think, but let's look at what's actually happening at the background and why this results in a deadlock. So again, uh, when we click the button, we enter the, we, we, we invoke the method, start executing it, move on to the get async method and the get async call invokes the asynchronous get async method. So we end up here. And we, as we're already used uh, in asynchronous methods, we reach the asynchronous call where we use the await keyword. And at that point, the execution continues in the background. And uh, the control is given back, first of all, to the parent method. And now because the parent method isn't really awaiting anything and uh, which would in turn mean that the control is given back to the main thread. Uh, it just waits for the result. So it requests, okay, please give me the result. So it's waiting for this to happen and it will ex continue executing when this happens. So this result property, uh, if you don't know about it, is actually behaving more or less the same as the wait uh, method call on the task does. So what it does is it waits for the task to get to its completed state. And when that happens, it returns the result because the before the task is completed, the result is not really available. Uh, so everything seems okay till now. So what happens now eventually? Okay, maybe just show you. So we're here, we're waiting here for the result to be returned. And now the next step is uh, our long running IO operation finally completes and notifies the main thread that it's done so that the main thread can actually continue executing it till the end and return the value. So this is what should happen. But yeah, the arrow is uh, drawn in red because this can't happen. Why? Well, the main thread is busy. Main thread is here in the on deadlock method waiting for the result. And this long running I operation, let's say, finally got the result and now the method wants to return the result, but there's no thread available to return this result. So uh, the inner method is waiting for the main thread to be available so that the method can continue and return the result. On the other hand, the main thread is waiting for the get async method to return the result, which is a typical deadlock scenario. So we have two different actors, each one waiting for the other. and this is never going to be resolved. And yeah, as you've seen, the only way to uh, resolve this problem once it happens in an application is just to kill the application and that's it. And yeah, and the application doesn't really process anything or whatever, so the application isn't really busy, the CPU isn't busy, but just, yeah, it stops executing because uh, the two methods wait on each other. Now, the key reason why this happens is that we try to create, or maybe let's say differently, we try to call an asynchronous method from a synchronous method without using the await keyword. And because of that, we kind of ended up with this unfortunate scenario which we really want to avoid. So how do we fix this? Well, pretty simple. Uh, first of all, we need to get rid of the result uh, property because if we want to 
use the result or if or saying differently if we use the result property we actually wait for the asynchronous method to complete and we don't want to do this so we need to get rid of this call and get the result of the get async method in some other way and this other way is of course to use the await keyword in front of it but in order to use the await keyword in front of it we need to make our method asynchronous so we need to use the async method in the calling method so what this kind of indicates is that the asynchronous methods in a way are viral so what that means is in order to call an asynchronous method we need to be in an asynchronous method and now if there were another method trying to call this on deadlock method it would again need to be asynchronous and of course in that case this method wouldn't be async wide but it would be async task but because it's an uh an event handler this doesn't need to happen so essentially what we need to remember is whenever we want to use an asynchronous method we need to do it from another asynchronous method and this just results in all the methods in the call stack becoming asynchronous all the way up to the actual entry point and this entry point typically in an event driven application is going to be an event handler in other types of applications like console applications, it's going to be the actual entry point of the console application. In a web application, it's going to be a web request. So whatever the entry point is, it's going to have to be asynchronous in order to be able to call asynchronous method in a safe manner. Now, before moving on, let's just uh, explain or look at what's actually happening in this method uh, so that the uh, deadlock is actually gone. So uh, all the way until the asynchronous method call, the task delay call, everything remains the same. So the main thread invokes the event handler. In the event handler, we get all the way to the get async method call. This invokes the other method and we get to the asynchronous uh, method call. Now here the changes start because now instead of so first of all we still continue executing the delay method in the background but instead of returning back to the calling code we give control back to the main thread because the calling code also has the await await keyword which means that it also gives up or yields control to the main thread and now when finally this task got delay call completes the main thread is available so that it can actually continue executing the uh, inner method, the get async method, complete it, and return the value that's being returned. And then uh, execution continues in the outer calling code, the on deadlock method, and then this method completes and gives the control back to the main thread. Uh, so as I've said, yeah, don't try to fake or to create fake synchronous methods. Be honest about it. So if you need to call asynchronous methods, make your methods asynchronous. And uh, this way you're going to get rid of a lot of potential problems. Uh, and yeah, the most common one that will happen if you try to do that is you'll end up with a deadlock. Uh, now, there are scenarios in which you might not be able to do this because you don't have full control uh, over the calling code and you cannot make that method uh, asynchronous. So if that happens to you, there are ways to uh, still make asynchronous calls safe. And the way to do it is the configure await method. So by using configure await, uh, where it makes sense or where it is appropriate, you can actually avoid uh, having the asynchronous method methods making have, having them be completely viral. So being able to only call them from asynchronous methods by using configure await, you can safely call them from synchronous methods as well. So uh, let's just look at the code, uh, what we can do. And first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to fix. Uh, our application, which deadlocked. So let's just open up its code. So here is the unsimplified version, which is really similar to that one. So what we have here is, yeah, we have the 
uh, how to get async, and here we're invoke in here we we're invoking it uh, synchronously, and now here in the uh, uh, our asynchronous method we uh, return the value. So in order to fix this problem, uh, what we want to do is we want to use the configure wait keyword, which as I've already given away. So we're going to do it like this. So we're saying configure wait. And now configure wait uh, has a parameter. And as you can see, this parameter is named continue on captured context. And it says true in order to attempt to marshal the continuation back to the original context captured or otherwise false. This kind of seems complicated. But the thing to remember, first of all, is the default value for configure await is true. So if you don't call configure await, it's the same as if you do true. So this is actually the default behavior. So yeah, as I've said, since we, can, we are able to fix the problem by using configure await, of course, the only way to do it is by setting it to false. And before explaining it further, let's uh, just run this and look that the check that the problem is actually fixed. Uh, so let's run the condition. Wait till it starts up. Okay, here it is. Move it to this window, and now I'm going to click the deadlock button. Seems to have deadlocked, but yeah, it didn't really. So the thing that you can notice is it's still kind of locks for a moment, but continues ex execution afterwards, right? So, okay, let's go back to the code and explain what's happening. So this complicated explanation of configure await does actually means that whenever we use true, uh, to explain it a little bit simplified, what's going to happen is the execution is only going to continue on the thread which originally invoked this method. So, because in our case, uh, the task.delay method was invoked by the uh, main thread, uh, the default behavior is that when it finally completes, the continuation is going to be done on the main thread. And that's the reason why uh, we actually deadlocked our application, because uh, the main thread wasn't available. And now by setting this to configure it false, we change the behavior uh, by allowing uh, a different thread to execution. So what does that mean? First of all, if possible, then just the same thread that actually took care of uh, this asynchronous method is going to continue the execution. Or when that's not the case because that task was actually an IO task and didn't have a dedicated .NET thread, in that case, just the first available thread is going to be used. Doesn't really matter. Uh, it could be the main thread, but more likely it's going to be some other thread from the thread pool, which is going to continue ex ex execution. And that's uh, if I just run the application for a short while again. So that's actually what's happening in our case. So uh, as we've seen, when I click the deadlock button, the application stops responding for a short while. And that's because the main thread is busy. And because the main thread was busy, uh, the continuation was being done by some other thread. And when this finally happened, the main thread got the result back. And when it got the result back, it can continue execution and then finally process all the other properties. Now, uh, the way I explained it now, it might seem that the um, uh, the configure false is some kind of a, let's say, magic wand, which just solves all the problems. Uh, so I have another example here to show you that that's not the case. So let's just switch to the final demo. And maybe let's just run it first, and then we'll look at the code that's happening. So in this case, uh, it's a variation on the very first demo. So I have a method which calls an asynchronous method. And yeah, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm actually calling the uh, asynchronous method with configure wait false. And this causes my application to crash. So let's look at the code, what's actually happening. So if we go here, let me just, extend this a little bit. 
Uh, the best location would be to go here. Okay, close down this. And okay, let's just close the window to get rid of it. So yeah, as I've said, I have a, uh, I have an asynchronous method inside it. I'm awaiting another, let's say, long running IO operation. So task.delay. And I'm using it with configure await false. And here the exception happens. So maybe let's just go back to the exception is and to explain it a little bit uh, better. So let's move here, put it up here, call async and the exception. So the exception text is the calling thread cannot access this object because a different thread owns it. And the line at which uh, this exception was thrown, okay, not here, but here. So the line is thrown, the exception was thrown at this line. And what's happening? Well, the problem is we're trying to assign a text, so to change the appearance of a control from another, so not by the main thread where the wheel was created, but by another thread. And that's something that the uh, none of the UI frameworks which we work with actually allow, no matter the operating system. So this is a typical case where we cannot afford ourselves to uh, just switch to any other thread. So let's go back to the slides and explain this in a little more detail. So to explain all of this, the important part is to understand the concept of a synchronization context. So uh, to explain it, let's just start with something that those of you who've uh, written code for Windows Forms applications and WPF applications uh, are probably familiar with. So those two actually had, so the Windows Forms had a begin invoke method on the control and the WPF has a begin invoke and invoke async on the dispatcher. And what these two methods do is they actually allow us to switch back to the main thread or to the thread that actually owns the UI. And this is something that uh, we are forced to do until or before we had the async and the wait keywords and the tasks and so on. Uh, when async and the wait were introduced, the synchronization context was created as an abstraction layer on top of these concepts from WPF and WinForms. And it's not really restricted to those two. Even uh, web applications, for example, ASP.NET have the same idea. So uh, while in the uh, desktop applications, the main thread is the one that uh, has control over the UI as the, and is the only one that can actually manipulate the UI. On the other hand, the uh, web applications, in the web applications, the, the calling thread is the one that actually holds the, the details about the web request. So the HTTP context, which has all the information of, of, about the web request. So in order to access those, we need to return back to the same thread. So for all those uh, application models, we have synchronization context. And the synchronization context has two important members. The first one is a static property named current, which always points to that main thread uh, that we can return to. So in the case of desktop applications, that's the main thread that owns the UI. In the web applications, that's the thread that uh, what the request was originally issued to. Uh, now, moving on from that, uh, the synchronization context is being used by the ASIC and the wait keywords uh, to know where to continue execution. So when we use uh, the await keyword, uh, and when the invoked asynchronous method completes, the execution is going to continue on the current synchronization context, which in, the, in our case, where we always had the desktop applications, means the main UI thread. So uh, knowing that, uh, the important question becomes, when should I use uh, the configure await method and when should I not use it? And so the, the simple answer is if you're in an application, you should probably always use it. So if you're writing the desktop application, if you're writing a web application, uh, you probably should always be aware of the 
uh, specific uh, thread on which uh, the UI is running or from which the web request was received, and you should return to it. On the other hand, if you're writing libraries for general use, then typically you don't really need to know that and be aware of it because those libraries are going to be used from different uh, application models and they don't really need to be aware of all of that. So the application itself will need to take care of that and the internal code in the libraries can just use configure wait false and allow the scheduler to continue the execution of asynchronous method on whatever thread is available. Uh, this will result, this will have several positive impacts. First of all, it will mean less switching between the threads, which is a performance benefit because, uh, instead of switching back to the main thread after every async method call, it's not going to happen. And it's only going to happen when the execution goes back to the, uh, application code. Uh, and on the other hand, the main thread is going to be available for a longer time because it's not going to handle those uh, continuations of asynchronous methods. So it's going to be available to do other stuff. So for example, process messages in a desktop application. So this is kind of a good rule of thumb. Uh, but yeah, if you're in an application and in a spe specific scenario where, for example, you need to call an asynchronous method from a synchronous method and don't have a different choice, well, in that case, you could use it. But yeah, make sure that uh, before you try to interact with the UI again, you switch back to the main thread. And for that, you could actually use one of these old methods. So manually post back to the synchronization context or something like that. So yeah, that's kind of the way to do it. So we're kind of at the end of this talk and uh, let me just uh, reiterate the key takeaways that I want you to uh, remember from this talk. Uh, the first one is, yeah, avoid using async white whenever possible. So unless you really need to use it, for example, in an event handler, don't use it. Use async task uh, because this will allow you to synchronize your asynchronous methods and uh, kind of prevent you from uh, encountering strange bugs because those different asynchronous met methods are not going to be synchronized. Uh, the next topic is don't fake methods. So in my case, uh, I created a synchronous. I created one synchronous method to call an asynchronous method, and it ended up badly. And uh, similar issues will happen even the other way around. So only create asynchronous methods if you really have asynchronous method calls. Don't try to fake asynchronous methods by spawning tasks because that can end up in other problems as well. So be honest about your methods and make them asynchronous when you have asynchronous code and make them synchronous when you have only synchronous code and it's going to work best. And uh, yeah, the finer advice, uh, try always thinking about what's actually happening when you're using async and await. So maybe not in as much detail as this talk went to, but yeah, consider what's going to happen, think through the scenarios. And in if you're about to do something weird, or if you're trying to integrate some code that doesn't, that still doesn't uh, support async and await itself, then yeah, do the necessary work, think it through, uh, write a test if necessary and make sure that you don't get strange bugs like uh, race conditions, deadlocks, and other problems because uh, it's better to find those things early. Otherwise, you'll regret it later. But yeah, if all that seems too much for you, just remember one thing, the first item in this list. Only use async void in event handlers, avoid using it everywhere else. And I think most of your problems will be gone, at least based on the code that I've seen uh, through years and years of uh, reviewing uh, asynchronous code and troubleshooting asynchronous code. And yeah, if you want to, oops, sorry. If you want to learn more about it, here are a couple of resources. Uh, the first one is a link to uh, my GitHub repository with the sample code that I was running here with all four sample applications. There are 
.NET Core based WPF apps, which you can run and try out yourself and inspect the code and see how I'm actually faking those uh, long running operations. Uh, but yeah, if you actually want to learn even more, uh, the first link is a link to a set of really educational videos by Lucian Vishik, a former Microsoft employee, which was, who was heavily involved in developing async and await initially. And there are a couple of good lessons there. They go in, some of them go into even more depth than my talk. Uh, then there are two, talk, two uh, articles about the basics of ASIC and the weight and the synchronization context, if you want to learn more about that. And the final one is uh, my own article on the same topic as this talk, except with a little bit of a different approach to better suit written word instead of being uh, a talk. So yeah, by reading all of this, I think you're going to learn even more and be ready to tackle uh, asynchronous code even better. But for now, yeah, I think we still have some time left. So if there are any questions, yeah, please. Okay. That was excellent, Demir. Pretty Thank much you. everything we need to know about async and await. And uh, there were some pretty interesting questions. Um, one would be, um, if you're using async and await, you kind of have to know about the task state machine kind of under the hood. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that feel like a leaky abstraction or is that something that really we kind of should know? Because sometimes you should know the under the hood. Sometimes you don't actually have to. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is a little bit of a leaky abstraction because if it wasn't, yeah, then we really wouldn't have to know all of this. And we would just happily use async and await everywhere in our code. And these unfortunate side effects like deadlocks and uh, race conditions wouldn't happen. Now, yeah, to be honest, these are pretty much all of them edge cases. So I, I'd say, yeah, most of our code, even if we don't understand uh, the state machine in the background, we're pretty safe. So let's say 90, 95% of the code, if we're not doing anything strange, we're safe. But yeah, as I've kind of pointed out, it, when when you really need to know about it when you're is when you're trying to kind of uh, either make a code that originally isn't asynchronous because it has some other origin and you want to make it asynchronous, or when you really start doing things that you shouldn't. So if you just avoid doing those switches between asynchronous and synchronous code and async white and stuff like that, you're pretty much safe. Awesome. Anything you saw, Khalid? Any good questions or thoughts? Yeah, uh, one of our watchers, Ivan, was asking, why doesn't the documentation uh, link synchronization context uh, with the concept of the main thread? Uh, I think I know why, but um, you know, maybe maybe you have some insight about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. Um... First of all, yeah, the, the, the concept of the main thread, uh, as, I, as I've introduced it, is pretty much really limited to the uh, to the application model of desktop applications or uh, even mobile applications. So the Xamarin forms or Xamarin in general has the same uh, approach, but it, it's not generally applicable. So as I've kind of briefly mentioned during the talk, uh, Synchronization context is also present in web applications, but in that case, it's much less important. And the, the only thing that it really relates to is the uh, HTTP context. And that's something that most of the time you don't really access. In. Mm -hmm. So since the synchronization context documentation is really trying to be, uh, let's say, a little bit more generic, it doesn't go into the specific implementation details of individual application models. Even more so because there's going to be new application models. .NET MAUI is coming up, and probably it's going to be similar to Xamarin and other desktop models, but we'll see. Maybe it's going to be implemented differently, and the documentation tries to be generic. So yeah, if you want to learn more about this, you need to go into articles that kind of focus on that. So uh, one of the links that I've shown there, the one about uh, the async context, that one actually goes pretty much into a lot more detail. So if you want to learn about that, go read that one. Yeah, and you mentioned different uh, programming models. I mean, we have ASP.NET Core. Uh, we now have Blazor uh, WebAssembly, mm -hmm. which we saw earlier uh, in this conference, mm -hmm. and Xamarin. So synchronization context really specific to kind of the programming model that you ended up choosing, right? So 
Um, yeah. Which, yeah. which kind of brings up another question. It's like uh, you kind of mentioned uh, configure a weight false. I know a lot of people asking, uh, you know, like, is it safe uh, to drop that now that we're in .NET uh, 5 and moving into .NET 6? Uh, well, it, I guess not, because not that much has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, still, m most of .NET, let, let's just talk about .NET Core 3.1 and onwards, because from then on, we actually got all those old application models back. So uh, in particular, the uh, Windows Forms and the WPF application model. And uh, even more so now with .NET 6, we're going to get Xamarin, or we're going to get actually .NET MAUI instead of Xamarin, or both of them, we'll see how it turns out. And yeah, these are again, uh, pretty much uh, impacted uh, by this. So I'd say, no, we, we can't forget about it. It's still there and we'll still have to use it uh, in the, the same way we had to do it in .NET framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, so Jose is asking two questions. Uh, one is when we should use task or value task, and the other is can we call or how can we call an async method from a sync method? Mm -hmm. Async okay. from a non non sync. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, so how to call it if we don't have an async method? Yeah, so uh, let's first address the task and value task. So uh, value task is actually uh, a low level optimization of the task. So um, the, ta the tasks are all uh, reference types. So they are actually classes. And because of that, they involve uh, allocation. Uh, on the heap and they uh, result in garbage collection. So because of that, they cause a performance hit. And uh, in scenarios when, when that is a problem, a value disk is a good alternative. But just as a rule of thumb, most of us in our applications don't do stuff that's really impacted by this. So unless you're writing some low level uh, library that's really uh, going to be performance critical, I think you can safely avoid value task and just work with task and you'll be just fine. And uh, as always, premature optimization often does more harm than good. So if you encounter performance problems, then start thinking how to optimize them. Don't do it in advance because you'll just give it a lot of effort and probably make, make things worse. So regarding the second question, so I've, addressed it a little bit during the talks so that, yeah, calling async methods from the uh, synchronous methods, so those without the async keyword is always problematic. So yeah, if at all possible, avoid doing that. that that's the best advice I can give you. Now, in certain scenarios that's, that can still be safely done, so, uh, but for doing that, and to be uh, really sure, you in that case, you need to know about the uh, inner workings of the uh, state machine. And yeah, so I'd say if you're doing it uh, in an application model that's really not impacted uh, by the synchronization context. So let's say a typical example of that was an, uh, a console application before they were actually uh, asynchronous. So I think was it C sharp seven, if I remember correctly, when we actually got the async main method. And before that, we could still use the uh, asynchronous or call the asynchronous method from the synchronous uh, main method. And we were pretty much safe because nothing bad could happen in a console application. So in scenarios like that, yeah, go ahead. But if you're in an application model that's impacted by synchronization context, and primarily these are UI-based frameworks, then try not doing it. Otherwise, yeah, you can start using configure await, but uh, consider what you're doing, test it really thoroughly because yeah, then you're in the danger that you do something wrong. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of nice that .NET actually added async main. I know that's probably one of the biggest issues people have had uh, mm -hmm. probably adopting yeah. async await. Um, I'm guilty. I've uh, get a waiter dot result uh, get a result all the time. So uh, you got yeah. me. Um, but I actually have a controversial question for you. Uh, okay. I hope you're, I hope you're ready for it uh, because <laughs> um, should library authors still post fix 
their methods with async now that it's 2021 and we're going to .NET 6. Hmm, yeah, that, 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 <laughs> that's really a controversial <laughs> question. Yeah, first of all, I I can admit that I'm, I'm actually not doing it consistently in my code or most of the time I'm not doing it just because, yeah, in the end, I end up having all the methods with the uh, async suffix and it kind of seems to be too much. It just makes the code less readable. Mm -hmm. So as far as the library authors, I'd say if you're having both types of methods, please do it because that's the best way for us to differentiate between the two. Because if you have asynchronous and synchronous methods and you're not consistent about the naming, then it becomes a pain to always check the signatures and never be sure what you're doing. But yeah, if you're asynchronous all the way, which happens more and more, well, I don't really see the need. Yeah. yeah. And although I think there was no change to the official uh, recommendation, I think, yeah, we're pretty good if we don't use it. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to pull the audience then, if you're doing async code, what do you do? Do you post fix the names with the word async or not? Uh, how do you roll? Let's move the controversy <laughs> over to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good idea, yeah, right? Yeah. No, I, I personally, I don't know if it's possible or not, but I'd love to see C-sharp treat um, like the task as an overload so that uh, you could have both synchronous and asynchronous share the same name. Um, but then if you were to add a weight to the front, it would just, it would just work, right? That would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think that yeah, at the moment, I don't think it's possible because yeah, the overloaded methods need to different, be different uh, based on their parameters, not just the, re the return type. But yeah, you never know. They've they've done things which we thought were impossible in the past. So yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was gonna say one of the things that I think is still probably problematic when it comes to async await programming is just remembering cancellation tokens. Uh, I know you didn't mm -hmm. touch on it in your talk, but cancellation tokens uh, definitely catch people up. Uh, it's caught me up many a times. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, because yeah, they're really important if, yeah, especially if you have even more long running operations and you try to, and, and you want to have an option to cancel them. Yeah, as mm -hmm. the name says, uh, you need that. Yeah. And uh, in that case, yeah, it's more of a matter of, yeah, not being consistent and forgetting about it because it's really easy to pass it in. But yeah, we forget about it. Yeah, I think uh, Martin is trolling us and saying we should switch all of our synchronous methods to have the sync postfix. So, uh, <laughs> trolled heard by it. our own coworker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is coming from Martin, so it's official uh, JetBrains recommendation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking through. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's interesting to me. It's like some of these async await pitfalls are starting to get kind of well known. Uh, thankfully for folks like you giving okay. these talks. Um, are there any kind of uh, analyzers out there or tooling that can catch these common uh, mistakes that people do with async await? Uh, yeah, I, now that you mentioned it, I do remember uh, trying out a an analyzer or a set of analyzers that was actually focusing on that. Uh, can't remember it off the top of my head. I, I'll try to look it up to look it up later in the evening and tweet about it just so, uh, or maybe share it even in the chat later on. Uh, but yeah, that that is available. Yeah, and it helps doing it. It helps with some of the stuff. Doesn't solve everything, but yeah, uh, it has a couple of things. Then then there's also the other thing, but that one is a little bit controversial as well. So I think as part of those style cop analyzers, there, there's one that's uh, forcing you to always explicitly say configure weight true or false. But yeah, that's something that I really don't like. And I think it, again, just adds noise to your code and makes it more difficult to read. So yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine it's difficult too to catch a lot of those problems just because async await propagates the entire stack, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for you to find a specific uh, async await problem, you kind of have to know uh, where you started and where you're going, and that can be kind of difficult, right? To yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the way I, th uh, as far as I tried that one that I previously mentioned is that, yeah, it 
the problem is that there are false alarms. So you, there might be cases where you actually don't have a problem, but it's warning you that there could be a problem just because, yeah, as you've said, it's not really sure what you're doing, but it can be potentially dangerous. So yeah, it's up to you to do. I, I know that that was the main reason why I ended up not really using it because there was too much noise. And yeah, of course you can always disable individual errors, but then you start wondering, okay, does this really add any value or is it just annoying me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the problem with all this kind of tooling. Sometimes it can be so much noise that it, it's maybe not as helpful. Uh, I know logs, yeah, yeah. like logging is a big thing where if you log too much, you just stop looking at the logs, right? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, the same problem is yeah, if you have too many warnings, yeah, you just disable them on your, or you start automatically ignoring them and then they, they lose any value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Rachel, do you have any uh, last thoughts or questions? Oh, let's see. I think most of them were answered. Just if you have any main purpose of task completion source, what you might use that for. Uh, yeah, th that's a good tool to actually make an asynchronous method returning a task from stuff that's not asynchronous. For example, if you have events which you want to convert to an asynchronous method, for example, I don't know, a, a typical scenario where I use it is uh, if you want to kind of wrap up a model window in a desktop or mobile application, which uh, closes up with an event, you can then wrap it in a task. Uh, so that it's actually an asynchronous method that uh, completes when the user closes the window, for example. So cases like that. Okay, very cool. good. And I think we hit the end of our questions. So thank you <laughs> very much, Demir. This was an excellent talk. Yeah, okay. very yeah thank you for having me. It was a joy uh, talking about it. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we'll also uh, ready to bring in our next speaker here, uh, Joe Guadagno. Uh, who will be showing us uh, some debugger tips with uh, JetBrains Rider uh, tooling. So, hi, Joe. <laughs> you're, hey. Hi, Joe. Uh, you're very good. He's in Jen's doing. Oh, very good. Very good. Uh, I know it's like he's underwater, yeah. kind of, <laughs> right? I like this. You should make some like little bubbly noises, right? It makes you sound like you're. I put on my underwater. other back, but it has lightning bolts, so it looks kind of weird, kind of like this. Uh, the screen share that has. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you also got our memo about wearing a black shirt, so. Uh. <laughs> Apparently I went to a 20-something party this weekend and black's the new thing. Everybody oh, it, it's the new black? Yes, black <laughs> is the new black. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, I'm glad I can hold on to our coolness just for a little bit longer. <laughs> <You're right>. uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll be doing a TikTok dance challenge later after this uh, nice. conference. So, no, I'm just just kidding. But uh, yeah, Joe, uh, if you're ready, uh, we'll give you the stage, and uh, yeah. we'll get out of your uh, get out of your way. I'm ready. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for having me. Hopefully, you're having a great day, morning, evening, a late night, depending on what time zone you're you're in. I know there's a lot of a lot of different time zones. For me, it's right around noon because I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. A little bit about me. Name's Joe Guadagno. Uh, most people call me that. Unless I'm in trouble, then I'm called something else. If you have any questions on the content, feel free to reach out to me at jguadagno at Hotmail or I'm active on Twitter at jguadagno. You can find the code samples, which are really not meaningful in this case, since a lot of it will be walking through at my website at jjg.me slash about jjg. Um, and hopefully sooner or later, I will get back to streaming now that conference season is winding down for the year. So a little bit about me. I am a director of technology at Quicken Loans, hence the shirt right now. I organized a similar conference to this, you know, when we had these in-person events called Desert Code Camp in Phoenix, Arizona. I am a developer services MVP. That just means that I get, uh, I do free training and free consultation for Microsoft and don't get paid for it. But the more important stat is I am a father of two and husband to one. Uh, that being said, our agenda is mostly lots of debugging and that's it, no more slides. So. I am going to close out of this and let's get back into it. So we're going to kind of go through two examples or two sample applications to talk about 
debugging. Uh, the first one is a rather simple program. It has a class and just some instructions. But before we dive into that, let's go and look at some of the debug settings that we have available. If I go to settings in Rider and choose build, execute, and deployment, I'll see a debugger uh, applet or debugger settings. There are a couple of different settings. We're not going to go through the data view, stepping, remote, and live edit. I'm actually not going to go through every one of these settings, just highlight some of them because everyone's preference is slightly different. Most of these are the default settings, meaning they're on when you install Rider. Sometimes I turn certain ones on, sometimes I turn them off, depending on whether or not I like them. Uh, so the basics is show debug window when we hit a breakpoint and then focus the application on breakpoint. That means bring Rider to the forefront once we hit it. Hide the debug window when we end the process. Uh, for me, I prefer that one to be off because I want to see the output typically right afterwards. Most of the other things are more personal preference. Uh, I'm going to talk through this one a little bit, edit during debug, which talks to how you can, this is only applicable for .NET and .NET Core, where if you enable this, you have the ability once you're debugging an app, which we'll walk through in a little bit, you have the ability to change the code and then have it automatically kind of refresh as you're doing it. So this is on by default. You can speed up your development a little bit by turning this off. Uh, the other thing that might be uh, turned on or off for certain people is show return values. This is key, which we'll see in a little bit. This allows you to see the return values when you're debugging them. The, the debugger will go and execute the code on a separate thread to allow you to see the results coming back in. Flatten object hierarchy, this could be on or off, depends on whether or not you deal with objects on a regular basis, which in all honesty, most of us do. Uh, cluster big arrays, this is another one. If you're doing a large record set, coming back with a large data set or an array of more than 100 characters, if you have cluster big arrays on, what that will do is kind of shrink down your result. Instead of seeing a list of, let's say, 15,000 items, it'll display in chunks of 0 through 99, 100 through 199, et cetera. So that's good if you're looking through high value or uh, high length scripts. And I'll show you some shortcuts around how to get away with that or get around that. Uh, everything else is specific to types of development. So hot reload if you're zooming Xamarin forms, if you want to change the default bugger, what the ports to look at, et cetera. Most of this other stuff I won't cover because it's a little bit more advanced. So let's get into our code base. So here we have a person class that has a couple of properties, first name, middle initial, last name, email, date of birth, children, and then this little bit here, which is just a function that will give me a full name. Essentially, it prints first name, space, last name, unless there is a middle initial. Two other caveats while I'm presenting, there are two plugins that I have that are not built in out of the box. Uh, these plugins help me, one, for doing presentations, and then two, teach me keyboard shortcuts. So down right around here with our little logging colors, you might see a text in here. If I like click a button, it's going to say, hey, you've clicked that button 17,000 times. You should use the shortcut, Control-Alt-B or something like that. Also, right around here where it says terminal, there'll be a green box that will indicate the shortcut I press. Keep in mind, the shortcut I press or I say might be slightly different. That's because you can have your own keyboard mappings depending on what IDEs you're familiar with or what your likings are. This settings that I use, use the, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but the Visual Studio shortcuts because I came from Visual Studio development for a while. Now I use Rider, but I muscle memory is hard, so I keep those shortcuts 
there. Now let's look at the program itself. We're going to kind of list through uh, iterating through this method called populate people and then kind of do a couple of things. Essentially, we get a list of people, we print out the people, we then look for the parents and end. So it's going to come through and see this list of people. Before we go that, I want to explain a little bit what debugging is for those of you that may not know. So I'm going to open up the Explorer for a second, and then I'm going to right click and choose Show in Explorer. Because I'm in Windows, the way to view files is called Explorer. If you're in Writer on a Mac, this is going to say Reveal in Finder. I'm going to click Show in Explorer. You see here the Show in Explorer popped up. Now we're going to walk through this file folder. Now most of your code you'll notice is here that doesn't exist that doesn't differ from your solution explorer. Uh, but there are these two folders that not a lot of people know about, the bin and the obj file or folder. The obj is a throwback from the uh, C++ days. Uh, when you're compiling or building your application, it generates what's called link libraries, which where the DLLs came from, dynamic link libraries. It builds up these object files. These object files are then combined into a DLL or an EXE, et cetera. So it always has a separate directory for that. And then the bin or binary is where your application goes. And I say application on purpose because it could be an EXE, it could be a NuGet package. Could be a website, could be a DLL, could be a node app. It really just depends. So we're going to look at this bin folder a little bit. And we'll see that there are two folders here, a debug folder and a release folder. The debug folder has the files needed for debugging your application. The release has files needed for when your application runs. Uh, the difference between the two is release is meant to be as optimized as possible. Your debug settings or debug file has a lot more in it to help you debug your application or help you kind of troubleshoot your app. So let's go and take a look at that debug folder. So I look about it, ignore the .NET 6.0. I have .NET 6.0 and it just creates a folder for that now. But you'll see I have two sets of files here. Mastering debugging exe, mastering debugging exe.config, and mastering debugging.pdb. So the executable is just that. This is a console app, so it generates an exe on the Windows box. Uh, if you're using a Mac, it's going to look slightly different. Uh, this is the application configuration file, nothing different here. But here's a weird file, a pdb, which if I expand my types here, stands for Program Debug Database, or database, depending on how you say it. Uh, this file contains instructions on your debugging instance. So if you've ever you know, built an ASP.NET app, or actually almost any app, if you get a critical error that's unhandled, you'll get an ASP, you used to get a yellow screen of death, now you get a light white screen or blue screen that says, you know, subject, uh, object null reference on line 67, you did this, 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 here's everything else that happened. That's all kind of stored in this PDB file. You'll then notice there's these two other sets of files, this VS host exe and VX host exe.manifest. This is actually what the debugger is running. It's attaching to this, which loads this file, which ultimately kind of sort of executes this file. And those are not as important, but I like to explain them so you know what you're doing or what the IDE is doing behind the scenes. And they're also important later on if we want to what's called attach to process, which we'll show you later on. So let's go to starting the app. The first, the first thing with debugging an app is putting together a breakpoint. So I am going to throw a breakpoint right here. If I hover over line 11 just check in the chat to make sure that screen resolution is fine it's gigantic on my screen uh 
I'm going to put a breakpoint here. You'll notice that I get this little red circle. If I zoom in a little bit, oops, the uh, zoom is not working. If I zoom in a little bit, this is a plus. Once I click on it, it's a solid red that says I'm going to break at this point. So what does that mean? When application is running and the IDE is attached to the application, so it's kind of babysitting what the application is doing, once it hits this line of execution, the list of person, the variable name of people, populate people, it's going to break the app. Not break it as far as it's destroyed, it's no good. It's going to stop the application and bring back the ID. So how do we get to that point? If we look within Rider, there are two buttons here. This run button or this debug button. Shortcut to roll F5 or F5 for them. You can also get them from the build and the run menu. So the build solution, the build menu has build solution, which is going to build everything in here, essentially compile it. There's a slight difference between build and rebuild. Build will only build anything that's changed since the last build. So if you have, let's say, five reference libraries, only four of them have changed, the fifth one is not going to be built. Unless you choose the rebuild solution, that's going to delete all the EXEs, DLLs, files, and build a solution. The clean solution does a little bit extra. It actually empties out your debug or release folder and starts from scratch. You'll see a couple other advanced options with Rider, and that gives me the ability to build or rebuild solution with diagnostics. This allows me to trace my application, see what's happening. You can build it without dependencies and or just the products. Now, the run dialog has a, a lot more to it. So like I mentioned, you have those two buttons to run the app or debug the app. You can also start it in profiling mode, which in this case, using sampling. So it's going to kind of occasionally ping your app to see start collecting metrics like how long the populate people method takes, how long it takes to connect to the database, et cetera. I can then choose run or debug, which will pop up a window and let me choose. Here it's gonna say, I'm going to run the mastering debugging. I could choose attach to process, which I'll do right now just to show. And here's that little key promoter X, which tells me I should press control P to do that. So if I do this, I get a dialog box that appears that allows me to uh, say, what do you want to attach the .NET debugger to? And it's grouped in four groupings right now. .NET processes, so these are anything in .NET frameworks. So apparently I am running seven applications that are running with .NET. And the typical, the version of them is their x86 architecture or x64. I'm running one .NET Core process, which is this power launcher. And then there are several universal Windows platform processes running. Most of them are around you know, the shell. And then a lot of other apps that require elevation. These are applications that are typically C++ apps or another technology that's not listed in that previous list. These require elevation because of the way I have my machine set up. So you might have heard of, uh, is it a user, user access control? Because I have my user access control level set a little bit higher, I have to provide authentication or I have to provide access to those. So I'm going to hit escape and get out of that because we're not going to debug any other processes. You have the same thing for remote processes. This is really helpful for, let's say you have your boss's administrative assistant is having trouble running her TPS report for Friday. Now you have two options. One of them is probably not likely. You can go home and say you'll deal with it on Monday, but your boss might not be happy. 
or you can install Rider on her machine and figure out, because as we all know in software development, it always works on my machine, right? So you can use attached to remote process to connect to her machine or his machine and debug the process that's actually running while the source code and writer on your machine, you can connect there. Now there are some caveats to it. You need certain permissions on the machine as well as certain ports to be open. Then you can do the same thing with profiling. So you can see why certain things are connected and then do the same thing with the Unity process. So let's talk about this edit configurations. So if we look up here, we have two what are called uh, solution configurations, debug and release. Uh, the difference between them mostly is whether or not you want to build them or they are deployable. In some cases, certain files go with them. You want to create different solution configurations for things like uh, different application configurations. So an app settings debug and app settings production and so on. There's some other slight nuances to, to the difference. In most cases, most people have debug and release. For some of the projects I work on, I have four or five different configurations because I release to multiple environments. So let's get started and debug this. So I'm gonna click this little debug right here, which is a bug. It should kind of be a squash bug, I think, but it's a little bit better than uh, the other IDE's version of it. Once I do that, we have a window down here, which starts to build. Once the build is done, I am, I am presented with the debugger window. And let me get rid of view for right now, because I don't want you showing. This debugger window has three different pieces to it. We have uh, kind of the call stack here, which shows how your application is running. This will become a little bit clearer in the next part. Something called a local variables window, which we'll cover in a little bit, and then the watches and immediate. So if I wanna continue with this, I have a couple different options. I can hit the play or resume button here. I know for me, coming from the Visual Studio world of things, I, even to this day, click this button so many times to resume the execution. It's just getting into muscle memory of clicking this or hitting F5 and not clicking this button. It's a hint for anyone watching this video that's on the writer team. Uh, but we're gonna kind of walk through some of these arrows, which you see are highlighted here. They're also available in the run menu under debugging options. You'll see a lot of them kind of get lit up. So I'm gonna walk you through what some of these are. So here we are getting into this populate person. So if I hit play, it's going to execute the next line, which is pretty much this function here. Everything from lines 20 through through 29 and then go to line 13, the for each. So you have a couple of different options to do that. There's step over, which if I execute this, is going to jump over. So it's gonna execute everything within the populate people. So again, lines, what is it, 22 to 26. I can do force step over, which is going to make sure that everything executes and come down or I can do the step into, which says, well, I'm not exactly sure what's gonna ha happen in the populate people. Well, let me go into that. And we're gonna do that in one second. And then the smart step into, which is only good for smart people. No, it's really just for uh, intelligently, we'll go through and look for any areas where the data might change. So it tries to be, smart enough to break where it needs to be. So what that will do, if I click the smart to, it's gonna to return to here as opposed to do static, then line 24, then here. So let's go here and click this or a shortcut of F11, which you see down here, it stops off at the next line. You'll notice a couple of other things that appear. I got this little, uh, 
orangish arrow, which says drag to skip code. I'll talk about in a second. We have that skip to here. This comes on any line. So any line that's actually executable, I can do that. And we're not going to skip to here yet. So I realize, oh, this is a simple function. It just has, it's creating four instances of a variable. I'm good. I'm going to do what's called step out now. And that's going to execute the code and then go back up here. So it says, okay, you're done. Go back out. Let's move forward to the next line. So I'm going to hit, uh, what do I want to do here? Step over F10 for function F10. That's my keyboard. Now I execute that code. And you'll see I have, if I hover over, a person count here. So I have a count of four. Writer is smart enough to kind of figure out based on the variable what we should display. So here it's saying you're in a list. Most likely you want to see how many are here. I'm going to display four for you. Uh, over here, I got this little data tip, which tells me the uh, thread that the ID is running on. This is helpful if you're in the previous talk when you're looking at asynchronous programming, if you have multiple threads running, it's helpful for to know where it's there. And that's not really a squiggly line, that's more of a thread, which I just realized was the actual idea for the icon. If I click on this little plus, I can see a list of the people. And this being C-sharp, it's a zero-based array, so I have zero, one, two, three, four. I can open up any one of them and see that for person one, for person zero, it's myself with my email address and my date of birth. And then I can navigate through that also. Um, that being said, I realized, oh, there's something wrong with the people. I really should have had more. So I want to re-execute this line. So let me go all the way up here and I can click and drag this guy back up to here. You can also right click and choose skip to here, which will take you back up to that item. Now, if I run function F10 again, it's going to go through that and re-execute it. Remember, one thing to note, if you are doing this, that re-executes everything. So if this was populate people and it was pulling in from a database or calling an API, it's going to go out and recall that API. If this was a save people method and that went and updated the database, it's going to re-update the database. So keep in mind when you're using that. Uh, you also notice here that my populate people turned yellow, that indicates that this value changed and it was a result of me skipping the code back. There's one other thing I want to show. So let's go skip back here and then we're going to go step into the function. So let's step into, step over. You'll notice here in the call stack, now I have two options. So now we're outside of the sub main. I'm in the populate people. If I click on the submain, writer brings me back to here and it's highlighted to green saying this was the line of code that called into the populate people method. So I'm just gonna do um, step over to let these return and come back. You'll also notice that there's a little skip over here. If I Click on this, let's say done, because I'm done with the bugging. I can do this skip to here. That skip literally skips that. So you'll notice if I go to the console, there is nothing written here. And it should have wrote out the person full name times four and these other stats. That literally says don't execute any code. So in this case, it didn't execute anything from lines 13 through 20. If I hit the resume, it's going to output done, and we are done. So that's kind of cool. Let's run the app one more time and see if we have any other issues. So I am going to put a breakpoint here because I noticed that there is a problem entry in 
Well, actually, let's run the app first before I come and say that. So we are. I put a breakpoint here so that it can stop there and we can see the code, but we actually don't even need to do that. I can right click here and choose run to here and it's gonna execute all the lines up to that point. So if I go to my console, it says that I have Joseph Guadagno, Deirdre A. Guadagno, my wife, and my two kids, Joseph and Emily. But the number of parents is one. Now in my particular case, that's not true. It should be my wife and I both have kids. So I know that there is a problem. So let's go and figure out how we can fix that problem. I'm gonna press enter. And that brings us to this line of code, which I will hit resume and we are good. So let's do a breakpoint here and see what's happening. So I'm gonna hit this and let's uncomment that because we don't need it anymore, but I might want that in the future. So I'm gonna go and add that back and I'm gonna right click on it and choose this enable and mark it as not enabled. So you notice now that just did a circle with it. That says, hey, I got this breakpoint that you've used in the past, but you don't want to use it right now. So if I click debug, I'm going to go and skip to line 15. It's going to go and execute, populate the people variable, and then go through each person. So let's go hit here. And now I'm here at the person. So I'm going to go look at the person and see everything that's there. So I look at the person and I see that there's a child count of one. So that's good. But I notice that this is the problem I'm seeing that one of the parents doesn't have a problem, doesn't have a count. So I am going to, I can flag this property. And what that does is kind of put it up here to save, or I can right click and choose add to watches. So now over here, I am watching what's happening with that child property. So right now it says mastering debugging that person because that's the object. The variable is person and we're looking at the children property, which is a list of person count of one in my case. And let me move this over a little bit more so we can see the whole thing. So I'm going to hit play again and watch. And now the person is null. I'm like, oh, why is that person null? So let me go and find the person. Here it says person equals person, which is really not that helpful, but it doesn't know what to display. So let's help it with what to display. Click on this little drop down and see the person object. And I want it to display the full name. So I'm going to click on this little property here, which turns into a flag. And then now whenever a person is referenced, Writer is going to show the full name of that of that person because that's the property I chose. So if I click on this, I'll be able to see full name is now up to the top. And you can add multiple properties to it if you want. Typically, I only have one. So now I see the problem is my wife, she doesn't have any kids. And I know if you're anything like me, I've been a parent for 25 years. Sometimes you kind of wish that they weren't around, but in this case, we want our kids around. So let's see what we can do to fix that. So I'm going to go to a person, open it up and look at the child or the children property. And I see it's no, I want to fix this to see if the rest of my logic is no, is going to change. Now there are a couple different ways that you can fix this. Uh, the first is why is it not working? There should be a set value right here, but it's not available in this dialog box. So I am going to hit the set value. That gives me the ability to create a new child. So I'm going to do person and then set it to first name equals oh, IntelliSense is getting in my way. And I'm going to get a failure for that because that was not uh, legible. So let's do that again and do uh, new person and then do first name equals to uh, KJ. If I hit 
enter on here, it's going to create a new person. So now you see that there is a person here with the full name of JJ and it updated everywhere. The watch we had now changed to a full person. You get this little message that implicit evaluation is disabled because we you know, updated it here. Uh, so let's go and check out the next bit. So we are going to run to here because I don't want to skip anymore. So let's run to here. I should do run to here nonstop. What that did was skip all the other breakpoints and had us run to this point. So I could do control of F9. Now I'm looking at this statement and I'm getting a parent count where I'm doing two different link statements, a where clause to look for last name of Guadagno. If we looked at the list, they were all last name of Guadagno. This was just for ease of presenting. I'm guessing you wouldn't want to just see the parents that do that. Now we see a count of the children equals no. What if I wanted to see just the results of this first where clause. So you can do that. Now, your keyboard shortcut might vary, but on my Windows machine and the Mac, I can hold the option key and then click on it. That's going to do is that's going to execute that line of code. It's saying, hey, for the people dot where, where you're calling P uh, lambda P dot last name equals Guadagno, it's going to return an enumerable. If I go and click on the results, I am going to see a list of all four people, which is cool. And I can do that on the count too by holding down the Alt key or Option key and see that I returns two. So now I fix my bug. That's awesome. I really didn't fix it. I just modified the data, but at least I know if the array is populated, it will be covered. So that's cool. Let's see how we can execute that in the past. So we've got these two breakpoints here. I'm going to stop the program because it's going to run its normal course. Let's say I go here and create a new child. Those of you that are mothers and or fathers, you're probably wishing this it was easy as this to create a new person. But that's not the case for here. Uh, let's do first name equals AJ. And then I, what am I missing? That, that, that. And then uh, one more curly brace. Nope. Don't do list of person. And then here, sorry, that's why you try to avoid live typing code. New person. There we go. Now that should be good. Now, I don't want to remove those breakpoints, and I really don't feel like disabling them. So I can right click here and choose start debugging and run to here or start debugging and run to here nonstop. Now the two differences between them is start debugging and run to here will implement or break at any breakpoint. So in our particular case, it's gonna stop at line 15 that, that has the breakpoint, but I wanna skip those for now. I just wanna see if my logic is right. So I'm gonna do start debugging and run to here nonstop. You notice I didn't have to put a breakpoint. I can just do that. The IDE is smart enough to execute it and add a breakpoint behind the scenes. So if we look at our console app, which by the way has this little yellow arrow to say, hey, something's changed in here. I look to see I have my uh, myself, my wife, my um, son, and my daughter. So that's awesome. Uh, if I look here, I can already see that parent count equals two. So that's going to output everything. Everything is hunky dory. So let's go and stop the app. Remember, if one thing to note, if you hit stop like I did, be very careful of 
garbage collection, you know, if you have open connections to databases or other resources, they can tend to hang around by you doing that. So just something to be careful of. Let's say for uh, some strange reason, I've gotten my daughter's birthday wrong, which apparently here I did because I gave her the same birthday as me, and that's not her true birthday. So how can I take a look at that? I don't want to navigate through all four people in this list. Let's just say you had thousands. There's a couple of different things you can do. So if you right click and choose on it or do control alt B, you can see the breakpoint dialog. Excuse me for the size of it. It varies based on resolution and I normally don't code at this resolution. So here you get the breakpoint dialog, which has three categories. .NET line breakpoints, which has everything within your .NET code, any CLR exceptions. Uh, you can do certain things if you have certain or, or certain exceptions that get thrown, like here, an argument null exception. Or if you're debugging an HTML app, here you can check for JavaScript. So right now we're on line 15. Now I can do a couple of different things. I can say hit count equals to four because I know Emily is the fourth person in here. So this breakpoint will only hit when we get to the fourth record. But the event Emily is no longer the fourth person, what if we what if the database came back in a different order? We were using asynchronous in the order of the results is not guaranteed. We can do something called a condition. So the condition allows you to put in a C sharp in this case or a VB syntax where you can indicate what you want. So you still get full intelligence. So I'm going to say person dot first name equals with that now. Um, and then what do I want to do with that? I can still do the enabled. I can still do suspense or suspend execute. I can do uh, log a message that says breakpoint hit, show me the stack trace. I can evaluate and log so I can log her first name. I can remove it. There's lots more. For most people, the condition is enough. So I'm going to do that. If we notice here now under my uh, debugging icon, I have a little question mark. Not that it's I don't know, but it's I have a condition. So if I run this program now, when we look at the console, we should see just Joseph, Deirdre, and Joseph again. So if I pray to demo gods correctly, it should work as intended. And no, it didn't. What did I do wrong? I missed something. That's what I said. If I'm prayed to the demo gods, let's check to, oh, I have the wrong condition. There is no first name with Dagno. It should be first name of Emily. Let's do that and rerun it. Now it should only show three and breakpoint. So it popped up. You see Joseph, Deirdre, and Joseph are there. And now we're up at Emily. I can go and view the person and find out, oh, yeah, I have her date of birth wrong. It's really, uh, let's hit F2. So function F2, it's really 1, 1, slash 1999. And I hit enter, and it goes. Unfortunately, I hit enter twice, and I didn't put it in a real date-time format, which is why you're getting the message. But that's the gist of it. Uh, while we're doing debugging, let's go into that one more time. Let's say you don't want to display this full name, Emily E. Guidagno. Well, luckily, there's an attribute that you can do where you can provide those tips to your, if you're a library author, you can, you can override what writer shows for that person attribute. So let's go and do that. I'm going to stop and I am going to go to the person. Now, within the system.diagnostic namespace, there are a couple of attributes. The one we're going to use right now is this debugger display. And the name is kind of self explanatory. When we're in the debugger, I want you to display this. So, what this does, this uses string interpolation, and you can 
kind of put in the values here. So I am saying, I want you to display full name, comma, the string DOB space, time space, and then take the date of birth dot month, or sorry, dot minute, and then the number of children they have. So if I hit debug on here, and we hit the breakpoint on, it should be still Emily, because I didn't change the condition, we will see that it just says full name. Why does it do that? It's not in this particular case, because Joe doesn't know what he's doing. It's because writer is using the flagged property. So if I don't have this flag property set, it's going to say, this is the new item. So it's Emily E. Guadagno, date of time is zero, number of children equals exception of type, system null reference exception was thrown. That's kind of useless, but it goes to my point or one of my points I wanna make is whatever you put in that attribute won't affect your application from an exception standpoint. So in this particular case with that record, Emily has no children, it was null. And if we looked at this, I was assuming that there was a property here. Now I can put in if children not null, blah, blah, blah. But for this particular case, I wanted to use the example. So if you notice, I keep showing the date of birth and I probably don't want that property to be exposed regularly. What if it's an auth token or something like that? So I can go and hide that by doing this, debugger browsable, debugger browsable state equals never. Now there are three different options for this. There's dot collapse, which means it shows it uh, in a collapse view, never means never do it. And root, it's hidden on the main property until you open it up. So I'm gonna choose never and run this. It doesn't mean the property is not available to you. It means that the debugger is not going to show that. So let's take a look at what that means. So if I go here and take a look at Emily's birthday, I kind of have to scroll over because I went too far. Actually, let's just look at Emily's birthday here in the watch window. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Hey, come on. I can see that her birthday is no longer here, but if I want to see her birthday, I can go to what's called the immediate window or click on this person right here and then do uh, person dot date of birth. It's still there and still available. So I can hit enter and see it. I can also change any of the variables from here. So I don't really call Emily Emily by her full name, unless she's in trouble. So I call her by her true first name, which is her nickname of Stinky, because she has really smelly feet. So now once I do that, you'll notice she changed yellow here because her first name property changed to Stinky. This went here because her first name changed to Stinky, the full name property added up. So we were able to go and look at values, change the values all across the board. So that's kind of cool with that. I think I covered everything. Oh, there's one other way that you can go and change expressions and you can do that via this calculator to evaluate expressions. So you can do something like person dot first name, hit enter, it appears. I can click on this view and I'll see it in the text box. This is really smart because it will show you a item based on what the type of object is. So if I go to, uh, well, they're all strings here, but if I had a JSON field, it would show me a collapsible view of JSON. And then I can go and see the history. If I need more lines, I can do this and open it up. So you can post any items in here. You can do that here in this code fragment window or here in the immediate window. Uh, that's oh, one more thing here. 
if you want to get the shortcut to the breakpoints, you can go here. You could mute or disable all breakpoints by clicking this, and that's going to disable them all. And that does it for the life of your project. So that's it with this project. Let's step aside to a quote unquote more real world application. So here I have an app that is a uh, API and a web app. Now in previous days, I would go click here, start off my web API app. Once that starts, go to my web UI app and it started on another screen. So I'm just gonna pull that here, go to my web UI, hit debug and go. And that's kind of a pain uh, because you have to remember which ones to do. Luckily, Writer has the ability to edit these configuration files. So let's minimize you for a second. And I'm going to stop all or shift F5 and have keyboard key promoter mention to me that I missed it 183 times. So let's go to edit configurations. Now you notice I get uh, four configurations in here, which match that drop down list. My context API, context web, UI and then context API IIS and web UI IIS. If I click on this plus button, I'm gonna see there's a lot more that I can do. So I can do projects, I can do .NET static methods, I can start Azure function host, mono repos, universal windows, the list goes on, node apps, React Native, etc. I'm going to look for something called compound script. So I'm gonna choose compound and then it's gonna say, okay, what do you wanna call it? So I'm gonna do run web UI. And because I practiced this demo last night, these two were automatically in there, but I can hit plus and add in any. It's gonna look at your existing configuration and say, which files do you want in there? So I did that, hit okay. Now it's defaulted here as web UI. I'm gonna click play on this. And then both of those apps should start up. The contact viewer started and the web API started. So I don't have to do anything to that. You can do so much more with just that dialog box itself. Like if there's some precursor SQL scripts you wanna run, there is a add database scripts. You can build Docker containers. You can run a series of HTTP commands. There's a lot you can do. You can also have unit tests. This particular project, I have unit tests. Uh, but actually, before we go to that, once you have those, you'll notice I have actually have two debug windows open, one for the console, or sorry, one for the web UI and one for the context UI. If I go with unit tests, now I see I have the unit tests available. Once I do a drop down, I now have the ability to start or run or debug the unit test right from here. That is all I have for now. So I will open it up to any questions or heckling from my two favorite developer, Evangelist, Rachel and Cody. This is where, oh snap, I have food in my mouth or drinks. I'm not ready to come back on the screen. <laughs> no, no, actually, actually I, I, they're I, muted. Am I still muted? Can you hear me? Oh, we could hear you. Yeah, yeah oh, I was like, kind of, I was snacking and tweeting. I have to admit, I know, it's getting late right. here. You guys heckling me. No, I was, I was gonna oh, say, I, I muted. Sorry, I muted my uh, desktop. Oh, okay. So he can't hear us. I went to presentation, but I didn't want the noise. I got you. So you can you can hear us now, right, Joe? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, I was going to say, I heard a thousand teenage girls uh, scream in embarrassment uh, when you called your daughter stinky. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, what are you doing? <laughs> Most of our friends know I call her that. Anyway. Uh, it's actually, I, I did that once and Everyone was like, oh, my God, you called her stinky? It's like, yeah, she knows. It's like, yeah, I'm proud of that name. <laughs> <laughs> I did this talk once uh, in Bulgaria, and uh, I was going through the children part of it, 
and you know where it says child equals one i was like i've only been away for a week in bulgaria what did my wife do with one of the kids and that joke went over equally as well <laughs> it's awesome well, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you when you were like, oh, parents count was one. I was like, oh, this talk is about to get dark. But <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, it was just a... Uh, just, yeah. just, well, I had to, to reassure know. Colleen on the back channel that D is still alive and, and well. <laughs> <Yeah>. still <laughs> She's in the other room right now selling her parents' house. So she is still alive and functioning. Okay, that's that's good to hear. Uh, actually, this is a side question for you. What what theme were you using in Rider? Because it had a very synth wave, retro wave kind of uh, color scheme. I believe I am using a modified. I was using Dracula for a bit, mm -hmm. and then I moved over to Resharper Dark. But I think the key is the Fira Code, which is the which is the uh, enabled font which kind of helps. I have noticed that the color scheme changes a little bit between dark and uh, when I open it up in Mac versus Windows, there's a synchronization issue, which I already opened a, a issue for where the colors kind of get tweaked. Mm -hmm. I, I was really hoping with that background that you would have said something like dark aqua or <laughs> as the theme name, but uh, you know, what are you going to yeah. do? I have tried, it's actually looks like uh, I tried dark as well as melon, but the melon is more of an aqua. It's too laid back for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just want to make a note. Uh, you said uh, if you're allowed to mention Visual Studio and Visual Studio Key Map, we're we're not the Key Map police. Uh, we actually have support for Key Maps like Emacs, Visual Studio, IntelliJ, yes. Lime Text, and VS Code. So there are uh, a well, bunch in here. Actually, she's right yeah. there. Key Map. Yeah, so we welcome all users, and uh, we we respect your choice of uh, tooling. Yeah. So, no no judgment on our part. Uh, use what you like, uh, is what we say here. So, yeah, we're all about the informative topics and education more so than the <laughs> products. Uh, even though we would love if people use all of our products, they don't always, and we understand that that, mm -hmm. that, that happens. Yep. Uh, so uh, the, I guess a, a question for you from one of our uh, watchers was, uh, what's your favorite debugger feature? You kind of went through a lot. I definitely learned something from you uh, as well, even being a developer advocate. But what's your number one feature that uh, you think you can't live without? Uh, so up until I started using Rider regularly, my favorite was the debugger display attribute because that's not something out of the box like with other products like visual studio visual studio code you actually have to explicitly put that there but having your code show you the return values instead of going dropping into the watch window or the immediate window see the things that you want saves those extra clicks or typing i think that's that's the biggest those data tips as they're called mm -hmm. Rachel, I'm going to ask you what 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 do you what's your favorite uh, debugger feature? Am I putting? You oh, on? oh, is this where I'm supposed to say I write perfect code? I don't need the debugger. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a discussion about this before. It was I had a manager way back that used to actually say and believe that, and it's just no, yeah. your code sucks Sweet. actually. <laughs> um, so I like the quick little things, quite frankly, where you just get to hover over a variable when you're sitting at a breakpoint and you get to see all of the metadata, either just kind of in line on the editor face or by hovering. So that kind of stuff, just to get that quick glance uh, to see what's going on. I kind of like that is the most useful for me. So, so uh, Joe, how many of these features would you say you use every day? Do you use the bulk of them? Is there a couple that you, like, favorite aside, is there a couple that you end up having to use, whether they're your favorite or not, a little bit more than the others? Uh, so I think the watch window and the immediate window are probably my first go-tos. But in all honesty, one of the features I just discovered while I was preparing for this talk was the uh, scope, breakpoint scopes, which I actually didn't show that you can see the breakpoint scopes, but the ability to 
click uh, Alt or press Alt and keystroke to something really uh, stood out for me as one of the, the biggest features that I probably won't be able to live without going forward. Yeah, I think I think one of my favorite features, uh, it's relatively new to Rider users, but the immediate window, um, if you actually declare a variable in there, it automatically gets added to your watch uh, variables. So you can keep track of variables that you're creating in the immediate window, which is really, really helpful, I think is super awesome. So uh, Matis is saying his smart, his smart step into That's and into true. top are his big ones. So. Yeah, I just discovered that in the last two weeks. So, I you know, as... I I also enjoy like the thread view and digging into the threads, even when I just don't even actually need it. For stuff like you're debugging a basic, you know, form server data. I don't need any of the the deep threading stuff. You do on certain projects, but not something like that. But I don't care. I gotta go look in there anyway. It's it's just fun. So, there's that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I know the debugger is probably one of those things when people are moving maybe from Visual Studio to Rider. It's probably the most jarring difference. Um, although I personally have grown to love and prefer the Rider debugger. Uh, it definitely takes some getting used to because it's just, it's really powerful, but it's, it has a different, uh, say, design language and uh, vocabulary. So it, it definitely does. And that was truly one of my hardest things to, you know, move over outside of the keyboard mapping, which, you know, I kept it the same, but just knowing where everything is. But at the same time, it adds some additional power, like the run to here, run to here, nonstop, things like that, that kind of set it apart. Yeah, I mean, uh, you kind of started showing run configurations. And I think, uh, for me, that's one of the coolest features of Rider, especially if you have a uh, polyglot uh, solution or team that's maybe building a UI with a uh, view for a front end or React that's mm -hmm. completely separate from, say, a back end API project. Uh, you can just kind of link those two different ecosystems together and run them as a solution. Uh, yep. So I think that's super cool. So uh, I'm not really seeing any more questions, Rachel. Do you have any more questions? That means I did such a great job. You did. I think, that? yeah, I think uh, Joe covered everything and there wasn't a whole lot of questions because he covered everything. So I think we're kind of good here. I think any that were asked, we brought yeah. into the stream. So Joe, I know you Twitch stream. Do you want to promote your uh, Twitch channel while we have you here? I think that's probably a good place where folks can kind of. Sure. If you go to jjg.me forward slash stream, that's an easy way to get to it where I can share my. Yeah. If you want to drop that link in the YouTube chat, uh, we can share that with our audience. Uh, I know Joe does uh, weekly um, Twitch streams and uh, they're fun to watch. So. Yep. In most cases, you can just find me by my handle, Jake Wadagno. That's what okay. it is on Twitch and pretty much everything except for Facebook. That was oh. late in the game. Mar Martin got your uh, link in the stream. Uh, there, thanks, so. Martin. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we really appreciate it. That was a great talk. And uh, awesome. I know our viewers uh, enjoyed it as well. So Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having me. Good day, evening, morning, afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> I know if you it is it's super late. kind of like morning, afternoon, and evening. Got like yep. multiple. We got like at least twelve time zones going here. Yep. So. All right. Thank you, Joe. We'll see you next time. Okay. Bye. See ya. All right, Rachel. So we we're winding down. Uh, yeah. JetBrains. This is it. Days. I know Martin is in the back somewhere, but uh, I don't know if he wants to join. Uh, he's he's anyone. lurking and <laughs> posting in the comments yeah. and trolling us. Yeah, but uh, no, I think uh, all the speakers are amazing. I think the diversity of ideas and thoughts were really um, special. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's cool to see all the speakers and kind of the different uh, technical backgrounds that they have and... Um, I think the one 
standout for me was just the Lorraine talk about like the philosophy and psychology of teams. That's super cool to have in between all the technical content. So. You know, yes. So when you, people are always focused on the code, the developers, and we forget a couple of things. And one is that we're writing code for other humans <laughs> and we are writing code with other humans. So that human element is so, you know, omniscient and omnipresent and it's you know it's everywhere it's everything it's ubiquitous you you can't get rid of it and yet people developers try to forget this all the time or ignore it but you can't right so she mentioned a few things where folks said oh geez it seems so obvious once you point it out that we should consider some of these aspects of the team uh, before we go digging into the code either you do sometimes have to refactor people <laughs> right, to get the team on, on board. Yeah. So, yeah, and there was a few examples where I looked back and thought, oh, yeah, I remember when I was on this team and, you know, we couldn't get somebody on board. Right. Mm -hmm. And that person had a few a bit of refactoring or, you know, this team just couldn't gel with this process. And what is it? Is it the process? Is it, you know, the, well, the people, you need to get these things to fit. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we go after tech, but we forget what it's for and, and with. Yeah, and I guess that's a good segue to kind of maybe promote uh, what we here uh, at JetBrains do, which is help developers uh, build cool things because, uh, you know, they, they don't build themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we would really appreciate if you uh, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that helps us uh, kind of move up in the algorithm. And yeah, we should we should point down. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like and subscribe. Uh, but uh, please do like and subscribe. That helps us reach a broader audience. Uh, we also will put links to some of the other content that we're producing uh, on our JetBrains official blog and our JetBrains guides. Uh, and be sure to follow all the advocates uh, on Twitter. Uh, we're constantly tweeting about different things in tech. Uh, and it's our personalities as well are there as well. So if you want to interact with us, please follow us on Twitter. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't think we have anything else. Rachel, do you want to? Yeah, it's time to set all of the viewers free so they could go implement all these great ideas that they just learned from two hardcore days of .NET. Yep, I couldn't have said it better myself. Bye, everybody. Off we go. Bye. <laughs>